This video is sponsored by Crimson Manifesto, Knuckles OX, and Jopey. Hello all, I am Plus, or as you most likely know me, Plus Ultraman. During my first year of YouTube, I was lucky enough to make a fairly massive jump all the way up to 15,000 subscribers, upon which I made my first ever milestone special video as I began my series What If The Human Z Fighters Became Saiyans. The story is meant to be pretty off the walls and crazy, considering it coincided with that wildly massive jump when I first started off. That said, this is more so the compilation of Season 1, or what you can consider the main story, covering this timeline's beginning to just about all of what has been adapted by the anime. As for a lot of Super's currently manga-only content, though, I'm currently working on a sequel series that will be involving some of the characters you'll meet throughout this original series, and that's going to cover that content plus a little mini arc that'll be kind of custom. So keep an eye out for that by making sure you go ahead and do all the other YouTube stuff like liking, commenting, and subscribing so you get updates when I make new videos. Since when that season 2 as it were is finished, I plan to marry this full story and that full story up with a few tweaks and edits like a remaster on part 1 for example. My goal for that eventual true full story is to be the ultimate experience of this timeline. So without further ado, since we have a lot of story to get through, Please enjoy the show. Hey, what's up, Plus Ultra fam? It is me, Plus Ultraman, and I am very proud to announce that at the time of me recording this video, we have hit 15,000 subscribers on my channel. Can't thank you guys enough, and I thought it'd be cool to give you guys a gift for the love and support you've shown me. I usually try to keep my what is more grounded and logical, but this is a special occasion, so it deserves a special exception. Also, I've had this what if suggestion by a few different people, so I didn't want to give credit to any one single person. Now when considering this scenario, I decided the two most logical points the humans could become Saiyans were either the 5 year time skip before the Saiyan saga, or the 3 years of preparation for the androids, with the latter being the most logical, and you'll see why in a bit. So let's see exactly how this happens. We open up right after Trunks had left after giving his warning. Goku is debriefing the other Z Fighters about what Trunks had told them, and telling of the three years of training they must now undergo. Krillin, the brainy warrior he was, has a much different reaction than in canon. He died. He died in the future. He died. Everyone died. If Goku wasn't strong enough, then what could he do? Yeah, he had preparation time, but it's not like that helped him in preparation for the Saiyans last time. Wait, the Saiyans? Every major battle so far had been won by the power of the Saiyans. It just made sense. They were a powerful race with an amazing ability to grow from battle, but that wasn't the point. Trunks' future was a testament to the dangers of counting on Goku to win the day for them. This wasn't some stupid manga. There weren't main characters and supporting characters. It wasn't just Goku's responsibility to protect everyone. He was getting an idea, but he would need to run it by Tien and the others first. But with Vegeta there, Krillin refused to ask this question and so waited until Goku had finished his story, and the group began to disperse. Just Tien, Chiaotzu, and Yamcha prepared to fly away, he tells them to hang back, leaving only the four of them there. He begins to run them through his thought process and is blunt. We should become Saiyans. But this is met with jeering and laughter more than shock, and Yamcha and Tien are laughing it off. But when they realize the small fighter is serious, Tien gets a bit angry. He didn't want to admit it, but the Saiyans were leaping past them constantly, and he hated it. But just becoming one of them felt like surrender, he wants to surpass them with his own power, like a true warrior. As for Yamcha, yeah, he was scared too. Part of him understood Krillin's logic, but the other half mirrored Tien. He was the middleman in the situation. Krillin then fires back with the idea that they could just use the Dragon Balls to make the change, and when the Andrews were defeated, change back. Not doing so could be the difference between victory and defeat, and Tien would be hard pressed to argue this. He'd have to put his pride before the safety of his planet, which seems a bit out of Tien's character. Tien concedes that this was true, but they need to approach Kami first. This may not even be possible, and hearing this, Krillin deflates a bit. Finally, Chiaotu pipes up, and explains that he didn't want to be a Saiyan. If he were being honest, he didn't want to fight anymore either. He wanted Tien to be safe, but he was just not as much of a fighter as he or the others, and it was really weighing on him. But shocking Chiaotu, Tien only smiles and hugs the little psychic, showing some of his fatherly side, and telling him that that was fine. He didn't ever want Chiaotu to feel the need to sacrifice himself again. After the touching moment was over, however, the group decided to head out to the lookout to seek counsel with Kami. After hearing Krillin's proposal, the Guardian of Earth couldn't deny that his logic was sound. The problem was the Dragon Balls couldn't change their current bodies into that of Saiyans, and again, Krillin deflates, and Tien is fine with this and prepares to leave the lookout, but Kami stops him. He said, current bodies. What the group was currently asking for was literal rebirth of three people. But if their bodies were destroyed and they weren't allowed to keep them in Otherworld, 
then their souls would be separated and their bodies could be reconstructed. That said, Kami doubted very seriously that Shinron could do this in his current state, but with some training perhaps he could manage this. So yes, this was very much a possibility, but the cops would be dying for a while. Hearing this, Tien hesitantly asks if they could turn back to normal at some point, and Kami simply explains that they would just need to repeat the process. With the proposal set and a way to get out of it, everyone is sold, they were going to become Saiyans. Kami then tells them to give him one of their three years to train with Mr. Popo and try to power up Shinron. He'd most likely have to grow stronger than the Namekian dragon for this task. He'd also speak to King Yemma so they could die without their bodies. With that said, the humans agree and are determined. They fly off, and Tien actually heads towards Mount Pauzu, wanting to speak to Goku about something. So let's fast forward one year. Everyone has been doing their training, but Kami finally calls his three students to the lookout, telling them today is the day. Now, through very brutal training with Mr. Popo, I think we can actually bump Kami up to a 5 to 7,000 power level. He explains that now Shenron could actually grant three wishes like Paranga, and thankfully, King Yemma had signed off on their idea. Apparently, this would be less paperwork than most of humanity dying. So Mr. Popo shows his statistics side and completely disintegrates all three humans, and Shenron is summoned on the lookout, allowing Kami to make three wishes. Number one, rebuild the bodies of the humans as Saiyans. Number two, revive the newly made Saiyans. And number three, cut off their tails and make them never grow back. Tien and the others then appear back on the lookout, looking just as they did before for the most part. Though mentally, they could definitely feel the change. The idea of the upcoming battle in two years no longer scared them, it excited them. A while later, Goku, Gohan, and Piccolo land on the lookout, having noticed the sky change and ask what's going on. They are then informed of what had happened, and Goku gets extremely excited. Piccolo and Gohan can't really believe what's going on, but Goku is just happy that his friends will be able to better keep up with him in strength now, and understands why Tien had approached him a year ago. Other than asking for a few spars here and there, I don't see Goku training with these new Saiyans too much during the next two years. Though I will say the new Saiyans likely get about twice as strong as they did in canon. Though some may argue that they would, I will say that Tien and the others are unsuccessful in achieving the Super Saiyan transformation in these two years. I say this because they are just now becoming Saiyans, so I don't think they're completely used to their bodies yet to achieve it. Look how hard it was for Vegeta and Gohan to reach it, and they've been Saiyans their entire lives. And though I don't think I should have to, I will mention that the Saiyans aren't getting Zenkai from past battles. That wouldn't make any sense as these are brand new bodies. I just know somebody will argue that in the comments. We can now jump to where the Z Fighters are looking for the androids. When Yantra runs into them and gets into a fight with Android 19 and 20, he is still grabbed by Jiro, but Yantra only smirks and takes the old android's hand off by summoning all the power he could into his hand and chopping down on it. He then kicks the mad scientist through a few buildings, alerting the other Z Fighters. Yeah, Yantra is fine in this timeline and has severely damaged Android 20. Goku and the other Z Fighters show up, and like in canon, get the androids to follow them out of the city, where Goku takes over by taking on 19, but like in canon, the heart virus rears up and Goku goes down. Dr. Jiro begins to celebrate, thinking he has won the battle, before three things happen simultaneously. Number one, Vegeta returns. Number two, Yamcha and Krillin fly over and blindside Android 19, kicking him over to Jiro and making the two fall over each other in a heap. And number three, Tien yells out, Kaioken times 10, and appears high in the air above the battlefield, with his hands in a very dangerous formation. A single Neo Tribeam shot is enough to completely obliterate the space the androids had occupied, leaving only a deep square shaped hole in the ground and three grinning warriors. Vegeta growls being denied a battle, and Tien lands, very pleased with himself, but collapses soon after. The Tribeam is already a taxing technique, but the Kaioken on top of that really poops the guy out. Yes, he was a Saiyan now, but he wasn't going to allow what happened to Trunks' timeline to happen in his. Meanwhile, Vegeta goes off. He is yelling and cursing about everything, and finally, Krillin has enough. He was the only one of the new Saiyans to not really get a chance to show off, and was a bit surly himself, so he simply tells the prince to shut up. Hearing this, Vegeta charges into deck Krillin, but the smaller Saiyan just catches the punch with a very small bit of strain, shocking Vegeta. Krillin grins but decides not to mention the changes he went through in the last three years and simply counterattacks, getting the two into a battle. Because of this, Vegeta was under the impression that he was fighting a lowly human and refuses to turn into a Super Saiyan, and so Krillin is actually able to keep up with him. But after a while, Trunks shows up and puts a stop to the battle and asks what happened with the androids, where Gohan informs him, and I think at some point he accidentally lets it slip, that Tien and the others had gotten a lot stronger due to their wish, and Vegeta asks what he meant. Now put on the spot, Krillin takes over for Gohan and reveals what had really happened over the next three years, and then is cheap shot by a very angry Vegeta. Vegeta goes on a whole tirade about the humans being false sands and actually charges a blast to kill Krillin, but Piccolo immediately puts a stop to this. 
After this, Vegeta only growls and flies off to see if Goku is better yet, and Trunks and the others grab Tien and follow after him. On the way, Trunks informs everyone that his timeline hadn't changed, so he wanted to do some training in this time so that he could defeat the androids in his own time. Goku is still recovering, so Vegeta having nothing to do tells Trunks that he'll train him. This would also give him something else to think about other than those fake Saiyans. The next few days go by without incident, as Goku recovers and begins to try and train as well, possibly trying to help Tien and the others achieve Super Saiyan. That said, this brings the question up to Krillin and the others. Are they going to turn back? And I don't think they would just yet. The chemistry of their minds had completely changed. They now craved battle and could keep up with Goku as their rival. I don't think any one of them would be willing to give that power up just yet, at least not this soon after riding the high of victory. But then, something jarring happens. A massive evil key flares to life, and needing to satisfy their curiosity, the entire group of Z Fighters fly to the location the power was coming from and find a mountain lab. Out of it walks a tall green bug-like creature who smirks at them all and introduces himself as Perfect Cell, their future murderer. He then tells them of his backstory and Trunks curses, realizing he never saw the bodies of the androids Tien killed and didn't think to look for Jiro's lab. Cell looks at everybody and laughs hard, realizing no one had a chance of beating him in their current state. So he proposed a challenge. From what he understood, training up the fighter grows stronger. So he'd allow them 10 days to grow as powerful as possible before he killed them all. That's all they'd get. He then flies away. That said, you can't argue that Cell wouldn't think of this since he didn't fight Super Vegeta in this timeline, but let's just roll with it. Goku thinks on his feet and having everyone in one place tells everyone that he has a plan and directs them all to the lookout. There, Goku reintroduces the rumor spirit in time and I think hearing of his properties, Vegeta demands that he and Trunks be the first to make use of it. During the first day, Piccolo, now needing a major power boost, makes the suggestion to Kami that they fuse and I think Kami agrees much faster since Perfect Cell is already there he can sense his energy. He does however warn that they'll need another Namekian to be Guardian, that way they don't lose the Dragon Balls. But because of the major power difference, Kami decides to train Dende in the Room of Spirit in time after Vegeta and Trunks leave it. Vegeta emerges with both grades 2 and 3 of Super Saiyan, but is able to gauge that the form still wouldn't be enough to take down Perfect Cell, and demands to be allowed back in the Room of Spirit in time, but Goku says that he would only be allowed back in after everyone has had their turn. The next day, Kami and Dende emerge from the Room of Spirit in time, and Tien and Yamcha decide to go in. Over the past two days, Goku has done his best to explain how to achieve the form of Super Saiyan to the form of humans and Gohan, and this at the very least has given them a guideline. Kami and Piccolo then decide to fuse, and I think with the combination of Kami having already been stronger than in canon, Piccolo being a bit stronger as well, and Kami having just spent a year in the hyperbolic time chamber, and probably having gotten stronger again, the fusion is extremely strong in this timeline, and brings Piccolo to a little over the power of Super Saiyan Grade 2 Trunks in canon. While in the room of spirit and time, Tien and Yamcha are able to achieve the Super Saiyan transformation, but just barely and have a hard time doing so. Krillin and Piccolo go next, and with Piccolo's help, Krillin also reaches the state. Krillin as a Super Saiyan is about even with Super Saiyan Vegeta actually. Now with their turn finally up, Goku and Gohan enter the time chamber as well. With Goku having seen three other Saiyans achieve Super Saiyan, he already has a plan of trying to master the state, but also go beyond it and push even higher. Gohan is also able to become a Super Saiyan much earlier than in canon. Since after Krillin and the others had achieved the Super Saiyan state, they can rephrase Goku's advice and possibly give him a better understanding of it than in canon. So I think within the first few weeks of their training, Gohan reaches the form, and this leaves a lot of time for real hardcore training between Super Saiyans. After emerging from the time chamber, the two are much stronger than in canon, with Goku not being so sure that Gohan has to be the one to take down Cell, as his own power is pretty close by itself, and Gohan is much more aware of his own hidden power. Vegeta and Trunks are the only ones to go back into the time chamber, as Vegeta wants to further himself from the fake Saiyans, and as in canon, the last few days are spent resting before the Cell games. The group arrive on the Day of Reckoning, and Cell scans everyone, deciding to make an actual tournament out of this since the group had powered up pretty well. He makes a Cell Jr. for each fighter there except Goku, claiming he wanted him all to himself, and I think these fights go very heavily towards the Cell Juniors, since they wouldn't be any weaker than in canon. The only people to win their fights are Gohan, Piccolo, Krillin, Vegeta, and Trunks. Gohan is stronger and more confident than Canon, and so struggled with his opponent a bit, but does win in the end. Piccolo, having worked on a lot of his strategic fighting with Krillin, employs a strategy similar to the one he used against Frost, but I think in this timeline, it does work. While Krillin realizes he has a great combo move, and powers up the Super Saiyan using his newly dubbed Super Solar Flare in conjunction with a Super Kienzan, cleaning his opponent in half. Every other match ends in ring out on the part of the Z Fighter to stay alive, or by knockout, but thankfully, no one dies. We finally reach our main event, but Goku vs Cell goes pretty much the same as in canon. Goku gives a much better fight, but knows that he can't win. He then splits a sense of being that he's given and throws a hat to both Cell and Gohan, before announcing that Gohan was going to be the real final battle. 
But again, this goes pretty similar to in canon, though Gohan is a lot stronger and tries to fight Cell one on one before trying to grasp the power he knew he had, but like in canon, he just can't. More Cell Juniors are made and sicked on the Z Fighters, but in this timeline, Cell is much more angry as he's wasted so much time, so these Cell Juniors are a bit more aggressive and actually kill Piccolo right in front of Gohan's eyes. So yes, Gohan does achieve it, but this time it's much more narratively appropriate here. Like in canon, Gohan is able to force Cell to throw up 18, and she is saved by Krillin, who knows that she's pretty cute. Cell then tries to blow himself up and Goku sacrifices himself, but Cell returns soon afterwards and attacks Trunks, but Gohan is still on edge. He knows of the attack and gets Trunks out of the way. Let's chalk this up to him being a bit more powerful and a lot more on edge since he's lost two of his father figures in the span of a few minutes. Though the attack does not do heavy damage to his arm, it's limp and useless at the moment. Now here we will go off the rails of cannon. Krillin yells out that with only one arm, they all need to pour their key into Gohan. Everyone does so knowing him to be their only help, with Vegeta being the last to comply. This means that five pure hearted Saiyans pour their key into a sixth and a red light appears. When the light dissipates, Gohan is left looking almost normal with his hair not in the Super Saiyan 2 state anymore, but red. He'd also lost some muscle. Was this Kyle Ken? And where was his power? Cell was completely tired of the games and this kid transforming. He tries to simply swipe Gohan away, but the angry boy simply takes the attack and pushes back. Cell snarls and flies into the air saying this time he'd really destroy the earth and charges up a massive Kamehameha. But before he could even release it, Gohan lifts his hands and fires one so large it dwarfs the planet as it flew towards Cell, completely disintegrating him, leaving absolutely nothing left. Gohan then passes out on the spot. Now before we get back to the story, I just want to deal with three of the biggest concerns I noticed on part one and make a super tiny retcon. The first concern I noticed was people were very curious, was Vegeta really pure hearted in part one? In that exact moment after he had almost lost his only child to perfect self, only to have the son of his greatest rival save Trunks, I think Vegeta in a state of gratitude and respect, that leaves his heart where you can be just good enough to be considered pure. Remember, Vegeta in canon got seriously mad at self for killing Trunks, and it's the first time we see him do something for another person that's not for his own gain. Another concern I noticed was, why didn't Gohan absorb Super Saiyan God into his base? Well remember, Gohan uses the form for a very small amount of time, infinitesimal compared to what Goku did in canon. So I don't think he's able to absorb all that God key into his base. It's not enough to become a God at least, again without the ritual. Vegeta could have also played a part in this with his heart not being completely pure, but just pure enough to be considered okay enough. The third concern I noticed was, how would people assume Gohan used the Kaioken if he doesn't know it? Well remember, that was just a theory that the characters would put forth to explain why this happened in the story. And Gohan not knowing it could actually lend some credence to this idea. The form was red in color and it could have been that Gohan tried using the Kaioken, which would have failed and been why no one felt his power, yet it was still there and super potent. This could also be the reason he passed out since he'd be exhausted after using the technique the wrong way. And our retcon is, Cell does announce the Cell games on television. Because of this, Hercule Satan would have been at the tournament, but just as Perfect Cell made a Cell Jr. for all the Z Fighters to fight in part one, one is made for the world champ as well. Unable to back down from the battle on global television, Hercule steps up to fight his little blue opponent. Sadly for the champion, the Cell Juniors show a tendency to be sadistic and torture loving fighters. So unlike his father, this CJ toys a Hercule, knocking him around the ring cruelly as the champ freezes with memories of his master's death at the hands of a superior opponent. After a few minutes of this, Cell finally orders his child to end it so they can move on with something more fun, and the CJ prepares his final strike. But Jimmy Firecracker, the reporter from the Cell games, gives the champ his final words of encouragement and says that his fans are rooting for him, and Mr. Satan slowly stands up. He lashes out with a final dynamite punch that hits home. The Cell Jr. looks smug as he isn't damaged by it, and moves on to finish Hercule. But then, at the last moment, Yamcha and surprisingly Tien are shrouded in yellow energy and yellow in unison. Just for the evil creature could complete its task, out of nowhere, it explodes, leaving the two warriors pretty tired but satisfied they had done the right thing. Yamcha had taken pity on the champ, remembering his fight with the Cybermen. He wished somebody was there to save him from his own overconfidence, so he wouldn't let it happen to someone else as long as he could help him, and he convinced Tien to help out as well. Afterwards, Mr. Satan, though beaten up, cheers and explains his new move had worked. He then smartly decides to sit out the rest of the games because the opponents weren't strong enough for him and indicates to the Z Fighters saying that these were his students and that they will finish the fight for him as a test of their own power. Cell ignores the interference as long as the games move on. 
but that's the entire retcon. Nothing else really changes. Hercule is still introduced and probably a lot more popular as a hero because he's seen as this one punch man level of overpower and he'd also be responsible, in the eyes of the public at least, for training those that did defeat Cell. After that, the rest of the Cell games go par for the course of part one of this series. And with that, we can finally jump back into the story. With Cell gone, the Z Fighters scoop up the tired Gohan and go racing off towards the lookout, to which Goku, Piccolo, and everyone else that was killed by Cell back to life. The Dragon Balls are gathered hastily, and the dragon created by Dende is brought forth. The witch to revive everyone killed by Cell is made. Strangely, Goku and Piccolo's key do not return to the Earth. When asked why this happens, Goku gives the same answer as in canon, while Piccolo on the other hand... I'd like to stay with Sun and train. All of you have become Saiyans, and knowing them, you'll continue to grow stronger and surpass me. I'd rather grow stronger here than stay on Earth wasting my time. Besides, we haven't had our rematch yet. So everyone respects their decisions, but there are still two wishes to be made before Shinra can go away. With no one else having anything to wish for, the long-awaited decision for Tien, Yamcha, and Krillin finally comes. Turn back into humans or not. After a while of contemplation, Krillin finally decides to speak up, and he says that he'll be staying as a Saiyan. With Goku dead, the world would need strong protectors. Yamcha admits that he'll also be staying, as he didn't feel extremely different from his normal human self. Plus, he now had a sense of purpose that he's never really felt in his life, that he really enjoyed. After this, Tien sighs and admits that he'd like to stay the same as well, but doesn't give a reason as to why, which is kind of confusing everyone, but nobody pries into his situation. During this, Android 18 finally wakes up, still in Krillin's arms, and she chews him out about that. He explains the situation, and she's super surprised at how genuinely kind he was. Not to mention, she might be a bit more attracted to this version of Krillin, since he's got a bit more confidence from being a Saiyan. So with no one else having a wish to make, 18 actually decides to make her own wishes. She asks the dragon to bring her twin brother, 17, back to life, which is something that Krillin takes notice of and to remove the bombs that are in the chest. With that done, she decides to leave the lookout with her usual bravado still in place. But she tells Krillin to call her sometime before going off to find 17. After that, the Z fighters start to split up, Vegeta in particular being extremely upset that Kakarot wouldn't be returning to life, meaning that he was the only true Saiyan still alive. Just before Tien left, he tells Krillin, Yamcha, and Gohan to keep up their training, as he's gonna wanna fight them later down the line to see how well his training is going. Now instead of a straight cut to 70 years later, I'm actually going to run through the most important events that take place here in this timeline. First off, Goku and Piccolo begin training hard in the other world. Krillin and 18 actually meet back up at some point, and I think they connect a lot faster and a lot more passionately. Krillin has a tiny bit more backbone and drive in this timeline, so 18 finds him a lot more cool. As for Vegeta, he's training much harder these days, as he doesn't want to be surpassed by what he views as fake Saiyans and he takes a much more active role in Trunks' parenting than he does in canon, but more on that later. A year later, a stronger Goten than in canon is born. Now how about Gohan? Well, I think his naturally curious nature is going to lead him to do a lot more training than what he did in canon, to try and maybe discover that same power that he used against Cell in the Cell games. Beyond that, he'll be getting encouragement from more than just Vegeta to not get soft. So Gohan won't lose any of the strength he had in the Cell games, but he won't be growing by an amazing amount. He still has to study and help his mom with Goten, so he has some priorities over training. Speaking of Goten, if Gohan is training, it likely means that Goten would join him sometimes, meaning that Goten receives training from more than just Chi Chi. Over with Yamcha, he like Krillin and Tien has decided to continue his training during peace times, but for obvious reasons, he is kicked out of Capsule Corp. While in the city, he runs into someone who, to his surprise, is actually looking for him, Mr. Satan. The champ explains that he'd been looking for the fighters as he was very grateful for their help. It couldn't have been a coincidence that he and his friend glowed when the Cell Jr. was destroyed. So he offers Yamcha a job, basically the same job he gave Majin Buu in canon, of helping Hercule to remain champion. And I hear you, this doesn't sound like the type of deal a Saiyan would take. That said, Yamcha still has a lot of his human mindset. Remember, Yamcha was a thief, he's always done what it takes to get by. Sure, he could just become the new world champ himself but it wasn't like that would give him any real challenge, so he might as well take the steady work and income. So I think Yamcha accepts his deal from Mr. Satan. Meanwhile, Tien takes up his residence in the mountains with Chaozu to train for his first meeting with the other new Saiyans. This was to test his progress, so around a year after the initial split up of the Z Fighters, the three former human warriors meet up in a secluded area and have a spar. To his chagrin, Tien wins without contest. Angry, he demands to know why his friends were slacking off. Yamcha laughed nervously as he didn't have an excuse, but Krillin did. He'd been helping 18 with the baby. Shocked, the others interrogate him on what he meant, 
He revealed that he was married and a dad now, even pointing out that 18 actually watched the battle. Now, here I'm going to deal with kind of a controversial idea. It's just one of the things I've kind of noticed within Dragon Ball, so if you disagree with me, that's perfectly fine. From here, Tien and Yamcha both feel a new competitive drive with their friend and fellow Saiyan. They both want to have children as well. See, this is by no means confirmed in canon, but I've kind of always felt like Saiyans could have some natural instinct to procreate, excluding Broly. And based on a lot of fan art, this may change pretty soon. But virtually every canonical Saiyan we've seen that has had a chance to has had a child, meaning it could be instinct to continue your bloodline. And it would make sense from a logical standpoint. As a warrior race, your lifespan isn't said to be extremely long. The entire hidden potential of Saiyans is the ability to grow stronger from surviving near-death experiences. But if you didn't survive those, you'd need a child to carry on after you die. This could also be why Vegeta, Goku, and Broly never show any initiative to revive the other Saiyans. They have successes, so their race will not die out. So whether you agree with this concept or not, I will be using it to explain the next plot point in the story. But remember, my take on this timeline isn't the end-all be-all, and disagreements are bound to happen. There's nothing wrong with that, and I truly hope you guys enjoyed the story no matter what. But moving on, he doesn't make it a priority, but with this new ambition to make a child, TN does remember Launch and her feelings for him. She's one of the only women he's ever gotten along with in that sense. And long story short, I think if Tien sought out a relationship with Launch now, it could actually work out very well. He'd be much more mature now than he was, say, 10 years ago. As for Yamcha, well remember, he's now working with Mr. Satan, meaning he's actually going to be around a lot of groupies. But beyond that, he will also constantly be around a very beautiful woman in the form of Miss Pisa. There is some info to suggest that she and Mr. Satan might have had a thing here or there, but it's mostly just a throwaway line here and there that implies a small affair. She's working for Mr. Satan in Super Still, and she's driving him around, so I doubt if they were married or dating that she'd be working directly under him. So yeah, I'm going to say that she actually ends up falling for Yonkin in this timeline. We're never exposed to her long enough to really get a full sense of her personality, meaning it can largely be up to her interpretation. Plus, I think Yamcha really deserves the win in this timeline. A few more years down the line, Trunks and Goten form their iconic friendship, which Vegeta is perfectly alright with. He isn't, however, okay with Trunks being friends with the children of Tien and the other fake Saiyans. Yes, Krillin still has Marin, but we now have two non-canon children of Yamcha and Tien, and I've decided to make them both girls. I have another series on my channel where Tien has a son with Launch, and Yamcha seems like he'd spoil a baby girl and be a super protective dad since he knew what kind of kid he was when he was young. Actually, that's a very cool character dynamic to kind of put Yamcha in later on in the series. And speaking of Tien's son's name, in that series, the name suggested for him by one of the fans was Buri. It'll be given to his daughter as well because number one is unisex and it sticks with the nomenclature that Toriyama set forth. As for Yamcha's daughter, well his name means to drink tea and Pizza's name is literally just the word pizza. There's very little link between these two objects, so I decided to go with the idea of dairy products. You put cream and tea sometimes and cheese on pizza, so cream cheese. I then decided on the Japanese word for the food cream cheese, kurima chizuru, and I decided to slice it into kurizu. Surprisingly, and showing a lot more maturity than you were originally pegging for, Goten is actually good friends with all the girls, Marin, Buri, and Kurizu. And like all kids, he wants all his friends to play together, but Trunks is sadly unable to. Boma isn't against the idea of the kids playing together at all, but Vegeta is very adamant against this. The son of the Prince of All Saiyans cannot associate with fake Saiyan. And that's about the gist of the important stuff that happens in the 7 year time skip. From here, a lot of stuff goes the same from the creation of the great Saiyan Man persona by Gohan. After being told, 18 and Krillin decide to enter the tournament. And actually, Marin, a child who hasn't really tried fighting out yet, decides she wants to also try. 18 forces her brother to enter it as well. Having never met 16 in this timeline, he unfortunately never develops a love for nature. So right now, he's just bumming around Kame House. Tien and his daughter Buri also decide to enter the contest, since Launch had actually forced Tien to move into the city. He also wouldn't mind if he won and earned them some money, and it'd be great publicity for the dojo he wanted to start pretty soon. And of course, Yamcha, being an employee of Mr. Satan, would also be joining in, but his daughter isn't much of a fighter. I also want to say that Videl's training goes a bit differently in this timeline. She's a little more open to the idea of Ki as a concept, and shows a talent for it in canon. So I think she'd be a lot more insistent on learning to weaponize it as well as fly. I could even see Gohan maybe taking Videl to Korin's tower to have her climb it and train with the Catmaster. Taking her to Master Roshi wouldn't be a good idea for obvious reasons. But as the day of the tournament approaches, the contenders work hard to finish their training. Finally, everyone meets up officially for the first time in a long time, 
and Piccolo and Goku make their grand entrance. The only real difference is all the kids and the addition of Seventeen. The youth division doesn't go over well with the kids, but surprisingly, Tien isn't too happy about it either. He really wanted Buri to compete with adults and get some real experience in her training. Unable to hold back, Vegeta makes a smug comment. Ha ha ha! It isn't like your half-breed brats could have won against Trunks! What did you say? The two then got to one of their usual squabbles as the others finished the sign-ups. The punch machine also goes pretty par for course just with the addition of Tien, Yamcha, and Seventeen. The youth division would be saved for a part 1.5 because I really want to give the kids some more characterization and focus in on these battles. And to say who the winner of this contest is, Mr. Satan still makes the mistake of faking a loss and almost has his head knocked off. On the morning of the tournament, two young Saiyan hybrids are awoken at the crack of dawn for light sparring and practice with their fathers. These two children are Trunks and Buri and their fathers, Tien and Vegeta. Tien had always stressed proper technique and control during Buri's training, so she is usually trying to maintain a calm and measured state of being. But Buri is still a little girl, and quite often her energy causes her to break through that facade. This is partly due to being so young, and partly due to her mother's fiery alternate personality. Tien's focus on technique was due to the myriad of abilities that Buri's third eye allowed her. Tien's full power had been lost due to his time as an assassin, clouding his heart in darkness. But with Buri still being pure hearted, this entire time it has allowed her to discover more than he ever could, and he is very very proud of her. That said, this has caused him to push her a little harder than he really should, but I think Buri really appreciates it nonetheless because she does want to be strong. The two finish their light morning sparring match, and Tien calmly says that he is very proud of Buri's progress, which causes her to cheer. Tien chides her and she apologizes, but he chuckles lightly and rubs her head before the two go to eat breakfast before the tournament. Buri just couldn't control her excitement. She was just way too ready to get to fighting because the one she wanted to defeat out of anybody was Trunks. She was always very offended at his father's views of her, her friends, and her family. So today was the day that she proved that they were all equals. She wants to come out on top and prove to Vegeta that it doesn't matter if you had always been a Saiyan or just become one. A Saiyan is a Saiyan and they're all powerful. Over at Capsule Corp, Vegeta was making sure that Trunks' raw power and battle instincts were as sharp as ever. Trunks' natural laziness usually made this a hassle for the prince, but today both of them were highly motivated. Vegeta's hope for today was to see Trunks trounce all his opponents, including what he deemed as the fake Saiyans and their offspring. Then Vegeta wanted to show Kakarot who the true top dog was since he was returned to Earth today. And finally, he wanted to defeat Trunks in the finals to keep him hungry for more power and to maintain a strong drive for his training. Remember, they do not know about the junior division right now. Trunks really just wants to defeat Goten while going all out and maybe show off for Kurizu. Unable to sift through his feelings, Trunks doesn't realize this is actually a crush, but knows not to bring it up to his dad at the very least. Hours later, over at Kami House, Krillin and 18 are going over a few more basic moves and how to fight for their daughter. As they do this, 17 makes snide remarks and tries to teach his niece more flashy and crazy combat moves. This usually gets him chewed out by his sister, but 17 only laughs at it. Marin was extremely new to fighting and with the small amount of time her parents had to teach her, the girl's techniques were severely lacking. Not to mention, when Seventeen made his suggestions, she would actually listen to him, as if she'd been learning from him for a long time. As much as Eighteen and Krillin didn't want to admit it, they didn't think Marin would go too far fighting against any of their friends, though for some odd reason, Seventeen just kept laughing at them. And at home, somewhere in Satan City, Kurizu woke up and did her usual morning routine. She wasn't a fighter, but her parents loved training in their bedroom in the morning. This routine, strangely enough, included checking on the junior division fighters that she had become the manager of for a cut of their winnings. You see, Kurizu really liked nice things. Her father made good money as one of Mr. Satan's employees, and quite honestly, he spoiled her and her mother, but the more money she had for herself, the more she spoiled herself as well. Once she had heard that Goten and the others would be competing this time, her usual greed had caused her to seek out the usual betting pools for the tournaments. She decided to bet everything that she had earned on Goten being the winner. When she hung with him, Buri, and Marin, Buri would usually try to spar with him, where Goten would usually win by just using a bunch of crazy techniques. Goten, in her very narrow view, was probably the strongest of the next generation, and she also had a very small crush on him. There was something about how simple and innocent he really was that caught her eye. She had also had a few conversations with Chi Chi who really enjoyed the little girl. This is mostly because Chi Chi can tell that Kurizu is a very shrewd businesswoman which means that Goten would always be fine in the monetary department. 
And it was that very shrewdness that made her the intelligent businesswoman she was. And so she had bet on all her friends, except for Marin. She just wasn't expecting her to win, but if Bori were to win, or maybe Trunks, then she could still get a very large sum of money. Over on Mount Paozu, Goten had overslept and missed out on morning spars with Gohan. Today was a super important day since he'd finally meet his dad and finally get to fight his friends all out, but he was just so forgetful sometimes. Later on, the entire group of Z fighters meet up, and everyone but Kurizu, who had already known, learn about the junior division and Buri and Trunks are kinda embarrassed that their dads are arguing so openly in front of everybody. Skipping ahead, in the first round, Goten, Trunks, Mare, and Buri fight random opponents and win really easily. In the second round, it came down to Goten vs. Marin and Trunks vs. Buri, the exact fight that Buri had wanted this entire time. In their battle, Goten's usual wild and erratic fighting style was directly countered by Marin's employing her own strange and eccentric moves. Krillin had to admit to his brother-in-law that his ideas were a good counter to Goten's fighting style, but the sly uncle just snickers at this. Growing sick of the back and forth, Goten charges at Marin, who announces that this special move that her uncle had taught her would be the final move of the match. She begins to spin and twirl while using 17's super electric strike. This surrounds her in bright green energy. Goten is amazed and stops with stars in his eyes, yelling out that that was so cool. He begins to try and imitate her by spinning himself, but as he does this, a sinister glint appears in Marin's eye. She stops on a dime, and while doing so, a super powerful green energy wave blew towards Goten and then flung him out of the ring and onto the ground. Just about everyone is shocked, and Kuruzu, while proud of her friend, is nearly having a tantrum that she had lost all that money on Goten, and that her crush had been defeated at all. Meanwhile, Marin goes back to her usual cheerful self. Trunks is also pretty angry since he couldn't battle Goten. While well, Vegeta is mocking Kakarot that his son got defeated by a novice, and you can hear all this over the crowd. Goku takes the mocking in stride, and with a big proud smile, nods to Goten. Hopefully this loss would keep Goten motivated to train. Meanwhile, the kid rubbed his head and ran back into the ring to hug and congratulate his friend. He was proud of her, and he went to learn that move. The next match is Trunks vs. Bori, and when he faces off against her, he isn't dumb, and knows even though his dad looks down on Bori and the others, they are not weak by any means. The battle starts off, and Trunks rushes Buri, who remains in her controlled and technique-driven state. It was clear that as a martial artist, Buri is definitely more skilled, but Trunks was way stronger, to an extent where it almost did not matter. Buri begins to expertly dodge and weave around Trunks' punches and kicks, but the smug boy laughs that he'd been holding back this entire time, and that he'd stop now. His speed almost doubles, and Buri is forced to start blocking his blows. Finally, Trunks catches a counterpunch from Buri, and then another. She is completely disarmed, and Trunks is about to push her out of the ring, but her three-eyed powers take effect. The three witches technique is activated, though the creepy thing about it is that the two extra arms that she grew look like they belong to a huge man, not a little girl. Buri then grabs Trunks by the head with her extra arms and flips over him before throwing him with all her might. Trunks rights himself before he even falls out the ring and rushes back at her, where Buri retreats her arms and uses her father's solar flare technique. Caught off guard, Trunks is now unable to see, and Buri activates the telekinesis that her uncle Chiaotu had showed her, and she tries to push Trunks down onto the ground and out of the ring. But the boy flashes into Super Saiyan, and is able to break the hold and jump back onto the stage while panting. Buri chides him that they weren't supposed to go into Super Saiyan, and Trunks blushes and tries to make an excuse. In the stands, Goku remarks at how well Buri had been trained. She wasn't really lacking in raw strength, just favored control over it. Ten confirms that theory and mentions that her mother and Buri shared a very similar affliction, and once again, Vegeta makes a snide remark, causing the two tiger dads to once again argue for the umpteenth time. Trunks huffs and powers down to base form, and Buri giggles that he's cute when he's angry. Caught off guard and not wanting his dad to get mad at him for this, Trunks yells at her that he doesn't want to hear that from a three-eyed freak. With her feelings genuinely hurt, Buri goes stock still, and finally roars out in rage as she becomes a Super Saiyan. Now, her personality was totally flipped. All that energy she usually kept bottled up was out. Trunks powers right back up to Super Saiyan himself. Now it was clear that Buri had let all her technique fly out the window, but her rage had given her a big boost. The two clash again, and Trunks blocks a flurry of attacks and finally grabs onto her. He rolls with her force and finally flings her out of the ring. She was just about to try and stop her fall and fly back in, but Trunks anticipates this and appears above her. He chops her in the back of the neck and she falls out of Super Saiyan and more importantly, onto the ground. As the match is called, Buri tries her hardest not to cry, but the tears and sniffles escape little by little, and Trunks can't help but feel really bad about this, but he didn't want to disappoint his dad. 
Tien sighs that she'd have to get that under control, while Vegeta laughs triumphantly. It was time for the final match and for Trunks and Marin to face off. At this point, everyone is preparing for Marin to lose easily. Even Trunks is very disappointed with how things have gone and he's also still feeling very bad about his match with Buri. That is until the match actually starts. Marin's speed is much higher than anyone had really realized and so she was in front of Trunks and easily slipped his legs off from under him. He tries to back up and flip back to his feet, but Marin is behind him and lands a kick to his back. In the stands, Vegeta is flabbergasted. How is this low class fake Saiyan spawn outpacing his prodigy? Seventeen then snarks and explains that Marin used to chase him around Kame House when he babysit her. Because he could never get tired, he could do this endlessly. While she didn't have infinite energy, Marin did have her mother's spirit, meaning she didn't like to lose. From a very young age, Marin had always had extreme levels of endurance and speed. Marin's current demeanor reminded everyone so much of how calm and cool 18 could usually be, and it was a far cry from how Marin usually acted. Using her immense speed and the afterimage of all things, definitely taught by her dad, Marin confuses Trunks before appearing behind him. Once again using one of her uncle's techniques, she forms a green energy field around Trunks, trapping him. Switching right back to her usual happy-go-lucky self, she says bye-bye to Trunks and pushes the field far out of the arena, even outside the city limits. Trunks does hit the ground at some point and the junior division champ is named. Tien is very happy, even though Buri didn't win. He turns to Vegeta and explains that Trunks is a very powerful and talented kid. With Vegeta keeping him cooped up, his mind is narrow. He fights with raw power and that's about it. But with Marin and Buri, both seem to have some things that they were especially good at, and training with Goten had done wonders for Buri. Maybe if Vegeta had stopped looking down on everyone, these matches may have turned out way differently. Surprisingly, Bulma chirps up that she agrees with Tien, causing Vegeta to fume. He says they're all fools and broods in the stands. Marin would go on to defeat Mr. Satan in a very comical and similar way to how Trunks does, and Trunks after the embarrassing defeat was way more angry at his father than anything else. He had sort of guessed what Tien had already explained to Vegeta, not to mention he felt really bad for what he had said and did to Buri, and was going to stand up to his dad when the tournament was over and tell him that he was going to be friends with the girls. Our 16 competitors and their matchups will also not change, but let's change out Killo with Yamcha, Mighty Master 17 and Jewel is replaced with Tien. And the meeting with Shin and Kabito also doesn't change too much. In match 1, Krillin literally breathes on Pintar and wins. As for match 2, it is completely possible to change it because Piccolo has been training in Otherworld with Goku, so it's not an exaggeration to say he is much, 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 much more powerful than his canon counterpart. That said, Shin is surprised at how powerful Piccolo is. He even considers asking him to go all out to lure out Yamun's Bubba Bitch, but Piccolo forfeits as he can somewhat sense who his opponent is and gets very nervous about it, even with all his strength. In canon, Videl actually has the power to do a lot of damage to Spopovich, she just doesn't have the stamina to deal with his insane durability. But Videl here has been chasing corn and trying to learn to shoot Ki. She takes damage like in canon, but not as much, and finally, after a volley of attacks that puts Spopovich almost to the edge of the ring, Videl pushes with all her might, summoning all the keys she can, and she's actually able to push the brood out of the ring. She's won match 3. This is a little consequence though, because Spopovich does not go far. In match 4, Kabito still urges Gohan to go all out, but he's even more surprised in canon because Gohan is so much stronger. For scaling wise, whereas in canon, Gohan's energy put Boo almost to half what they needed, this Gohan will put Boo something around 60-64%. Once tracking them down to Babidi's ship, things go very similar, though Krillin is the only one caught by the Boris Stone Spit. Because of this, Goku, Gohan, Tien, Vegeta, Piccolo, and Shin fly into the ship, while Yamcha stays outside to guard his friend's stone body and make sure no harm came to it. Vegeta still wins Proc Paper Scissors and murders Pui Pui, easier than in canon, not even allowing Babidi to change the scenery to Planet Zoom. Tien actually takes on Yakon and has a bit more trouble than what Goku had. Using a Kikoho, he's able to overload the beast like Goku did in canon. Meanwhile, back at the tournament, 18 fights Hercule and her brother, and in an upset, she is actually able to defeat 17 by ring out for making the same deal with Mr. Satan. During this match, the children, led by Trunks, decided to go and see what the adults had left over, though Buri informed the group it was a bad idea. She still tags along nonetheless. And once again going back to the ship, Goku and Gohan play rock, paper, scissors for who will fight the Bora, and actually, Goku wins. Though he is much, much, much stronger than his canon counterpart because he would have had a training partner in Otherworld, Goku plays with the demon ruler a bit. Kinda how he did with Yakon in canon, 
This takes Vegeta off, which in turn causes Tien to argue with the other Saiyan once again. But with the two already number one being angry at each other and just being very, very irritated with the situation, they actually come to blows over this argument and this distracts Goku. Dabura escapes in that split second and tips Bobby off to the evil in their hearts and the wizard casts his evil spell, transporting the group back to the world terminal ring. Vegeta reveals himself to still be in control, but when he blasts the people in the stands to get Goku's attention, Tien actually appears in front of the attack and uses the Kia to dispel it. He was also in full control of himself. He orders Goku to deal with Vegeta, while he goes after his true target, Krillin. Goku and Vegeta's fight will go pretty much the same as canon with being transported and stuff. Tien heads back towards Bobbidi's ship and soon runs into Yamcha and Krillin, who are currently coming from it, toting the kids back to the terminal arena while Krillin shoot them out, especially Marin for being so reckless. Yamcha greets his friend, but is confused as to why he seems so angry. What was the mark on his forehead? And why was he so much stronger now? Tien completely ignores him. Krillin, I'm going to kill you. Yamcha sensing the aggression tries to get everyone to calm down and tells Tien to explain himself. At this point, everyone was very uneasy. Yamcha made the mistake of trying to hold back the three-eyed Majin to make him calm down, but he was paid by being hit in the jaw hard enough to break his neck and drop him to the ground limply, dead. Krillin was frozen. He couldn't believe what was happening right in front of him. But then Tien said, Barry, you and the kids leave now. Especially you, Marin. If I have to kill you to fight your father, I will. Hearing this, Krillin lost it and rammed shoulder first in Tien, starting their battle off. It was clear that Tien held a major power advantage, but Krillin's tricky fighting and stature allowed him to fight in such a close range that Tien's height advantage was made to his greatest weakness. That said, the power boost from Bobby made it solely clear to Krillin that his attacks were completely meaningless, and this was punctuated when one of Tien's punches finally lands on his head, almost knocking Krillin completely out. What the hell is wrong with you? You killed Yamcha? You threatened my child? I thought you had changed! I did change, but I had to change again, remember? Into a Saiyan because of your fear. You're insane! We've had ample opportunity to change back into humans, but we all decided to stay this way. Damn it, I know! I'm ashamed of myself, you idiot. Being a Saiyan, it's so natural for me. The drive to fight and grow stronger, but I'm a human at heart. I wanted to surpass the Saiyans as a human, but I just joined them. Damn it, Krillin! I can't even look at my daughter because half of her is something I'm not. The two then sensed a colossal key power up in the distance and Tien came to a realization. That's Boo. It's my fault he's out. Sorry, Krillin. The three-eyed warrior then easily knocked out his old friend and flew towards Boo's power. Gohan does a tiny bit better than he did in canon, but it still doesn't work, and he's knocked out as well. Trunks, along with all the other Z fighters, begin to converge on the fight. Tien and Vegeta arrive at the same time, and without even speaking to each other, begin to take on Boo together, doing much, much better than Vegeta did by himself in canon. Where one lacked, the other made up for. It was safe to say that if Boo didn't regenerate, the two could have definitely done a lot of damage to him. The kids and the other Z fighters like Piccolo arrived just in time to see Boo's angry explosion and see Tien and Vegeta captured by his gum. Trunks is enraged seeing this and rushes them with the help of the other kids to save the two warriors. But the same conclusion is arrived at by both Vegeta and Tien. They make their goodbyes to their children and enact their plan. Piccolo, get the kids out of here! We finally figured out how to deal with you, you fat pink freak! Tien flew to the other side of Boo and powered up as Vegeta did the same. We'll clean up our mess by taking you down here and now. After saying goodbye to their families and those they loved, the two looked at each other. Maybe you want to fake Saiyan 3, I... <laughs> Tien. And maybe you do have a heart, Prince Vegeta. The two Saiyans in tandem then released an extremely powerful explosion of golden light that is actually able to obliterate every single speck of boot, ending his threat to the world. Right. So moving on to the actual story, the timeline obviously needs to diverge back in the Boo saga at the very latest if we want to set up anything like that of GT. So a central change needs to be Majin Buu's ultimate survival and eventual reincarnation. To this end, I believe the easiest way would be to simply toy with whom falls under the wizard Bobbidi's control. In the main timeline, these victims would be Ten Shinhan and Prince Vegeta, due to both holding on to a mass of negative emotions towards Son Goku and Krillin, but even more so towards themselves. With the duo going on to ultimately atone for their lapse in character by wiping out Bobbidi's prized Majin with a twin final explosion. 
However, what would have happened had Boo simply persisted and regenerated from even the smallest speck of himself? Or, even more intriguing, if Krillin and Yamcha had also been taken by Bobbidi due to sharing similar feelings of imposter syndrome as Tien. Since while Tien is certainly the most prideful and earnest as a martial artist, it's not to say that Krillin and Yamcha are not and that they don't take any pride in themselves as Earthlings. With the latter even being brought up and basically handed the keys of Mr. Satan's fame and fortune should he ever want it, making it more than possible that Yamcha could still have some inner turmoil himself about what all he's accomplished. And so, fueled by these negative emotions, our story truly begins as the human turned Saiyans brawl it out far more fiercely than they would in the mainline events, more than likely leading to a very quick emergence of Majin Buu and then his concentrated evil, and from there an even more powerful super form capable of absorbing others, while Goku is forced to reveal the fruits of his and Piccolo's training in the other world. Though here, he really just needs to use Super Saiyan 3 to buy some time, leaving Piccolo to use the remainder of his 24 hour pass to do what he does best in preparing the next generation. As with all their fathers having either fallen, been absorbed, or been knocked out of commission, Goten, Trunks, Buri, Kurizu, and Marin are asked to step up and undergo special training to learn the fusion dance, as Gohan is well as defeated and seemingly killed by Majin Buu, while Yamcha falls in defense of his friends and family on the lookout, since in this verse it's also more than likely that Gohan would have never tapped into his godly abilities to defeat Cell. Regardless, with the birth of fighters like Gotenks and Buron, Super Buu is pushed to the limits while Goku watches from the other world, and even reunites with both Krillin, whom would have likely fallen to Tien's grudge in this timeline, and Gohan, as the young prodigy hybrid undergoes some more drastic experiences to get back in the fight, as back on Earth, even with the serious Buron covering for Gotenks' antics, the kids are inevitably defeated, and even forced to fuse in new pairs creating Truri and Kuriten, only to see themselves absorbed and used as fuel against this new ultimate Gohan. Things appear to be lost. Lost, until being given chances to redeem themselves by King Yemma, haloed versions of Tien and Vegeta appear to help hold off the terrifying Boo, buying enough time for their kids to escape with Piccolo, and for two friends to both be revived thanks to the old Kai and Kabito training away their lives and begin to Pratari earrings to confront Boo with as a brand new fused fighter is formed, Gorillan. Thanks to their notable individual strength and extra power they are granted from the two halves of the fusion being lifelong best friends, Super Buu even with the likes of their friend's powers used against them cannot stand up against the fusion, seeing him ultimately relieved of his hostages, thanks to the Batara bear also having the wits of Krillin. Gorillan thinks hard to access the parts of his shared experience with Goku and remembers a certain technique the Ardridians tried to show him a long time ago, as they then use the Spirit Destructo disc to separate Buu's pure evil and chaotic soul from his own good. Saving their children and friends in the process, their earrings hanging on just long enough for them to obliterate Kid Buu with the Super Kamehameha, as they make a heartfelt wish to see this crazed Jin return as a good guy someday. With wishes being granted to restore all the damage done and erase the trauma from people's hearts, this wish also seems to be fulfilled as well. About 10 years later, as the world has entered a truly unprecedented era of peace, with all our heroes eventually being revived and reunited, and even seeing all of our wish made Saiyans remaining as such. With Tien's epiphany and lack of comfort gaining power as a Saiyan never really affecting him all that much in this timeline, he just kind of stays content. Also during this time, as they grow, most of the grudges between Vegeta, Tien, Buri, and Trunks settle up, with bygones being allowed to be bygones, as mutual respect has at the very least been built, which after an experience like the Boo Saga, it kinda has to. Though in the process, Buri and Trunks never really develop their crushes on one another out of the puppy love stages, eventually just agreeing to be friends, as the young Breeze boy becomes busy as he's prepared to take control of the Capsule Corp. While Buri is likewise get to with the role of master of her father's dojo, as he decides to begin traveling and train with Chaozu and even launch again. Both young hybrids eventually finding solace and possibly finding significant others from their career someday. At the same time, Kurizu actually gets what she's always wanted, as puberty seems to awaken Goten to his true Casanova spirit. And before the two know it, they have followed the footsteps of Chi Chi and Goku and Videl and Gohan, as they go on to quickly tie the knot and form a passionate union. Meanwhile, the Z Fighters finally set up to gather again at a martial arts tournament, only for Goku to drop the bombshell of Buu's reincarnation, even going so far as to snub his friends by getting Good Buu to rig the brackets to give him a shot at the guy. Though this isn't too easy for him, as he does find himself very impressed when the likes of Vegeta, Tien, and Krillin all reveal they too have broken the barrier to Super Saiyan 3, even if it did take them a long time with living bodies. Pinning a match to test the power of this oop, Goku subsequently decides to go off on another adventure this time with the goal of training up this boy. However, with lots of his friends being both fellow Saiyans who also have human sensibilities, they don't accept this, often butting their way into the training, and even helping to teach Oob and sparring with he and Goku from time to time. 
but this is becoming so routine that by the time another 5 or so years have passed and Goku conducts his final exam with Oob, it isn't very surprising that Krillin has joined them. With the monk being eager to use this chance to see if after all this time he has surpassed the power he displayed as a part of Gorilla. This ruckus, however, leaves an opening for three familiar and long relevant ne'er do to make a move on a secret set of Black Star Dragon Balls, almost succeeding in a more sinister wish if not for Krillin and Goku's interruption, which sees a poorly worded rebuking activate the massive red Shinron of the sky to turn the two men back into very young children, with the duo still being more than enough to easily drive them off, only to be informed that they now only have a year to retrieve the ball scattered across the universe or planet Earth will explode. And so, Oskarma begins to form a team of adventurers to accompany the now young Goku and Krillin to the stars. However, options do it down fast, as great options like Boo are too unreliable, while Oob is eager to get back home and spend time with family relaxing after so much training. Piccolo desires to stay and keep an eye on things here just in case, while the likes of Gohan is busy with work and his own family as it's more than likely that this version of Pan could already have a younger sibling, one that could even keep most of her attention off interfering with the space mission. Kurizu revealing that her and Goten are expecting shuts them both down as options as well, though as they are now true brothers-in-law, and feeling nostalgic at seeing his little buddy like this, Yamcha decides to fill in their spot while Buri is surprisingly willing to go, but is actually asked to stay by her dad for the sake of her students, taking it upon himself to join the crew and round it out. With these two good options to back them up, Vegeta actually doesn't feel himself all too necessary, nor does he decide to force either Trunks or Bolin to help him, deciding instead to take Piccolo's lead and hang back for the sake of watching over Earth just in case. So yes, like in the original GT, almost all the hybrid Saiyans have seemingly lost all interest in fighting, training, or even their own strength while enjoying peacetime. But it's really not too big an issue because this group, they are literally old school. And even with the hiccup of Goku and Krillin's age regression, they all still work pretty perfectly together. Seeing them coast across their grand tour with relative ease through most challenges like the Hitman Legic, easily defeating and tracking down the boss of the Par Brothers, defeating Muchi Muchi, Lord Lud, and finding their way to Planet M2, where they easily take down the Sigma Force. Discovering an eerily familiar yet weirdly blue evil scientist in the process who activates a parasitic life form by the name of Baby whom sneakily hitches a ride with our heroes as they retrieve the final Black Star Dragon Ball, and then return home, only for this new evil to make its move, by taking over Jin and spreading from there, even going on to abuse his hive mind to cheat for more power through attaining a wild fusion of Uzaru and Super Saiyan. At the same time, this threat is still taken down as we are most familiar, with Goku as the pioneer he is discovering a brand new Super Saiyan with the help of the Kais, going on to save Tien and the rest of his friends as Baby is obliterated. Dr. Mew's evil is not done, however, as upon his destruction and meeting his kindred spirit Dr. Jiro in hell, the duo come up with another scheme, their shared hatred and cunning somehow allowing Super 17 to endure and make an appearance in this alternate take on GT, despite my dislike of him. However, here I do think his story can work a bit better, as the concept of duality fits this version of 17, since remember, he never really got a chance to run wild before he was forced into the straight and narrow, so it just kinda makes a little more sense. Plus, he never really made a totally satisfying life for himself as a sister did, so I commit so hard to going good completely. I mean, if Tien and Yamcha and Vegeta and the others are gonna do it all the time, then why not him? This culminates in the good 17 and Hellfighter 17 eventually fusing to form Super 17, taking on his friends and family, and even tricking Goku to steal his Super Saiyan 4 power and beef himself up, truly claiming the title of Ultimate Fighter and Life Form. But in response to this, as well as 18 and Marin's tears, Krillin attains his own Super Saiyan 4 state, but even this is not enough to defeat Super 17. With Krillin revealing his true goal always having been to simply force all the hatred 17 had pent up released on him as they clash a final time reminding him of their status as brothers, even if by just marriage, and what it meant to him. But before the monk can get through to the good in 17, the Hellfighter takes over, giving a stark sign that the evil in him needs to be driven out, as Marin and 18 join up with their father and husband to help him in one last all-out fight with Super 17. Seeing them as a family, able to separate the two halves once again, where Piccolo and surprisingly Master Roshi are able to come in clutch by seeing the evil half with the double Mafuba, allowing 17 to eventually apologize for his own lapse of judgment. But upon trying to use the Dragon Balls to fix the damage this has caused, a starting discovery is made as Shinron takes on a new dark form, caused by all the negative emotion poured into him over all the years from selfish wishes and overuse, scattering a league of evil shadow dragons to the wind whom all must be defeated. This once again sets our heroes in motion, but with this being a terrestrial threat and they're absolutely insane and stacked numbers, finding and defeating the individual dragons is fairly easy, especially when both Vegeta and Tien reveal they too have unlocked the secrets of Super Saiyan 4 leaving Yamcha to contemplate how to do so himself, as he's already been able to regrow his tail thanks to Pizza and his son, and begins to reason there might be some kind of mental block there. 
but the Scarred Saiyan must cope without long to dwell on this topic, however, as the final dragon reveals itself and absorbs the others, forming the worst and most dangerous threat they've dealt with thus far, and the negative energy spewing Omega Shinron. Even with all their power and numbers, the evil dragon is too much, forcing our heroes to rely on gimmicks like fusion again, as even Tien and Vegeta in a wild twist of fate swallow all their prize and decide to form a fighter known as Tenjita, while Goku and Krillin are more than happy to bring about the return of Gorillin. Though formed through the fusion dance, this fighter instead refers Kroku. This proves to be the right move, with the power of both Super Saiyan 4 level fusions overwhelming Omega, as Yamcha aids by leading the rest of their forces in a coordinated assault. But in turn, the fused fighters only burn themselves out rather quickly, which leaves them all very open to the massive negative energy supernova made by Omega, which threatens to swallow up and destroy the now tired and diffused Saiyans. However, Yamcha, as he is always, is willing to take one for the team, intercepting this technique and seemingly being consumed by it, as Omega then gleefully tells them all to say goodbye while preparing a final assault to reunite them with their fallen friend. But Yamcha is not gone revealing himself by bursting from the ground beneath Omega's feet and trapping him in a negative energy wolf hurricane, as bathing in the negative power the evil dragon let off seemed to awaken Yamcha's own form of Super Saiyan, one which seems to thrive off the energy of anti-ki and evil. And so with this power all his own, it allows him to take on and more importantly hold down Omega rather effectively, with Yamcha from there taking charge and ordering everyone to rally around him while they gamble on the spirit bomb as their last resort. This final desperate play just being enough to purify and exercise Omega Shinron to eliminate his threat and return peace finally, thanks to Yamcha in the end having greater love and mercy than wrath, as his kindness and selflessness sees him grant a safe passage from the pure good of the spirit bomb, with it simply crashing down around him harmlessly only taking the evil dragon and negative energy away with it, and leaving to reveal the scarred Saiyan hero just fine, allowing him to revel with his comrades in the end. With the most happy twist here being that due to all their numbers and power, it's more than likely Shinron could be given the power he needs to leave the mortal realm and regain his strength temporarily with no one needing to actually accompany him, meaning all our heroes as we know them will be able to grow old and die together in peace, while their children and descendants go on to shape the untold future of the dragon world some even going off into the emptiness of space for final battles to cap off their rivalries, resulting in clashes that will light up and shine through the universe for all eternity, in this alternate timeline where the human Z fighters became saints. As the dust of the amazingly powerful final explosion from Tien and Vegeta settled, Piccolo, Goku, and some of the other Z fighters returned to see the damage of the blast. The radius was expansive, and the island itself had been scorched and leveled to the point of being a few inches underwater now and the area was still steamy from all the evaporated water and moisture. There were absolutely no traces of Majin Buu left. Goku whistles at the damage that had been done, but seeing as the danger was avoided now, he decided it was best to go out and gather the Dragon Balls to revive Tien, Vegeta, and Yamcha, and anyone else who could have been hurt during all this. Hearing his plan, Krillin is a bit hesitant about reviving the two formerly possessed fighters, but in a rare showing of seriousness from Goku, he explains that the two had saved the day and countless lives through their sacrifice. They made a mistake, yes, but they had to be given a second chance, especially after this. He was willing to bet they were sent to Otherworld and not Hell in fact, though if you're being honest with himself, that probably was untrue. Krillin accepts his argument reluctantly and holds his tongue as the Dragon Balls are gathered. Vegeta, Tien, and Yamcha are revived after a bit and some explanation to everyone who had been left at the tournament arena had to be given about what had actually happened. Once this is done, Tien bows and pushes his face onto the ground as he begs Yamcha and the others for their forgiveness, especially the children. Almost everyone doesn't really know how to react to this, but Yamcha sighs as his easygoing attitude causes him to forgive his friend almost instantly. He understands feeling inadequate, and as such, he isn't that mad at him, and he knows that that can really bother and eat away at you. Then, seeing how Vegeta is just blushing and crossing his arms while looking indignantly, Tien punches him in the side and tells him to apologize as well. Vegeta growls before unfolding his arms and bowing his head at the very least, and he also gives a very curt apology as well. It seemed like the two of them had talked about apologizing while in Otherworld. Goku chuckles at the annex, and everyone else seeing that Vegeta, of all people, is apologizing are a bit more keen to forgive the man. It'll be about as fast as they did in canon at the very least, but they will be forgiving him. Goku for one is very happy to see that Tien and Vegeta have made amends and that Yamcha and Summit Krillin have forgiven each other. It seems like everything's going to be okay now. So with that, he challenges them all to a fight. The tournament had been ruined for them by Bobbidi's plot, but right now, he wanted to test them all, each one of them. Gohan too. He was really only knocked out after challenging Majin Buu and Kabito had easily been able to fix them all up and maybe get him a Zenkai boost as well. Actually, Goku was so excited, he even wanted to take on the kids. This makes Goten very excited to fight his dad, as well as exciting the young martial artist Buri. 
Goku powers up the Super Saiyan and tells them all to come at him. The adult Z Fighters wouldn't waste any time and rush in for the battle, with the children zooming in soon after them. The battle raged on for a while, with Goku treating this more as training for the others and just enjoying the fight as a whole. As their powers ramped up to try and match what he was at, so did his until he was ready to unveil a brand new form of Super Saiyan that shook the world. When fully transformed, Goku is definitely stronger than Majin Buu and those fighting him had felt their own abilities and strength grow and multiply from the fierce battle. When all was said and done, Vegeta and Gohan were really the only ones with enough energy to stand on their own two feet, but even they were drained of ki. Goku knows that he couldn't think of a better way to use up the rest of the energy he had for his 24 hours on Earth. As the energy begins to dissipate and he feels himself being pulled back to the other world, he says his goodbyes to everyone and bids them farewell. And so, the status quo returns. But over time, there will be some major changes. The most jarring of which is the fact that Tien makes the decision to become human again. Whereas Yamcha and Krillin felt their Saiyan biology had served to make them better men by making them more driven and confident, Tien felt it had greatly amplified his more negative qualities like his jealousy, anger, and battle lust. Even Vegeta hadn't gained complete control over his darker impulses and he's been a Saiyan his entire life. Remember that after renouncing the Crane School and the life of an assassin, Tien spends a lot of the King Piccolo arc in a state of remorse and wanting to redeem himself. But in that arc, he never killed one of his best friends, or worse, threatened his other best friend's child. So turn the dial of that arc up to about a 13, and then you'll see where Tien's psyche is in terms of remorse. Aside from this, just about all the Z Fighters begin to take their training much more seriously. Mostly Yamcha and Krillin do this. They realize they are wasting their potential as Saiyans by not keeping their training up to a more intense degree, and they begin to do so way more. In the past seven years, their families and children had eaten up a ton of their time, but with the children now being older and somewhat independent, that draw was significantly lessened. And for Krillin, he always had 17 and 18 around for a spar, or even to take care of Marin if need be, but they're not too gung-ho about that all the time. As for Yamcha, he actually had a few options, but he could honestly pay Videl to babysit Kurizu. She's a high schooler, but with her dad being so rich, this means she didn't really have to do this for money, but more to spend time with the younger girl. I could really see the two of them having a sisterly bond. Vegeta was always going to keep up his training, but now it appears that he and Tien have formed a bond that has persisted even after Tien becomes human again. This actually means that they regularly begin to train together. They get about as close to friends as Vegeta can really get with someone, and their rivalry had only gotten stronger yet more positive. Tien being human would slow his growth as opposed to Vegeta's, but his skill and technique usually made up for this. And as time passed on with these changes, Tien feels a lot more at peace with himself. Gohan would also continue his training and he'd actually ramp it up a lot after his loss to Majin Buu. And Videl, who he'd actually start to full on date at this time, was very happy to help him do that. And his and her superhero careers are much more ramped up in this timeline because of this. Trunks is finally able to begin hanging out with Goten and the girls, and all the kids do keep up their training to a pretty decent degree. This is mostly due to Buri where Trunks and Goten would usually begin to lose a bit of interest in fighting at this time, Buri still holds a lot of love for the martial arts as is how her family bonds and with Tien starting his dojo with a very helpful endorsement from Mr. Satan as a favorite to Yamcha and his family, she had become a teaching assistant in that dojo. So she was definitely not going to fall out of love with fighting anytime soon. Buri also develops a more heated rivalry with Trunks which she isn't really aware of that is actually a crush while Launch and Boma find it really funny as that's how Launch used to act with Tien years ago. The other kids just pretty much enjoy life as kids. About three years down the line from here and Gohan finally proposes to Videl. In reaction to this, Chi Chi had already felt that Goku should have returned to life and now she's very very gung ho about him coming back to life. She gets in contact with King Kai and begins to nag the entire afterlife about Goku coming back to life to see his son get married. It finally gets so annoying that Goku and Piccolo are basically evicted from King Kai's planet and forced to return to life. And from there, he does start his farming business and it isn't too rare to see him sneak off to King Kai's for a quick workout sometimes. So all in all, life was good, but it was also a bit boring. One year later, and on the day of Bomo's uh -huh -huh birthday party, something actually does happen. On a mysterious world, an alarm of some sorts goes off and rouses an eccentric yet powerful creature from his slumber. 
After going through his morning routine, he sits down to have a meal with his attendant and tells him about a premonition he's had. He struggles to find a term that he knows. He knows what he's trying to say, a super, super sigh, before his attendant cuts him off and says, Super Saint God. The deity cheers at this and claims that that is exactly what he was trying to say. In response to his god, the angel uses his staff to show him the fight between Gohan and Cell and explains that a Super Saiyan god awoke 11 years ago by accident and the supposed deity never exhibited the power again. Hearing that, Beerus freaks out and begins to yell and berate Whis for not waking him up earlier and pouts as he's missed the Super Saiyan god. Whis rolls his eyes as waking him would have just resulted in a cranky god that he would have to clean up after and he never saw the Saiyans as interesting enough to go and investigate them. That said, he tells Beerus that the Saiyan God resides on Earth, and Beerus instantly says to set course for the planet, and Whis goes off to make a lunch for the trip. On the world of the Kais, Kabito and Shin realize that Beerus has woken up, and that he's on the move towards the Earth. They relay this information to King Kai, who is currently hosting Goku during one of his workout sessions. In turn, he decides to warn Prince Vegeta, hoping he'll be the least likely person to piss the God of Destruction off. He's also going to try and keep Goku here on his planet to keep him away from Beerus, but that'll be kind of difficult. Luckily for him, if and when Goku hears him, Beerus won't be showing up on King Kai's planet, so he can probably make up a lie and appease Goku's curiosity at some point. When King Kai finishes his message to Vegeta, he is actually shocked at the name Beerus and accidentally stops in the middle of his sparring match with Tien. The three-eyed human lands an open shot to the solar plexus and doubles Vegeta over. Once getting his breath back, Vegeta explains the situation to Tien and the two warriors go out to try and find the god to make sure that nothing too bad happens. This would however go a lot like in canon with Vegeta realizing who Beerus is and Boma arriving to invite the god to the festivities. As soon as Whis and Beerus see Gohan, they make a beeline to him and express interest and ask him about the Super Saiyan God transformation and how he did it, which just confuses him. That is until they get a whiff of the food and this distracts them, so they begin to eat while also trying to do their investigation, but their priorities are about 95% food and 5% Super Saiyan God. Beyond that, a lot of their questions are inaudible because their mouths are full. Tien and Vegeta try to keep everyone in line around Beerus and Whis, and Tien actually has a very good idea and asks for the help of Buri and Kurizu to keep Goten, Trunks, and Marin from getting too rowdy during the party. Nothing in this timeline has changed for the Pilaf gang, so I do feel like they would be around, but thankfully Kurizu is also there, which means they either get chased off or she keeps them in line really easily. I could even see Kurizu asking Chi Chi for help and making sure everyone is behaving, so the party goers are pretty well behaved thanks to this team keeping them in line. That said, Gohan's interest is piqued when he hears about a new type of Super Saiyan transformation, and he actually asks Piccolo if he knows anything about this, which is pretty much squat nothing. Piccolo thinks back to the Cell games and how he and Goku had been really curious as well as to what Gohan had used to defeat Cell, and so he telepathically contacts Goku, reminding him about Cell's defeat and their little investigation into what Gohan had become. Thankfully for King Kai, Piccolo doesn't mention Beerus as he didn't seem too relevant in the situation. He and Gohan were just brainiacs and they were genuinely curious about what Super Saiyan God might have been. Goku remembers that he did do some asking around, but nobody had much to tell him about the power Gohan had used. One warrior had suggested speaking to other Saiyans in Otherworld, but those would be an extremely short supply. He had asked King Gemma about this, but the ogre explained it may take a while of looking back through his pages to see what might have happened. It'd been 11 years now, so he'd maybe found something or he'd maybe forgotten. And with that, the Saiyan put two fingers to his forehead and disappeared from the world of King Kai and in front of King Yemma, asking his question once again and holding up the line. Yemma sighs at the hero and explains that he had an intern look into the matter and there were only a few pure-hearted Saiyans to end up in Otherworld, but most did not keep their bodies. Only six had ever done so before Goku himself. He then has one of his interns take Goku to meet these Saiyans. Back at the party, things couldn't be going smoother. Because Yamcha and Krillin were both Saiyans in this timeline and had the appetites of Saiyans, this meant that Bulma had to account for this when she was hiring the catering for the party, so there was literally tons of food to go around. This means that Beerus and Whis were really really busy eating and barely got to talk to Gohan too much, but when they finally get around to trying every dish at the party, Beerus samples the sweet dessert pudding and nearly cries in happiness from it. 
With that done, his expedition of flavor is finished, and with a full and bloated belly, he tells Whis to pack up a go plate, and he reveals his real reason for being here as he challenges Gohan to a fight. Though Gohan had kept up his training, he still isn't all fight 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 like his dad and so he actually declines this and explains that he really doesn't know about all this god stuff and he isn't interested in fighting anyone right now. Vegeta and Tien get visibly nervous hearing this and begin trying to convince Gohan to spar a couple rounds with the cat. Beer simply sighs and calmly explains that in that case, he'd have to destroy the planet. Gohan grows a bit more agitated at hearing this and reiterates that he has no idea what Beerus is talking about and he doesn't want to fight. At being refused once again, the God of Destruction is growing angrier and angrier, making Tien and Vegeta even more anxious, but there is nothing they can really do about this. Trying to break the tension or genuinely wanting to fight the cat, the drunken world champ Hercule decides if the cat wants a fight, then he'll give him one he'll never forget. He then gets into his stance before throwing his patented dynamite kick directly into Beerus' face. The god is not amused. He simply taps Hercule with a claw and the man turns into lifeless dust. The entire party freezes. Videl lets out a horrified gasp and covers her mouth as tears begin to flow freely. She then roars and rushes at Beerus for revenge, only to be slapped out of the way and knocked unconscious, hitting the ground hard. The boat then begins to shake as Gohan feels a greater rage than he has ever felt at any point in time before. To kill his father-in-law in front of him and hurt his wife was unforgivable. Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan 2 are achieved in an instant, but his anger continued to make his power skyrocket to heights even the extremely powerful Goku hadn't yet reached, even with his Super Saiyan 3 transformation and otherworld training. Through pure, unadulterated rage, Gohan had become the most powerful warrior the Earth had ever seen, other than the gods standing across from him. He rams into Beerus and the two fly off of the ship and begin making shockwaves as they battle above the water, with Gohan doing much better than Vegeta would do in this same fight in canon, before he too is beaten down and slammed into the ship. Seeing Gohan's courage, Vegeta and Tien say the hell with it, and the rest of the party goers capable of fighting rush the cat god and are taken out with less effort than Whis is taking to lift his fork. Piccolo is many, many leagues beyond his canon version at this point, as are some of the others, but Beerus' league is that of a god, and he demonstrates this to devastating effectiveness. With everyone defeated so easily, Buri asks if the kid should try the fusion technique that Goten's father had shown him as Gohan had shown the others as a cool technique. But Piccolo tells her to not bother with it. This guy was something else and this power was like nothing they'd ever seen before. He then gets in telepathic contact with Goku and tells him to get back to Earth right now. Goku is about to tell him that he found out about the Super Saiyan God, but Piccolo tells him to hurry to Earth and cuts him off. After having the spit knocked out of his mouth, Gohan is still mad, but he's thinking a bit more clearly and asks Boma if he can use the Dragon Balls to summon Shinron and ask him about a Super Saiyan God. She is going to give him the go ahead, but Goku appears by his side and explains that there's no need for that. He's learned the way to create a Super Saiyan God from an old Saiyan by the name of Yamoshi. Goku then convinces Beerus to give him a second as he explains to everyone how the Super Saiyan God ritual works and then everyone realizes how Gohan actually defeated Cell. But now, with Goku having returned, Gohan thinks he should be one to fight Beerus as he'd have the best chance of defeating him, but both Goku and Beerus turn down the idea. Goku, because after hearing about Super Saiyan God, he is interested in a power he has to borrow from others, and Beerus explains that he is much more interested in fighting the hybrid Saiyan than his father especially after that showing of great rage, but Beerus doesn't verbally state this. But to get the best challenge possible, he plans to push the boy's anger to an even greater height than he just did. Luckily, in this timeline, there are many, many more pure-hearted Saiyans than just five, so whatever the combination, it doesn't really matter. The ritual is achieved and Gohan is able to become a Super Saiyan God once again. Though this time, because the ritual was done the right way and with everyone knowing what they were doing, it's a much more stable transformation. I also want to state that I know that some people think the God Ritual wouldn't work on hybrid Saiyans. I want to counter that statement by saying, number one, there's no canonical evidence or statement to support that idea, and number two, if the hybrid Saiyans can't achieve Super Saiyan God through the ritual, then they likely wouldn't be able to be counted in the five Saiyans needed to complete the ritual either. Also, I won't be using traditional power levels for these characters beyond this point. 
Instead, I will use a similar scaling method to Toriyama's Goku is a 6, Beerus is a 10, and Whis is a 15 statement. And since nothing of this timeline has changed Beerus, he remains as a 10, while Gohan hasn't gotten to the same level of strength as the canon version of Goku had at this point. So without his rage, his base god power is a 4. And if you'd like that quote cited, I will leave a link to the Konzenshu article with the translations in the description below. Now, Beerus starts off the battle a lot like he did with Goku in their canon battle, trying to train and kind of coach Gohan on how to use this new and extreme power but he is much more taunting about the situation than he was in canon. He is trying to coax as much power out of Gohan through anger as he possibly can, and it is working to an extent as the hybrid Saiyan hauls off and punches him hard enough that even the Kais are scared that the universe might tear itself apart. The others try to follow the battle, but it's very hard to keep up with, and Goku is now regretting not trying to fight Beerus beforehand just to see what the cat was capable of, but it was an emergency. Beerus reiterates that he'd be destroying this planet if he won, and in response, Gohan is enraged at how stupid this fight is. With his rage, I actually place Gohan at a 6, and he actually lands some decent hits on the God of Destruction. But this doesn't last too long, and soon as Goku does in canon, Gohan falls out of the God transformation. As soon as this happens, he takes a hard hit from Beerus and transforms into a Super Saiyan 2. Meanwhile, Krillin tells Yamcha they should help as this was for the safety of Earth, and so they gather the kids and surprisingly, Pisa, who reveals she's pregnant with her and Yamcha's next child. The ritual is completed one after another, and two new Saiyan gods arrive to give the now mere Super Saiyan 2 Gohan their aid. I will place Yamcha and Krillin at a 3, but their martial arts mastery, different techniques, and great teamwork allows them to really entertain Beerus. Yamcha destroys his multiple cataclysm orbs with his spirit ball, making them detonate on top of Beerus. Krillin tries to blind him, but Beerus is actually able to fight with his eyes closed. Not perfectly, but decently enough to where he's not being hit too much and he's delivering some pretty good attacks. Initially, Beerus was annoyed by the interference, but this was actually fun and gave Beerus an idea. There were more Saiyans down there. And so, he orders the other two adult Saiyans to complete the ritual as well and come and fight him. While this happens, Beerus adds to the tension by forming a huge blast over his head that Gohan, Krillin, and Yamcha know for a fact they won't be able to stop, but they're going to try and do so anyway. Goku and Vegeta scramble to complete the ritual, putting their pride away for a second. While watching this, Tien, for a second, regrets becoming human once again, as he feels extremely useless right now. Beerus acts as a ticking bomb by making the huge orb grow every second he waits, as Vegeta finishes the ritual and flies up to attack the god. He then smirks and throws the massive spear of destructive energy towards the earth. Gohan, Krillin, Yamcha, and Vegeta struggle to push back the massive orb of destruction, but this seems nearly impossible. Everyone calls out to their saviors as Goku completes his ritual and flies up to help as well, with Videl calling to Gohan that he can't let their child die before it's even born. Gohan's eyes shoot open and he's instantly re-energized. His godhood reactivates and he yells out to his father and friends that they had to make one good push as a team. The five gods all agree to this, even Vegeta who typically would not do something like this. The five gods then begin to charge up their individual attacks. For Goku, Yamcha, and Krillin, it was their first ever godly Kamehameha. For Vegeta, a godly final flash, and for Gohan, it was a massive anger and love-fueled god Masenko. These five attacks combined and were actually able to push back Beerus' orb back onto the cat himself. This causes the god of destruction to be pushed back with enough force to go careening into the sky, upper atmosphere, and out of sight. And then, it got quiet. Everyone waits with bated breath as Yamcha and Krillin can't maintain their god forms any longer, and the seconds tick by but Beerus still wasn't back. Whis flies up and explains that Beerus seemed to have fallen asleep during their attack as he must be pretty tired. He carries his and Beerus' bento boxes and bids everyone farewell as he goes to retrieve the god and return to their home. This was definitely a fight that would satisfy the god of destruction. Using his staff, he taps on the ground and is able to reverse Beerus' killing of Hercule, bringing him back to life. He and Beerus then disappear and everyone sighs in relief. That is until Goku starts up another fight with everyone while he still has his god powers. Battling against Goku is easier than Beerus, but the god key seems to awaken something in all of them and they end up being able to call on the power of god at will. 
Back on Beerus' planet, the cat stops feigning being asleep and chows down on his bento box, while he and Whis talk about how smart it was to send Hercule away and make it seem as if he killed him to make Gohan mad. He decides he'll take a quick nap for about a year and return to the Earth. These Saiyans were a real hoot, and their food was incredible. It had been only a few weeks since Beerus and Whis had made their initial visit, and things for the Z Fighters had majorly changed. First, the fighting vigor of the pure-blooded Saiyans had been seriously bolstered to a level it hadn't been in a long time. But sparring matches that forced the Kai's to beg you to stop shaking the cosmos with your punches will do that though. Goku and Vegeta had always been the sword continuously trained no matter what, but now, with new prospects of power seen through Beerus, the two want to seek higher and higher levels. Even though he had received the same power as Goku, Vegeta decided to go on a small training excursion away from home after achieving his new form, and even Krillin and Yamcha were doing more training as well. While of course, Tien had only further intensified his training regimen and the regimen of his students as well. But it was already pretty clear to the once again human that he was falling behind without Vegeta as a training partner or his Saiyan biology, but this we will touch on later. Krillin had taken up a position with the West City Police Force like in canon, but being stronger and more confident as a Saiyan, his arrest record had made him much more than so a meter made here. When dangerous criminals ran amok, there was one cop that the forest counted on above all others. This allows Krillin to gain a pretty decent amount of pull around West City, and so I think it would very soon be promoted to detective. And the time between cases could be long, so he was definitely training more. As for Yamcha, he was still working for slash with Mr. Satan. With no large tournaments coming up, he also had some downtime. The man hadn't seen any action other than some aliens who sought to battle Mr. Satan. So with more motivation and nearly the same amount of free time as in canon, Yamcha really has no choice but to train right now. With things getting more and more lively for the Z Fighters and their family, we move into the next phase of this timeline. We see Tien on the day that Vegeta has returned to West City. The two are currently one of their sparring matches in the Gravity Chamber. Having gotten stronger, the saying of the duo sets the gravity in the chamber to a much higher setting than Tien was used to. But according to Vegeta, he was already having to use his base form to spar, just to make it remotely possible for Tien to keep up. So lowering the gravity would make this little more than a game of tag to him. Unknown to Vegeta, the harshness of his words and Tien's growing anger, jealousy, and regret lit a fire in the Three-Eyed Warrior's heart. Where usually their spars were more measured and technique-based, this one was much more akin to Tien being Vegeta's punching bag. Finally, Vegeta scoffs at how pitiful his training session was and turns his back to go and turn the gravity off. Seeing red in all three eyes, Tien activates a technique he hadn't made use of in over a decade, the Kao Ken technique. Something he had went out of his way to learn from King Kai as his last attempt to not become a Saiyan in preparation for the androids 11 years ago. Vegeta's eyes widen as he feels Tien's key erupt from behind him, and he turns around just in time for Tien to slug him across the jaw hard enough to knock him on his ass. Vegeta wipes blood from his mouth and glares. Tien expected the Prince of All Saiyans to stand and continue the spar, no, the fight this had become. But instead, he did not. Instead of standing and viewing him as an opponent worthy of godly power like Tien so desperately wanted, or even just becoming a basic Super Saiyan, Vegeta stood and turned his back on him, turned the gravity machine off. As soon as the pressure of the gravity was off of him, Tien realized he had to push the Kaioken very far just to cover that small distance and hit Vegeta in time. He releases the technique and claps to one knee as his body aches and he finds himself almost unable to move. Vegeta once again scoffs and begins walking away, telling Tien he can tolerate him not being a Saiyan, but he does not associate with cowards. He made his choice, and taking his anger out on him was pitiful. He was the one that wanted to be human again, and he was the one that wished to prove that humans could surpass Saiyans. He needs to stop whining and throwing tantrums and do it. Exiting the chamber, Vegeta announces he's going to find something to eat, and when he gets back, he expects the fool to be gone. The three-eyed human sat there on the floor, contemplating everything that had just happened. He was not mad at Vegeta. They had been considered friends or somewhere close to that for a while now, and he understood Vegeta pretty well. Vegeta was a hard ass, but that being said, he wouldn't tolerate or freely spend his time with him for training if the two didn't have some kind of positive relationship. So by process of elimination, this meant the only person Tien could be mad with was himself. On this train of thought, he thought more about his decision. Did he regret it or not? Finally, his body felt good enough to move, and consequently, he could hear the voices of Goten, Trunks, and Buri outside. Without context, he could not tell why, but Buri sounded mad, Goten sounded scared, and Trunks was laughing his head off. In the next few seconds, he could feel Buri's power skyrocket and saw Goten and Trunks flying away frantically. A perfect example of her mother's rage, Buri in her angry Super Saiyan form was about to give chase to the boys when her father called out to her in a chiding tone. The daughter flinches and powers down, flying over to her father. When asked why she was so angry, she explains that Trunks stuck a piece of candy in her hair and she didn't know why the stupid boy was always bullying her. Having grown much less form with his daughter, Tien kneels and checks him on her head, going right into dad mode. He teases that she wouldn't have this problem if she shaved her head like him and her Uncle Chiaotzu or Krillin. The girl pouts and refuses to ever shave her head, and Uncle Chiaotzu isn't bald. 
The two laugh, and Tien tells her he couldn't find any candy in her hair. His best guess is that Trunks lied to get a rise out of her, and she played right into his hands. Bowie blushes and pouts, and grumbles that Trunks was such a stupid boy. Tien can finally see what her mother meant about boys and girls who like each other, treating each other like they didn't. Changing the subject, he asked her to help him fly home, but Kyle Kim was still affecting his body, and he didn't know if he could make it, and so the two begin a slow flight home. Still dwelling on Vegeta's words, Tien asks his daughter if she knows the difference between him when he was a Saiyan and now as a human. Buri thinks for a while and finally comes to the answer of not really. He just seemed to train a small amount less, and even that was barely noticeable. But if she was honest with her father, when he made that wish, at first she felt kind of bad. She felt like being half Saiyan was something she should feel ashamed of. But as she thought this way, she remembered a long time ago when she had been younger and very self-conscious about her third eye. She remembered Trunks teasing her about it a lot and ran home crying one day because of it. Once hearing of their daughter's plight, her mother and father held her and told her that she was perfect just the way she was. Her eyes were beautiful and made her special. The way she began to see it, her dad had originally been human, yes, but he had always been her dad and that had not changed as far as she could see. To her, her dad was perfect because he was her dad and she loved him. In a rare show of sentiment for Tien, the two couldn't help but stop their flight and share a hug in mid-air before going home. Elsewhere, Vegeta returns from his meal to see that Tien really had left. Sighing, he decides he's bored of training here anyway and just so happens to hear Whis, Bulma, and Launch together. As they both lived in West City and had been pregnant around the same time and had Saiyans as spouses, the two women had deepened their acquaintance held when they attended the World Martial Arts Tournaments together. Because of this, it's very plausible that they would hang out together as adults. With the two being together so frequently, this means that Whis will be accompanied by both of them when making visits to Earth. I also think he'd be pretty endeared to launch. Her blue haired form is very agreeable and nice to be around, while the blonde one would be fiery and likely entertaining to Whis. The switch between the two personalities would also be interesting. Not to mention, Launch will be instrumental in introducing Whis to Earth alcohols, his favorite of which being whiskey. Having been away the last few weeks, Vegeta had had no idea Whis had been visiting. Like in canon, Bone would chew him out for being gone so long while Whis and Launch laugh at them, before Whis reveals his identity as Beerus' attendant and his teacher. Also like in canon, Vegeta would be intrigued in training under Whis, and so would try and win Whis' favor by taking him to different restaurants, which would go like in canon. Though in this timeline, something changes around the time that Vegeta tries to prepare a dish for Whis himself. Krillin and Yamcha, having free time at the moment and being able to sense the key of Whis since they had both attained god forms, as well as Vegeta, they decide to come and see what everyone was up to. When being filled in on what Vegeta is cooking, the two are also very fired up to try and attain Whis as their new master. So the two slightly start a bargain with Vegeta by convincing him to let them cook for Whis so they may all go. After running through an entire bowl of eggs, Vegeta concedes and the three work together to make Whis a pretty good omelet. To Vegeta's great chagrin, all three are permitted to go and train with the Angel, and Krillin and Yamcha have the sense to go and inform their wives that they'll be gone for a while, and before long, they're decked out in new threats and heading off to Beerus' planet. Also like in canon, nothing really happens for the next 6 months, and no one really outside of the families of Vegeta, Krillin, and Yamcha know that the three have left on a training trip. On top of this, with everyone having individual jobs and no huge events, the entire group hadn't really had a reason to gather together in a while. The biggest thing currently going on was Videl giving birth to a baby girl named Pan. And even in the case of her birth, it wasn't too out of character for Vegeta or Tien to not attend events like this. However, Krillin and Yamcha's absence is somewhat strange. But with cute baby Pan there, neither Pizza nor 18 are really thinking about telling anyone where their knucklehead husbands are, and no one really takes the time to ask either. Tien hadn't sought out Vegeta for training due to their little spat. He considered trying to train with his formerly human friends, but he was hesitant. He respected Yamcha and Krillin, but over the years in times of peace, they didn't take training as seriously as they should have. Goku and Gohan were pretty good options, but the scholar was usually too busy for a decent spot. On the other hand, Chi Chi kept Goku buried in work. Last he'd heard, the woman had enlisted the help of Yamcha's daughter Kurizu in working part time as Goku's manager, making sure he was out and working and not training. But according to Buri and the other kids, Slave Driver was a better title for Yamcha's money loving offspring. With no more options, he decided he is better off going back to his somewhat soulless training style. He'd gotten to really enjoy having a strong training partner and realized his growth was much higher due to it. Even training with his daughter wasn't a great option now. While she still loved martial arts, she wanted to do other things now, and Blonde Lodge was always quick to chew him out about squandering her free time. This means that he can train with Buri just not anytime he wants to, hence why she's not a great option. So instead, I think I'll begin to try and train with his students more and to accelerate their training as individuals to see if any of them stood out. If this were to happen earlier, I think it's very possible that one or more of the students would learn how to weaponize and sense key earlier than in canon, even though Tien would still be pretty dissatisfied with his training partner situation. At least by doing this, he can start cultivating some high level students who can be better training partners later on. 
One day though, he noticed that all five of the kids had been hanging out around the dojo. This includes Kurizu, who mentioned that she had taken the day off from Goku duty, so this meant that the Saiyan was free to train without interruption. Not wanting to pass up this opportunity, Tien asked for Chaozu to hold down the fort and make sure the Chun's drain hard and shoots off towards Mount Paozu. When he arrives, he is shocked to find the house deserted, and so decides to go and check Gohan's house. This place he actually finds quite crowded. Chi Chi, Boma, Launch, and Videl were there with Gohan and Mr. Satan, along with Baby Pan. The story went that Goku had been there earlier that day, but he had heard Boma mention where her husband, Krillin, and Yamcha were, and had apparently bolted off, seeking to join the trio of Saiyans on Beerus' planet. This also reveals the Tien where Krillin and Yamcha have been this entire time. Chi Chi had tried to stop Goku, but the Saiyan was slippery when he wanted to be, and to be fair, Kurizu had made him much more productive, so she felt he deserved a break. Asking Gohan if he wants to spar, Tien is turned down. As the hybrid mentions, he's already done his workout for the week and didn't plan on doing much else. Besides, he hadn't tried tapping into the god form again in months and wasn't sure if he even could if that was what Tien wanted. Disheartened, Tien prepares to leave when Chi Chi informs him that Piccolo is free to train since Pan isn't being babysat by him. With renewed vigor, the former Saiyan darts off once again to find a training partner. On this same day that Goku leaves for Beerus' planet, something in space seems to be happening. Current commander of the Freezer Force, Sorbet, gets more bad news of more and more losses throughout the universe. Groaning in frustration and rubbing the bridge of his bulbous nose, he checks on the progress of his next desperate gamble. Getting in touch with those he'd set to the task, he hears about the progress with finding the Namekians. Of course, it was unfruitful. Now remember, nothing has really changed a ton with how Frieza died in canon and the current day Pilaf gang. So to save time, everything concerning Frieza's resurrection would go the exact same. Nothing would really change until Frieza hears about the exploits of Goku and the Saiyans in this timeline. Thinking back to the mysterious Super Saiyan that killed him on Earth after being defeated by Goku and Namek and hearing tale of Vegeta killing Majin Buu alongside some other strange Saiyan had really unnerved him. Remember, he had been told by King Cold to never challenge Majin Buu, and he would likely think that Vegeta is still weaker than Goku, meaning he would assume that Goku is much stronger than Majin Buu, to the point where the creature would only be a waste of his time, and supposedly the number of Saiyan offspring had kept going up. As intelligent as Frieza is, it's more likely that he would take more precautions instead of less. So with his own pride on the line and the knowledge that his forces had degraded while Goku and his had apparently greatly soared in strength, he would need to grow stronger than he originally thought he would have to. Because of this, Frieza would still decide to take on 4 months of training at least, but in this timeline, he would decide to take on 2 training partners instead of 1. Tagoma and Sasami would both be his punching bags for the next 4 months, beating them down even harsher than he did to Tagoma and Cannon, and having them drag themselves back to the rejuvenation tanks to come back the next day for the exact same punishment. With two training partners and more motivation, I think that Frieza would get a lot stronger than he does in canon, as with Takuma and Sasami. Arriving to Beerus' planet, Goku is greeted by a happy Yamcha and Krillin and an unhappy Vegeta as he has to get settled. Thankfully with the four of them, the chores Whis has them do are able to be tackled a lot easier and left more time for training, resulting in Goku quickly trying to catch up to his friends. Before coming to train with Whis, Goku had definitely been the strongest Saiyan known to everyone, but in this six month gap, he had been far surpassed and between Krillin, Yamcha, and Vegeta, the prince had been the top dog, but Krillin was currently nipping at his heels. One day, when Whis saw fit to spar with his students, he broke it down to them, explaining their biggest issues and even putting his signature on the shirts. According to Whis, Vegeta was too tense. This apparently slowed him down in the midst of battle as he thought about every single movement and attack. On the other hand, Goku and Yamcha apparently had a very similar issue, but the exact opposite of Vegeta's. They were too carefree, too loose and arrogant. They let their guards down at the absolute worst of times. Krillin, on the other hand, was a mix between these philosophies. The fighter wasn't tense, but focused. He wasn't arrogant or cocky, but maintained a healthy caution of opponents. This had evolved due to his apprehension and fear due to his two deaths and defeats during this timeline. Remember, Krillin in this timeline was initially the one to suggest becoming Saiyans, as he felt paranoid at losing to the androids once again as their future counterparts did. And now with his Saiyan psychology, he had boosted his own confidence, and this made him the most well-rounded fighter of all the Saiyans. To Whis, Krillin would soon be the strongest of the Saiyans. He still introduces them to the concept of their body moving independently of their thoughts, and he suggests that Krillin will be the first of them to master this technique. Of course, saying this in front of the other three Saiyans would definitely fire the three up to correct those flaws of theirs while also growing stronger. And I think with all four of them there, the improvement on that front would be more significant than it was in canon compared to what we saw, but not enough for any major changes to the timeline to take place right now. On the other hand, their gains in strength would be completely staggering. In Dragon Ball, having training partners is very advantageous to your training, so it would reason that doubling the amount of godly training partners would really increase how strong everyone gets during this time. And the Saiyans would discover the Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan form, which is renamed to Super Saiyan Blue, somewhere during the next four months. All of them had great control of their Super Saiyan forms beforehand, the only real exception being Yamcha, who had never fully mastered Super Saiyan. 
Because Frieza was revived, Galactic Patrolman Jocko arrives to Earth for the first time in a long while to warn Bulma about the threat. This time running into the antics of Goten, Trunks, and Marin, while Booty and Kurizu try to get them to behave to get Jocko's information to Bulma. Once they meet, he warns her that Frieza is back and is on his way to Earth with a thousand soldiers. Oh, and he'd be there in an hour. Bulma panics trying to get in contact with Whis instantly since the majority of their strongest warriors are off world. No good. Thinking quickly, she calls Lunch to warn Tien and hopefully have him go and warn those who could help. Freeze and his men would still arrive like in canon and would leave a crater where a city had been as a hello. Not long after, the Z Fighters begin gathering. First, Gohan. Luckily, having kept up his training at least a light amount, so he was definitely in shape. Next was Piccolo, who remember had trained with Goku in the other world. Then was Android 17, who had decided to continue living with Master Roshi when Krillin and 18 decided they wanted their own place. And as such, the Turtle Hermit was able to hitch a ride with his tenant. Though as a precaution, the children were not informed of the threat, and Android 18 was staying back to protect them and those who could not fight. The caution the Z Fighters had always taken in the past had not faded by any means. Tien was currently running late. The reason being, he had to take the time to gather and be sure his students were prepared for this threat. Remember, in this timeline, he built his dojo in West City with a friendly endorsement from Mr. Satan. Because of this, the Tenshin Ryu dojo would flourish very quickly. This would allow Tien more time to separate the mediocre novice from those of actual martial arts talent. So with those factors in mind, these guys are at least more powerful than most of Frieza's soldiers, most only around as strong as Zarbon or Dodoria. But with their numbers and aid, and the aid of Android 17 and his infinite stamina, it would cut the workload of those originally involved. This would go a bit better than it did in canon, with more of Frieza's men taken down than in the original story before Sasami rushes into battle. Once again, he is significantly stronger than his canon counterpart. With this happening, Tagma realizes that if he is outdone, he will not receive Frieza's favor. Together with Sasami, they both rush the Z Fighters and land some pretty heavy and substantial blows that begin incapacitating and even killing some of Tien's unprepared students and the weaker fighters. With Master Roshi and the remaining students injured and outgunned, as well as having limited Setsu Beans, Tien asks 17 to try and get them out of there. Though he does not like it, he is the best option for the transport. 17 scoffs and creates a force fit around the injured and the dead to gather them all up and carry them on one trip. He then announces to everyone to try not to die as he will be back soon. This now left only three fighters to deal with Frieza and his men. Gohan is shocked by how much power Tagama and Sasami had, and he couldn't even begin to fathom how much power Frieza was hiding. Desperately, he begins trying to tap into the Super Saiyan God form out of pure need to save his friends. Unfortunately, his neglect of trying to use the form made it very difficult to reach now, so instead, he was only able to attain the Super Saiyan form. Meanwhile, Piccolo instantly took off his training weights, and Tien centered himself. Remember, he has not lost any power in his base form since becoming human again, only his Saiyan biology and the benefits of it. And considering he has been training this entire time, he is stronger than he used to be. Just not as strong as he could be. And right now, that was painfully obvious to him. Splitting up, Gohan realizes he is the only match for Frieza and rushes him. While Piccolo and Sasami clash, and Tien begins trying to deal with Tagama. Sadly, at their current states, none of the three are doing extremely well here. In canon, Frieza was able to pretty easily dismantle Gohan. And even though Gohan is a bit stronger due to attaining his god form and training a small amount more in this timeline, he is still no match for Frieza who remember is stronger than his canon counterpart. So right now, he's doing his best to hold back as much as possible and not kill Gohan too quickly. He really wanted Goku to see his son as he died. Meanwhile, Tagama and the difference between their powers weren't the only problems for Tien. His lanky body and crisp punches and kicks continued to be a decent thorn in Tien's side, as he couldn't get in any clean hits. He immediately had to resort to Kyle Ken just to block attacks without having his arms broken. With Piccolo, he is doing decently against Asami compared to the others. It was very clear now more than ever that his training in the other world had paid off, as he was maneuvering around Shizami very well. This allowed him to land some decently effective pot shots, but it was clear overall the Red Warrior was much stronger, and the small advantage Piccolo had was made up for by Sasami's brute strength. Thinking of a different approach, Piccolo asked Tien to switch opponents with him, and they do so after a solar flare. This time, Takuma's lanky body is countered by Piccolo's use of his stretchy arms. This made it very easy for Piccolo to catch and bind all the other aliens' attacks. Tagama was still stronger than him by a pretty decent amount, meaning the only thing keeping Piccolo in the fight right now was his technique. While on the other hand, Tien's strange techniques and speed with the Kao Ken confused Sasami, making the big hits easier to land. While locked down by Piccolo, Takuma sees Sasami finally grab Tien in a huge bear hug and smirks. He struggles to overpower Piccolo and raises his hand. As he does, he releases a key blast that flies through Sasami's back and out of Tien's. The two then both fall to the ground on the edge of death, with Sasami cursing Tagama as a traitor. Piccolo struggles to do it, but he is able to subdue Tagama for long enough just to get over to Tien and just barely give him a Sensu Bean to get him back into the fight. While on the ground, the Ginyu bits of this scenario would indeed still happen, 
and with Takuma's less repressed power is released, along with Frieza's huge energy from firing at Gohan, Buri and the kids are finally able to convince 18 to accompany them to the battlefield. Arriving, they see the now healed Tien and Piccolo trying to take on Takuma together, while Gohan is weirdly trying to dodge around and block Frieza's weak death beams. Seeing his older brother in dire straits, Goten rushes in, causing Trunks to fall right behind him, and 18 to curse and order the others to stay back unless they fuse before following them in as well. Always want to follow orders, Buri asks Mirren to fuse with her, but the other girl admits that she can't really remember the steps that well, and neither did Kurizu for that matter, making her and the others watch helplessly. Frieza, seeing Goten and Trunks, would have the exact same reaction to them, and would seriously try to kill them, shutting down any attempts at attacking him with a vicious death beam that actually shot through both boys. Summoning up the last of his willpower, Gohan is able to force his ragged body to move and cover the boys, taking the brunt of the attacks and saving them from any further damage. Now this will put a smile on Frieza's face. Seeing three Saiyan offspring so pitifully weak compared to him and at his mercy put Frieza in a way better mood, and I think he would stop his torture for only a bit to try and get them to gloat and beg for their lives. While the growing number of Saiyans had initially unnerved him, these three were nothing substantial. When this week, it was perfectly fine to play with Prey, and after all that time in hell, he would be damned if he didn't enjoy snuffing out every member of this race. Buri, seeing her friends in trouble, flies into her own rage, catching the attention of Ginyu as she comes a Super Saiyan, and nearly being destroyed by a key blast from him, were it not for her father who struggled to block the attack with a ki in his Kaioken state. He then orders the kids to go with Boma and Jocko and flee. Meanwhile, 18 and Piccolo, who had seen the dire straits that Gohan and the kids were in, were trying to find a way to get in and get them out of there and away from Frieza without being killed themselves. Realizing that Ginyu Tagama is still a very big threat, he fires into the Kaioken times 10 and plows into Ginyu as hard as he can. For a single second, he surpasses Ginyu, and he's able to throw him towards Frieza, who doesn't allow the subordinate to make contact with him, and bats him away, putting Ginyu down for the moment. Meanwhile, Boma, Mirren, and Kurizu are finally able to get in contact with Whis on Beerus' planet, while 18 and Piccolo use Tien's distraction to get Gohan and the boys away from Frieza. Ginyu begins to groggily stand up, only to be met with the angry three-eyed stare of Tien and Buri, as the duo use a full power father-daughter tri-beam to do him in. With the attack being point blank, and with Ginyu being in that tired and unprepared state, it is enough to put him down for good. Gohan's injuries were definitely the worst, his life currently hanging on by a thread and his heart having stopped, while Goten and Trunks would be okay giving proper medical attention. Piccolo uses his powers to restart Gohan's heart and give him the Sensu Beam, letting him get a decently sizable Zenkai boost as he stands back up to his feet with Piccolo, asking him what was happening. Just before the Namekian could fill him in on what had happened since he passed out, his eyes widen and he shoves Gohan out of the way, taking the full brunt of a big death beam from Frieza that leaves him sporting a huge hole in his chest as he falls over, dead. Once again, thrusted into an intense rage by seeing his mentor die by trying to protect him, Gohan is able to search deep within himself, and with a decent effort, he is finally able to tap back into the long neglected Godfall. Thinking that this power should definitely be enough to handle Frieza, he orders 18 to get Piccolo's body and the boys out of there and away from here. The cyborg does just that, as an angry Gohan rockets forward and plows right into Frieza. He begins to slam him with a flurry of attacks that are much too powerful for his first form. Seeing a Saiyan of Goku's lineage change hair color to overpower him unnerved this version of Frieza by a lot, whose paranoia is much greater than the original version. Struggling to create a bit of distance from the hybrid, he is able to paralyze him with his telekinesis and send him flying away, as he begins trying to shift into different forms at high speed. Once again paranoid, he tries to reach his final form almost instantly. As he was able to do so relatively quickly in the anime version, I'll say he's able to do so here as well. This was more than enough to reclaim the power balance and really shifted towards Frieza's favor. As soon as Gohan is able to regain mobility, he rushes back at Frieza, but is easily snapped away with his tail, almost being knocked out by the inertia of the force being jostled back at him. Still angry, he tries to bulldoze Frieza again, but he returns the favor of the flurry of attacks Gohan had given him earlier and begins to beat down on him until one blows him away. Frieza was just about to pursue the hybrid when he heard Kaio Kikoho. He looked up to see a three-eyed warrior, burning with red energy, just as a massively powerful red square-shaped beam slammed down on top of him, threatening to squash him. The attack was strong, but Frieza is too strong to go down to it, especially only being hit by it once but it seemed to have done a decent amount of damage as the Emperor was staggering a bit. Gohan quickly realizes this and appears behind Frieza, latching on him with his arm. He holds on for dear life and yells out that this is for Pan and Videl and tells Tien to keep hammering away with the attack. With Gohan holding him still, Tien kept hammering away at the attack over and over and over again, pulling on more and more of his life force to attack Frieza and hopefully destroy him. Unfortunately, as the attack was damaging Frieza, it was definitely damaging Gohan. All three of them were currently dying, and the major problem was, they were both dying faster than Frieza was. 
Resigned to taking Frieza down with him and Gohan, Tien prepares to sacrifice the last of his life to try and kill the Emperor. He then feels four familiar keys suddenly appear and he passes out. Vegeta jumps up just in time to catch Tien's limp body before he hits the ground. He then calls him a fool and tells him the crew of the heroics. Android 17 would arrive back to the battlefield just in time to see this. At the same time, Frieza breaks out of Gohan's hold as his body flops to the ground, dead. The Emperor smirks and the Saiyans snarl. We have a small recap and a quick revision from last time. When we last left off, Goku and Vegeta, along with the Witch Saiyans, Yamcha and Krillin, went to train with Whis. Meanwhile, Frieza is revived as in canon and takes on two training partners for four months instead of one making him much stronger than in canon. After battling those left on Earth, he has both defeated Son Gohan and Tien upon the Saiyans' arrival. There was also a poll given to decide who would battle Frieza, and Krillin had won that poll. And just before we get right back to the story, I do have one small revision. Frieza's death is not completely assured here. This was partly a bit of deception to keep this part a bit less predictable, and partly my neglect to think out the full ramifications of two training partners instead of one. We'll get into this more later, but for now, we return to this story. Frieza currently wore one of the most satisfied and elated smirks on his face that he had ever had, as he watched Tor and Rage cross each of the faces of Goku and his companions. Though Goku's was easily the most enjoyable. So much so that Frieza couldn't help but to further the taunting. He let his tail curl down and around the neck of Gohan's burnt and bloody corpse holding it up for all to see, as well as making a snide comment about breaking his fragile little toy. Out of anger, Goku immediately made to move towards Frieza to get revenge, but to his surprise, Krillin's arm pushed out in front of him to keep him back. The shorter human turned Saiyan cuts his eyes up and back to Goku and gives him a stern, yet somewhat compassionate look. It was very obvious that Krillin was angry too, but he states that he's sure Goku could feel Frieza's power and can tell there's a lot more hidden under the surface. If he's too careless because he's angry, he can make a huge mistake and that had cost everyone something. Not to mention, Gohan had never died while Piccolo had, so at the very least, Gohan could be wished back while getting Piccolo back would be a bit trickier. But Frieza had to be dealt with first. Hoping to get a smile out of Goku at this line of logic, Krillin nudges him and says that he was the one to win Rock, Paper, Scissors for taking Frieza on first. And Master Whis did say that he was the closest to completing their training. Getting serious, he reminds everyone of the plan. They need to split up. One of them need to get the kids home and one of them need to get their fallen and take them somewhere safe to make their wish. While one of them took on Frieza, this did little to placate Goku but before he could respond, Frieza's impatience at being ignored by two people boiled over and he fired a small blast towards the two. Thankfully, Yamcha, the only person still watching Frieza outside of Vegeta who was still holding the nearly dead Tien, was the one to react and protect everyone. Appearing in front of the blast, he makes a hammer out of his hands and bats it away towards their left with his left hand, all at the cost of a decently sized burn mark left on him. Shaking it to get the singing to go away while maintaining his glare to shock Frieza, he decides he'll handle the kids if either Goku or Vegito handle the Dragon Balls in getting their dead off the battlefield. With little more, he flies directly over to Android 18, who now stood with Buri, who is helping the injured trunks to remain in the air. With Marin and Kurizo to her side, the latter of which was attempted to comfort a shaking Goten as he stared at his brother's unmoving body. A little further back were Boma and Jaco as they viewed the battle after having gotten the message out to Beerus' planet. Because of this, both Beerus and Whis would arrive a bit later than Goku and the Saiyans had and they'd still have virtually the exact same interaction with the nervous Frieza. But unlike in canon, both deities are interested in seeing the fruit of the Saiyan's training, but are both impressed at Frieza's power increase. They assure the former Emperor that they will not be interfering in the battle, and he's able to regain his cool facade. Yamcha and 18 begin shooing everyone away from the now cloudy sky-covered mountain range, but Goten broke away, declaring he wanted to stay. Hearing this, Goku, who is currently watching as Krillin flew down towards Frieza, who seemed unamused by this, didn't even turn his head, but spoke clearly enough to tell Goten to listen to Yamcha and leave with everyone else. Blatantly ignoring his dad, Goten continues to approach, but already in a foul mood, Goku turns his head and snaps at him in a commanding tone, demanding he get the hell out of here and mind his father. But the boy is unlike his brother and was nowhere near as meek and snapped back that he didn't have to listen to Goku. Goku is shocked, but now his move is made even worse, as Goten stubbornly stays by his side to watch the battle. He sighs and tells 18 and Yamcha that they can leave Goten with him, and with that, they make their way towards West City with the children and Boma. Realizing he would not be getting a shot at Frieza first, Vegeta growls and decides to get Tien to the lookout as quickly as possible, and also take Gohan's body there as well and get to collecting the Dragon Balls so that he could quickly return and watch the fight, and hopefully participate in it. Not to mention, he did want to save Tien's life. He bursts into the Super Saiyan state and zooms off in the direction of the lookout. The transformation was something that Frieza noticed but didn't dwell on, as this left Krillin and Frieza alone outside the two remaining Son family members. During Goten and Goku's little spat, Frieza had taken the time to ask Krillin what he thought he could do against him. He'd actually gotten a bit more angry when the former human smirked and pointed at Frieza. He declares that he is nothing like the man he'd killed on Namek, and he'd get revenge for himself and every life he'd taken today. 
in a rare showing of uncouthness, Frieza snorts, and rolls his eyes at the cliche statement. He responds that he's played with enough trash for the day, and the only person he has any interest in fighting would be Goku, but before he can finish saying Goku, the image of Krillin in front of him flickers and his brow raises in confusion before he feels a kick land in his back and sends him sprawling forward on the ground. Snarling, he looks up to see Krillin's after image had dissipated, and looks behind him to see Krillin's left foot still extended in a perfect form for the kick. He then retracted it back and breathed out evilly, declaring that that one was for Gohan. For a split second, his cool persona cracks as his balance falters and nearly falls onto his butt, only to catch himself at the last minute and sweat drop as he puts both feet to the ground. Frieza springs back to his feet and shoots his fist out for a wide and obvious punch, which Krillin attempts to dodge, once again attempting to move without thought lesson that Weezy had been drilling into him lately. But as he is actively thinking about doing it, there is still that fraction of a fraction of a second where his body has to catch up to his thoughts. Because of this, he's a second too late to realize that the sloppy punch was a feint, only massing Frieza's jab with his tail under the bald man's chin, which was powerful enough to launch him into the air. Shocking Frieza that he didn't just take his head right off then and there, and shocking Krillin at the underhanded yet pretty brilliant move. Getting over his shock, Frieza makes a grab for Krillin's ankle to slam him back into the ground, but the Shinron made Saiyan clenches his jaw and gets to thinking quick, which was always his ultimate weapon. In this position, he finally had the chance to try something he hadn't thought of before seeing Goku do it in the 23rd Martial Arts Tournament. Charging key in the soles of his feet, he stamps out and flies back and nails Frieza directly in the chest with two small key blasts, making the Emperor skid back as the extra force allows Krillin to flip and regain his stance on the ground. As Frieza wiped at the small burn slash scuff marks, Krillin growled that that was for Piccolo. Whis lets out a small noise of being impressed and of notation. And when asked why by Beerus, the angel reveals Krillin still thinking before moving, but he was glad to see that that amazingly tactical mind of his was definitely getting faster than that they had trained together. Partly a joke and partly a jab to motivate his lord, he jokes to Beerus that once he masters his movement without thought, Krillin's fighting style would be too unpredictable to be countered, by god and mortal alike. Goten stared in awe of Krillin's skill as they watched Krillin flip back to his feet and freeze a stand wiping the dust from his sleek frame with a vicious snarl. He couldn't sense Ki, but based on the measly sting every attack from Krillin carried, he was still a god compared to the little piss hands. Wiping his nose in a haughty fashion, he compliments Krillin, but states that he still views him as even lower than a stupid monkey. He isn't about to waste his time on something so insignificant. Yelling to Goku, who stood so far behind him, his anger is on full display now, as he orders him to face him. This actually causes Goten, still emotional from the death of his brother, to flinch. Goku showed no visible emotion, though, clearly attempting to keep himself calm and not interfere in Krillin's battle. After all, his friend had had to do the same for him many times before. Not hearing a peep out of Goku, Frieza's anger again begins to build, and he reaches out a hand towards the trash that opposed him. Soon, Krillin would feel sick to his stomach, as a terrifyingly similar sensation of floating without the use of his key returned. He was lifted up into the air as Frieza's scowl became a sadistic grin, and he glowed to Goku that this felt just like old times. He squeezed his hand tight, and Krillin fearfully screamed as the explosion went off, and all that was left was a cloud of ash and soot as silence ruled. It was then dethroned by the sound of key flaring and flowing hot and full of life. A familiar yellow glow surrounded Krillin, but with blue arcs of electricity. It seemed like Super Saiyan, but something was much more ferocious about it. Of course, this was the least shocking thing to Frieza, as Krillin's eyebrows and the dots that adorned his forehead began to shine a bright yellow. No notable damage was on his body, except for his clothing being burned and tattered, leaving his chest adorned and the ruins of his blue shirt under his gi. His fearful screaming turned to boisterous laughter, as Frieza's jaw dropped as he incredulously asked how Krillin could possibly be a Saiyan. The former human reiterates that he is not the same as he once was, but kudos to Frieza for making him abandon his base form, even going all the way up to Super Saiyan 2. Luckily, his power increased from training so hard it made the form available to him, and without it, he believed that Frieza would have gotten his way. While he hated him, the martial arts in him could respect the improvement Frieza had made. Krillin's Saiyan biology and the effect it had on his mind as well had made this thought impossible to keep in. Without another word, he rushes forward to gut check the Emperor, but his punches actually stop short of hitting his mark, as it's stopped by Frieza, but the force does cause him to go skidding backwards towards the edge of the cliff face over the water. After being humiliated by Krillin twice now, anger and rage filled the former Emperor of the Universe, as his grip began to tighten around Krillin's arm. Whether Krillin had always been a Saiyan, and he just didn't know it, or if the Dragon Balls which had revived him had somehow been involved, he did not know, and at this point he did not care. This also explained how that random was able to deflect one of his blasts. He also thinks back to Sorbet's report that an unknown Saiyan had aided Vegeta in destroying Majin Buu. And on top of that, these Saiyans had been referencing people as their children, meaning the Saiyans were repopulating and he had done a terrible job of exterminating their race. The thought that the number of monkeys acting in opposition of him going up made something inside him snap. Without any fanfare, Frieza's power bursts and explodes, changing his aura from the usual malevolent purple to a deep royal gold. Remember, in this timeline, 
Frieza not only trailed the Tagama, but also with Sasami, causing his power to grow theoretically twice as much as it was in canon. The depths of Frieza's potential cannot be understated. And with this said, I believe that Freeze would also attain a much greater ease a transform into his golden state. As such, with a bright flash, Krillin is nearly blinded, and he has a realization of Freeze's new appearance as the Emperor's grip tightens enough that something in his arm had also snapped. Goku and Goten were shaken to the core, while Beerus and Whis were intrigued. Frieza lifts his free hand and swings it in a chop to take Krillin's head off. Just before the blow could land though, Krillin's aura had also changed, and much like Frieza had before him, he unveiled the epitome of Super Saiyan by changing to the newly discovered Super Saiyan Blue as quickly as possible and also like Frieza with very little fanfare. Similarly to Frieza, Krillin has been training with three other gods. I believe under these conditions, Goku, Krillin, Vegeta, and Yamcha would all find it a lot easier to transform into Blue than Goku and Vegeta at this time in canon. Another part of the scaling that has to be interpreted here is that none of the Saiyans have similar potential as Frieza. While yes, they did have very strong training partners, they were not constantly training as Frieza was. We know they did a lot of chores for Whis, they had to sleep, they had to eat, and do other bodily functions that just take away from overall training time. Not to mention they're also not just abusing Zenkais, so the power they're going to gain is going to be very incredible, but compared to this version of Frieza, that's relative. With the godly blue form assumed, the split segment before the attack landed was well spent, as Frieza's hand would leave a bruise, but it was far from taking Krillin's head off. Shockingly, Krillin could very easily tell that he still had not surpassed Frieza, but the gap had been close enough for him to win if he played smart. Krillin rears back and rams his forward into Frieza's chin, sending him back staggering, eyes wide, at Krillin's change and is still living. Though he attempted to hide it, Frieza was much too angry for more pleasantries. Instead, he and Krillin began engaging in much more ferocious combat, with their power shaking much more than just the earth as the mountainside crumbled and fell into the water. Goku was sweating as he felt the depths of Frieza's power. He wasn't sure that any of the Saiyans could take Frieza down alone, but there was something peculiar about the increase that he noticed, and he hoped that Krillin had as well. Goku, on the other hand, was much less assured of himself, and began to really cheer Krillin on to win this fight and avenge his brother. Feeling the massive spike in Frieza's key and a large source of God Key, Vegeta dumps the duty of finding the rest of the Dragon Balls and gathering the rest of Tien's students onto Mr. Popo and Dende's hands, and rushes back to see what the hell was going on and what Frieza had been hiding. He arrives and is shocked by Frieza's transformation as Goku fills him in, and his brow furrows as he somewhat hopes that Krillin loses it so he gets a chance of revenge. Meanwhile, Yamcha decides it'd be best to stay back just in case he became the last line of defense. He was able to truly sense Frieza's power, and it scared him but he was more than ready to step up when the time came. This also gave him a chance to spend a bit more time with his newborn son, whom is still to be named outside the story, mind you. Remember, I theorized that after becoming a Saiyan, Yamcha would become a real family man and be very protective over his family. Back at the battle, close combat was beginning to weigh heavily on Quillen due to his injured arm. Frieza was relentless in his flurries of punches and kicks, so blocking with that arm made them extra painful. Getting an idea, he weaves to his left, meaning he had only blocked with his injured arm. Frieza's subsequent haymaker would then miss by a large margin, but his tail was in perfect position to land a clean blow. That is, until a bright yellow high intensity disc of key materialized over Krillin's injured arm, causing the tip of Frieza's tail to go flying off due to his own attack. The Golden Emperor screams in pain and jumps back, having forgotten about the technique. Switching roles, Krillin began to be the one much more aggressive in battle, using his injured arm and the Kienzan hovering over it like a razor sharp shield that Frieza had to dodge and weave around instead. He jumps straight up to make some distance between him and the Saiyan and forms his own death saucer techniques above his hands. Throwing them both down at Krillin, the former human's eyes widen as he shields himself, allowing the purple version of his attack to slam into his and actually bounce right off of it. Expecting this, Frieza's hands then clapped and the saucers change direction completely, coming in for a pincer attack on Krillin. Like this, he can block from both sides, and maintaining such a powerful attack for so long was draining, and so Krillin allowed his shield to dissipate and began focusing on dodging and fleeing from Frieza's attack. Using the after image once again, he avoids being sliced in half, and does his best to stay alive as Frieza relentlessly kept up the pursuit, actually creating two more death saucers and sending them his way as well. The chase would go on for much longer than either Frieza or Krillin desired, but what Frieza didn't realize is that his key was now draining even faster than before. Like on Namek, he once again sees his fleeing opponent is attempting to make the remote controlled attack run into his caster, but this time he has a perfect counter for it. He himself flies towards Krillin, whose eyes were locked on the death saucers pursuing him. Shifting his eyes back to his front, he sees Frieza's foot flying towards his face, and both grew a look of shock as Frieza's foot went right through Krillin's head and body with way too little resistance, revealing this to be an after image clone. The Death Saucers continued to make a beeline for their master, but Frieza easily glared at them using his own telekinesis to stop them in midair. Just then, Krillin's true position is revealed to be right over Frieza, as he crashes down on him with both feet, driving him hard into the cliffside. This was the first of the Saiyan's attacks to do actual significant damage against Frieza, and knocked him for a loop 
as dust spurred up around Frieza and he felt Krillin's boot still pinning his skull to the ground. Worst of all for Frieza, his golden form had drained him too quickly, and this in tandem with his excessive use of the key heavy death sausage technique had reverted him back to his base form. Though Krillin on the other hand, panting hard from all his dodging maneuvering, was able to maintain his blue form. In fact, he lifted a hand and created a final Kienzan to loom menacingly over Frieza's head like a dethroned emperor about to be cut down by his own guillotine. He admonishes that Frieza was far too inefficient with his key usage and that his new form was useless if he couldn't feed it. It took him a while to notice it, but once he did, he knew he could win. Speaking of which, with Frieza being so drained and with him having a good amount of gas left in the tank, it was now safe to revert to his normal state. This final blow will be for the innocent people in the city Frieza destroyed, as well as Tien's students. As despair and surprisingly fear settles in the pit of Frieza's stomach, he thinks quick and screams out to Krillin to please wait and allow him to atone for his evil deeds in some way. He was trying to buy time to gather strength and pray that Krillin shared Goku's soft heart. A bit surprisingly, Krillin actually hesitates, but Vegeta calls out that it's simply a ploy. Frieza has no sense of guilt or remorse. He all but orders Krillin to finish Frieza off now. Goku strangely stays quiet on this topic, but there was clearly conflict in his gaze as well. Frieza counters by claiming it was hypocritical to allow Vegeta such a chance, but not he. He'd served under him for years. Infuriated, Vegeta yells to Krillin that if he had any pride as a Saiyan or as a protector of the Earth, then he'd finish Frieza off. He'd taken far too many lives. Today was just another load of corpses on the mountain he'd left in hell. For a single moment, Krillin would consider mercy. At this point, he could actually understand what Goku had felt when he had asked and spared Vegeta's life the first time the Saiyan had come to Earth. It was a waste. This was just instinct. Even Goku had spared Frieza before, but that led him to coming right back as a threat. He spent all that time in hell and hadn't changed at all. Moreover, Vegeta had a point. While he didn't exactly care about the Saiyan race, he was a part of it now, and innately, genocide inspires feelings of hate. Above all that which ran through his head, the thought of Frieza destroying the planet where his daughter and wife lived, or taking the life of Piccolo and Gohan, a young man he'd literally seen grow up and often acted as a mentor figure to, it was all unforgivable. Krillin's mind is made up, and he coldly denies Frieza's request. But those precious moments of rest, and the single moment where the pressure painting Frieza's skull to the ground was lessened, were taken full advantage of by Frieza. He thrust both hands to the ground to throw Krillin off balance and get into a better stance for his next action. He is about to force a huge amount of his remaining key into the earth to detonate it. In this state, it could possibly kill him, but he had a much better chance of living than any of the Saiyans did. Of course, this plan also hands on Whis and Beerus' impartiality. But before he could even surge a minuscule amount of his key, Vegeta, who had been watching closely, silently pointed and utilized his Gallic Beam or Cyclone shooting technique. The thin beam of key rockets forward, impacting Frieza's left shoulder and running directly through it, knocking him back from the force. Meanwhile, Krillin's hand calls down the Kienzan at an odd angle after he'd almost regained balance, but the three acting in the same instant caused fate to twist, and instead of the Emperor being beheaded, only his left arm above the elbow and his legs at the hips are severed diagonally. Frieza screams in pure anguish, and summoning the last tricks of his key, fires off two eye beams, one hitting Vegeta and the other Krillin. Both actually are pierced by the attack, but its low power makes it a shallow blow at most, only damaging due to surprise. But it was enough to knock them down and put them out for a second. Knowing retreat was his only way of living, this allows Frieza to pour absolutely everything he had left into flight, away from Earth and into space, where he could survive. Goten, seeing the tables turn and being shocked by it and wanting to avenge Gohan, flashes into Super Saiyan and assumes the pose to charge the turtle destruction wave. But he was not dumb. He calls out to his father that they must kill Frieza before he gets away completely. Goku, still pretty shocked and for a single instant, has a thought. And somewhat to his shame, it slows him. If I let him go, then he can get even stronger. And then I can fight him. Seeing his father stand still and knowing his power alone is insufficient, Goten yells out to his dad to please help for Gohan. And that does it. That instantly forces Goku into a decision and he charges the same blast as quickly as possible at the cost of some of his power. But in perfect tandem and synchronicity, the two let off a father-son Kamehameha. The huge blue beam soars towards Frieza, who had just reached the stratosphere before it slammed into him and began to push him higher and higher until he was out of sight and most likely consumed by it. Soon, his key had indeed disappeared, and Goku saw it from the emotional roller coaster they had been. As Goten rushes forward to help Krillin up to his feet, and Goku tries to do the same for Vegeta, though he rejects this. The four Saiyans float together and look towards space, knowing the day had indeed been won, as Whis and Beerus fly over. The group, including Beerus and Whis, would all gather somewhere where the Dragon Balls could be used. Remember, Piccolo has been wished back to life using Dende's set of Dragon Balls, so Shinron cannot revive him, 
but Namek could be contacted by King Kai to make a wish, or at the most extreme, Boma could bribe Whis to bring him back to life. This isn't a skill of his that she knows about, but he could mention it in return for food. Gohan, however, will return to life in a much different state than what he had died in. His death here is much different than what is canon. In this timeline, Gohan technically had everything he needed to destroy Frieza from the beginning. If he had been able to assume God form from the start, he could have wiped out the entire Frieza force single-handedly. As strong as he was, there was no way that first form Frieza could have taken on a Super Saiyan God. But he had been complacent, and had lost his already somewhat meager control over his God key. Remember, in this timeline, Gohan has now had two moments as a grown man with someone to protect, where his short-sightedness had nearly cost them everything. He was all but aware that if his father and the others had been a few minutes late, Frieza would have likely destroyed the planet and kept moving. No more. From now on, he needs to rely on his own power, not solely his father's. Not just this, but his dad has spent his entire life protecting the planet. At some point, he would have to take that mantle up and protect his own family. And of course, Tien had been in a very similar mindset for a long time now. But this latest battle had only deepened his convictions, and may cause even deeper regret at his decision to return to his human body. But his warrior's pride didn't allow him to dwell on that despair for long. He had to keep moving forward and work even harder. He'd do it with his own power as well. As this was the mindset of two of the warriors involved, and Frieza's defeat coming the way it did, the revivals weren't very joyous, so the majority of everyone involved was pretty somber save for Beerus and Whis, who took the opportunity to enjoy some of the Earth's food. As for Tien's students, they thank him for reviving them, but unless it's another emergency, they're never doing this again. Also a quick note, but the wish to revive everyone had to be worded as revive those killed in battle today and not just those killed by Frieza's men, as Gohan was simply killed by Tien's Kyle Kikoho. With everything set back into working order, Goku, Vegeta, Yamcha, and Krillin spent a few days on Earth just because. For Yamcha, he'd already been away from his newborn for far too long, but I believe Pizza would admonish that she could accept his reasons for being gone so long, even though she by no means liked them. At least she knew her children's father could protect them. Unbeknown to the couple, their firstborn, Kurizu, had heard this statement, and it actually made her feel a bit regretful for herself at not doing much training as her father did. Perhaps she had, her crush Goten would have been so hurt during the battle as well. Or she could have completed the silly dance that Bui wanted to do to help everyone. After this short break for family time and recuperation, the Saiyans all return to Beerus' planet to continue their training under Whis. While back on Earth, Gohan takes a step forward. He seeks out Tien at his home of the city and asks him if he would like to join he and Piccolo in the Room of Spirit and Time soon. While Gohan is now more willing to train than ever, you also have to account for all the Saiyans being gone right now. If something else were to happen, he were to be with them, then the Earth would be left even more defenseless. Beyond that, taking one day off from work was much easier than taking a few months or weeks off. Also, since the Mekians had no need for food and only required water, they could bypass the two-man food limit. Beyond that, Tien wasn't a Saiyan, so his appetite wasn't even a large issue here, meaning they'd have more than enough provisions. With a chance to train with the god for over a year offered, the three embark out to the lookout, hoping to conquer their own weaknesses. Meanwhile, in space, ever so slowly, a body drifts. The remains of the torso of Frieza, burnt and beaten, had not been fully consumed by Goten and Goku's blast. Like in the Saiyan cycle with Vegeta, the beam, though more powerful than their victim, was not maintained long enough for it to incinerate Frieza, but instead push him out into deep space. As he'd already been heavily injured, the blast had been enough to push him to the very brink of death and far out away from Earth, where his now measly key signature could no longer be felt by those on the planet. But Frieza was not dead. In fact, the blast to hit him had inadvertently cauterized his severed torso, stopping his bleeding and giving him time to recover and brood as he drifted in the cold void of space. Krillin's snide remarks had imparted the wisdom of key efficiency on him, an issue he'd had even on Namek, and now was his downfall once again. He'd allowed a lowly sand he'd once easily destroyed to prove himself his superior, and it only fueled his deep-seated hatred more and more. Slowly, his torso began to move quicker and quicker, until the speed was definitely caused by flight, and he was sent zooming off deeper into the galaxy to find the Frieza Force. He was now somewhat irritated that he hadn't warned his men to step back or anything before his transformation to wipe them all out. It was simply another grain of salt in his stinging wounds that would impart the lesson of big picture thinking on him. Back on Beerus' planet as in canon, Beerus' brother, the god of destruction of Universe 6, and his attendant Vados would arrive for food challenges. Earth is discovered and Champa's petty jealousy sets in motion across Universal Tournament for the planet. But this doesn't bear an extreme amount of mentioning, as the tournament here is truly a pretty easily settled aspect of this timeline. And unlike what happened with the battle against Freeze between this part and last, this will not change. Think about it. Universe 7 currently has four Super Saiyan Blues and a Super Saiyan God, who are all training. There is no shortage of strong warriors to participate, and when they do, Universe 6 will not be prepared. But the major change here would be the exclusion of Monaka. I don't think Whis would be fond of the idea of tricking the Saiyans. Remember, he had already gotten a great deal of motivation out of them by stating that Krillin was the closest to mastering the technique he meant to teach them than any of the four Saiyans. 
Any more inadequacy could lead to Monaka being challenged by one of them, and if so, he'd be revealed as a fraud, calling Beerus and Whis's credibility into question. Whis would rather avoid angering their current source of entertainment and cuisine for something so unnecessary. It is of course arguable that Beerus could overrule this or that Whis wouldn't care, but I find both pretty unlikely. As such, the Saiyan gods are set to participate in the tournament with the domain of the final choice being given to them. Vegeta would make a strong argument for Tien, but Gohan was definitely stronger, especially after training and gaining control over his god state. He would also be interested in testing himself after all the training he'd done, and so he is chosen. Tien decides to remain on Earth for the sake of using the Room of Spirit in time once again, with Piccolo agreeing to stay back and train with him. With the fighting order of Gohan, Yamcha, Goku, Krillin, and Vegeta, Universe 6 is defeated with Kaba and Hit presenting the only real challenges, and Gohan decimating his first three opponents with very little theatrics, actually taking out a large amount of pent-up aggression on Frost and never giving him a good chance to actually cheat. I even imagine him offering to show Kaba the Super Saiyan transformation after the tournament, meaning he and Kaba formed that bond of teacher and student instead of Vegeta and Kaba, and I believe Gohan's analytical mind would allow a slight predictive edge against Hit, but I do not believe he has the power to overcome him yet. But Yamcha does, especially after seeing Gohan fight and using his Super Saiyan Blue form. The ending of this saga would also be the same as in canon with the arrival of Zeno and the idea of the Tournament of Power being planted in his mind. Back in space, Frieza would have finally found the remainder of his army, actually running into Barry Blue and Kikino, the crew he has in the new Broly move, just extremely early here. Seeing his body in such bad shape, he is instantly rushed into a regeneration chamber, but he stops Kikino and orders him to only regenerate his legs. When asked why, Frieza declares he wants to keep the scar from Vegeta's attack. As a reminder to never again be complacent, it would serve as a wonderful motivation for his training. And so, his legs and tail regenerated, while his arms were replaced with a mechanical one. He keeps his scar, and after this, he would seclude himself and begin training to once again take revenge at a later date. Trunks' timeline is still under threat and of a most unlikely foe. As in canon, after the explosive battle with Cell, in which Gohan showcased some strange, inexplicable power, the hope-seeking swordsman returned home and defeated the evil android menace of his timeline, also exterminating his version of Cell in explosive fashion. Armed with knowledge of Babidi and Deborah's impending arrival thanks to the Kais, Trunks would go on to amass a great deal of power training with them. So much so that when the battle came, Trunks here is actually much more prepared for Deborah in terms of pure power. Though the stone spit trick is still a surprise sadly, causing the end of the Z-Sword as it is broken into pieces. And because of that power, the anger felt by losing the Kai's treasured relic is actually what pushes Trunks into the Super Saiyan 2 form. This allows him to take on Deborah completely unarmed, and in this timeline, actually say Kabito, though he is a bit banged up by the end of it. With their victory that day came a fleeting sense of peace, but a disturbing echo of the past rung out, a foe that should not be. Trunks was able to repel every attack at first, with every encounter seemingly making them stronger and with casualties mounting, Trunks and Bulma are left with questions. Primarily, is this a distortion they caused by meddling in the past? Bulma has spent the last year attempting to scrounge up just enough fuel to get to the past once. Hopefully, detailed instructions could help her past counterpart make the same discoveries. Trunks attempts to convince his mother to come with him, but she refuses and says that there has to be someone back here to help the remaining survivors. Mai, who had risen up as the commander of the resistance force against their enemy and become a very close friend of Trunks, would promise to protect Boma, even going along with him and his mother now as they sneak through the streets to a secure location for Trunks to make the trip to the past and for Boma to join up with the other survivors. Unbeknownst to them, their foe had stalked them from a distance, much like how a predator stalks his unsuspecting prey, readying itself to bite down on the neck. In a bid to buy time, Trunks orders his mother and friend to go ahead and he'll catch up before unsheathing his sword and engaging his enemy wholeheartedly. The fiend, monikered black, easily stops his wife for his head with two of his fingers, but Trunks simply reversed the grip of his blade and slammed the pummel of it into the mysterious invader's scarred cheek. The small victory Trunks felt from feeling something crunch from his blow fades as a wolfish smile breaks out on the dark villain's face. Then he felt his legs swelled out from under him before Black unleashed a hellish axe kick that split the ground and Trunks nearly with it. He then stood over and looked down upon Trunks with contempt, but a burst of rapid gunfire and patching off his scarred face interrupted him. Though it did very little to stagger him, he looked over at the culprit and noticed Bulma wielding one of the machine guns she would have been seen with as a teenager. With the glare, the tool explodes in her hand, and sensing a small key above him, he casually smacks the upturned rubble beside him, and Mai, who had been standing atop it, came tumbling down in front of him as it splintered. He gloats, and Mai surprisingly makes an obscene gesture with one of her fingers. This is when Black would notice that it is adorned with metal pins, and he looks up to see a loaded grenade bandolier hanging from rebar above his head. Mai would then jump onto Trunks to cover his eyes, as loud bangs and harsh flashing lights erupted overhead. By now, Trunks had struggled to fill his lungs with air again and unleash a chop to the back of Black's knees to relieve the pressure on his stomach. Rolling out of the crater as Black stumbles back a bit and angrily rubs his eyes, damning the girl. 
As soon as he felt them get free, he began to randomly release key blasts in every direction thinkable, hoping to swat them down. Trunks would jump on the opportunity and go for broke, rushing forward grabbing both Mai and his mother and flying full speed toward the destination. Then to be safe, he dropped them off and made to go even further before cutting his key and running back on foot, thankfully avoiding Black as he flew overhead tracking his key signature where it left off. In the small hangar they hid in, Boma and Mai had finished fueling the time machine and had just finished the preparation for takeoff when he returned. Currently in a pinch, he does his best to convince them both to accompany him, but they assure him that they will be okay and rush him to go ASAP, because the quicker they can refuel and come back, the better their chances are. Reluctantly, Trunks boards the vehicle and starts the takeoff sequence. The roof of the hangar opens quietly, and the time machine only rises a bit to allow Trunks a chance to check around and see the area is clear of black. Sighing in relief, he starts the time travel part of the flight sequence and turns to wave to his mom and friend. At that moment, the hangar wall is obliterated and Black walks in, taking the time to make eye contact with him, a sadistic smile stretches across his face. Tears filled his eyes, but before he could let out a cry, he's whisked to the past and rendered unconscious due to the stress, fear, and exhaustion. Meanwhile, in the timeline we're used to, Trunks and the children of the Pilaf gang, who he is tutored alongside, are conducting a class, and just about to break for the day to allow Goten and the daughters of the other Z Fighters to come over. On Beerus' planet, Goku and Vegeta indulge in sparring, while the deities relax and snack, and back on Earth in West City, the rest of the Z Fighters go about their usual daily lives, or what counts as usual for them, that is, until a strange vehicle arrives to Capsule Corp. Not recognizing it, Trunks would inform his mother, who definitely does, and like in the anime's canon, she would go on to call into Vegeta and tell him to return with Goku, who has Trunks power up so that he can instant transmission all four of them to Capsule Corp. There, Vegeta and Goku help Trunks out of the machine and soon get him a sensu beam for his wounds. He awakens in a bed, dazed, trying to recall the immediate events. Glimpses of their trek through the city, his fight with Black, then escaping and finally his mind settles on a grim scene, the moment Black broke into the hangar and made eye contact with him. That image searing itself into his psyche. Present Boma then walks in to wake her son and is met with a tearful hug not unlike of a frightened child. Boma holds her boy quietly knowing that his life is not an easy one and the two just sit there for a long time. The outburst had calmed Trunks somewhat, leaving him feeling better and not having to hold back all that anger and sadness. Now feeling more in the present and grounded, Trunks stands and follows his mother out of the room and back to his mission. The other Z-Fighters would arrive to Capsule Corp, Krillin having gotten off of work and arriving with the likes of Marin and actually Goten. After his fight with Frieza, the kid had actually approached him to ask Krillin to become his martial arts teacher, a request which had really thrown him for a loop considering whose child this was, but this is more of a story for another day. Piccolo would also arrive, being very surprised to see Trunks back, and with them present, he begins his explanation of the situation. He regales him on his battle with the forces of Bobbity and explains the new foe arrived and they had no idea how, but it was a man that looks just like Yamcha, even bearing his scars. But he somehow possesses Saiyan traits that only the Yamcha from the present timeline should have. Beerus and Whis, now intrigued, speculate about how all this could be possible. They don't think Yamcha of all people is capable of such acts, but they also tell that this is the danger of messing with time. That sparks the question of Yamcha's current alibi, which is conveniently answered when Yamcha's first child, Kurizu, arrives and mentions that Yamcha was with Mr. Satan, her mother, and her little brother, Cheta. However, everyone's pondering is interrupted, as temporal energy condensed and rippled above them. A dark and powerful key launched through and opened time, and there stood Yamcha Black with a sneer. No one could believe it. He himself was surprised by all the people. As everyone is confused, Goku racks his brain trying to figure out what's going on, mumbling about if Ginyu had something to do with this. Vegeta, however, was nowhere near as concerned about the logistics. If Trunks' story were true, then Black was his prey and his alone. He quickly beat Goku to the punch and dashed in front of Black, causing his eye to twitch as he is once again denied a fight. Vegeta, my this is a treat! Your key definitely isn't Yamcha's. Not that I would hold back if it were him. Don't die too quickly. You've got a lot to pay for. Elated by the prospect, Black rockets forward with a flying knee which slams right into Vegeta's nose. But the Saiyan Prince shows no reaction, shocking Black, who upon landing on the ground, quickly jumps back creating distance and begins to power up. He thinks to himself that Vegeta must be far stronger than he thought and flashes with golden light as his key house. He assumes the Super Saiyan form, but Vegeta shows that he is not impressed in the slightest. Back to it, Black charges in with a Superman punch, which Vegeta ducks, countering with an uppercut to the chin. Black is pushed back, going into a flurry of jabs and crosses, and Vegeta bobs and weaves with each blow, taking care to powerfully counter every other shot. He works the body and sends shockwaves with each blow of his crushing fist. 
In pain and enraged, Black gets out of Vegeta's range for a bit and throws a vicious roundhouse, but Vegeta moves to his blind spot and lands a devastating cross, sending Black stumbling back. By this point, there will be a very important development. Having finished his business with Mr. Satan and since Trunks, then Goku, Beerus, Vegeta, Whis, and now something which felt oddly familiar, the real Yamcha had come to see what was happening, and the plot thickens. Hey! Who stole my face? Vegeta pauses to confirm that this really isn't Yamcha he's beating right now, while the badly battered Black glances at Yamcha and smirks sinisterly. Before the beatdown can continue, the force of time begins to pull Black back to where he had been when he used the ring, tearing him from Vegeta's grasp. Snarling at being dragged back, he tries to writhe and fight the force, but he is unable to break it. He finally eyes the time machine that Trunks had escaped in, and quickly tries to fire a small key blast directly at it to destroy it, much to Trunks' horror, only for Krillin and his versatile Destructo Disc Shield technique to deflect the blast. Black damns Krillin, and he disappears. More shocked than anyone right now, Yamcha frantically asks for answers. Whis tells him to calm himself and takes it upon himself to explain the entirety of the situation to him. Even more perplexed, the deities mention the iconic earring that Black was wearing, and its specific color. Beerus and Whis will hold an investigation into the connection between it and Black, as right now it was possible this could take place in their timeline as well. And this is an investigation that Krillin intended to join, and Beerus decides it'd be useful to bring Yamcha along as well. Those four leave to journey to Universe 10, and Bulma gets to work on fueling the time machine, as with their current setup, it wouldn't take as long to produce the fuel as her future counterpart. She orders Trunks to rest for the next 24 hours, but Vegeta suggests his son train. The family talk it out, and Vegeta actually has a bit of a heart to heart with Trunks right here now. Afterwards, Vegeta is very pleased with Trunks' response, but the only tell to that was a smile that he cracked before returning to his usual serious expression. It stands now! That's I, Kakarot, and even Krillin are more than enough to take on Black, even as insurance policies. There is no reason for us to face him. By the time Yamcha and the others return from Universe 10 with more questions than answers, he is informed of the plan and questions why he has a bigger workload than the others, and the Saiyans all give him an answer. Because if someone were to use my face, I'd be damn sure to find out why. Vegeta scoffs and everyone notices the power of Gohan arriving at Capsule Corp, still dressed in the clothes he wore for work. The other hybrid isn't too shocked to sense that Gohan is still extremely powerful, and his aura feels more matured yet still somewhat lighthearted. The boy that defeated Cell had grown and changed for the best it seemed. In celebration of the visit, Gohan offers to host Trunks for dinner since he never had the chance to meet his wife or daughter, which Trunks is actually very interested in. This is still a chance to see the life that Gohan deserves in their timeline, and this Gohan who now more than ever reminds him of his own, that he just has to see. Vegeta kinda senses this and backs off, turning on his heels, but he does offer to train with him before the departure to the future. With Vegeta in one of his moods, Goku laments that now he has nothing to do. Picking up on all this, Gohan realizes that no one has filled him in on what's going on, and decides that he's going to get it out of Trunks himself, and the two fly towards his home. After having pleasantries with Gohan's family members and being surprised that he married into the Satan family, this visit is very much the same as the anime adaptation portrayed, except Gohan, in service of his curiosity, would try to convince Trunks to have a bit of a place bar, as it was something that Baby Pan really got a kick out of. Trunks would insist that he actually did have to go because he really wanted to take his father up on the offer to train, but Gohan uses sweet sentiments against him. The baby girl babbled at the warrior from the future and the name got Trunks blushing like mad. He reluctantly agrees and smiles and Gohan and Pan dance around a bit. Soon he and Gohan would face off a good few feet away from Mr. Satan who would sit and watch her with his granddaughter and explain to her all the amazing training he'd give her when she got older. Gohan then uses his watch made by Boma and Morse into the Great Saiyan Man, with poses and voices included, causing Pan to cheer. Trunks sweat drops, but when he hears Gohan speak low so only he and Trunks could hear, he is actually very caught off guard. He's shocked at the change in attitude, but he ends up having to block as Gohan had closed the gap between them with his fist poised to punch a hole in Trunks. He apologizes, but adds Trunks to go all out. He then shocks him further by backflipping in a familiar form and firing off a one-handed key blast towards him. Finally realizing that Gohan isn't playing around and he really is even stronger than he thought, Trunks powers up into Super Saiyan and slices clean through the attack, only for a shadow to appear above him and he just barely blocks as Gohan attempts to stomp him into the ground. Thanks to his reflexes, Gohan lands on the flat of the blade braced by Trunks' other arm. Gohan is pretty impressed and he praises Trunks, but he tells him that he knows he has to have more than that before leaning his head down. In the next moment his helmet shot off bouncing off of Trunks' forehead. The swordsman nursed the new bump on his forehead and asked Gohan what the hell he was doing but he was silenced as he recognized the red glow now around Gohan and his spiky red hair. He'd only seen this once before, but the presence he'd felt and the disappearance of Gohan's key was still scary to him. 
Gohan explains that they had finally discovered what this form truly was, and reminds Trunks to give him everything he has. The hero from the future nods slowly, and he shows Gohan his own version of the Super Saiyan 2 transformation, which Gohan had also mastered. After assuming it, he feels pride at Gohan's smile of approval, and he lost himself in having fun in the spa for the first time in many years. Meanwhile, back at the Capsule Corp and sensing Trunks in Gohan's key, Vegeta would go and retrieve the kid version of Trunks and proceed to order him to follow him before taking off towards Gohan's residence. They stop high above the air and look down to see huge yellow and red keys crashing and blowing a fierce wind around the entire area of the house, while Mr. Satan held onto a tree for dear life and Pan sat cradled in his arms, cheering at the chaotic and awesome battle. Vegeta speaks to the present version of his son and tells him to look upon his future counterpart. He explains to Kid Trunks the difference between their timelines, and more importantly the fact that this is something that Trunks is capable of and shouldn't squander by slacking on training. He really tries to drive home to Trunks that there are some limits that being naturally talented won't let you break. The young hybrid was in awe as he watched a version of himself taking on the godly power of Gohan and not doing bad at all. It was an impressive feat and one he never really felt that he wanted to achieve until now. Excitedly, he looked at Vegeta and asked if they could please start to train together again. Back in the spar, Trunks is realizing that Gohan is still holding back and he pushes him to strive harder and harder. Truly enjoying this, he begins to lose himself in the single-minded attempt to best his friend, and Gohan really appreciates this. But sadly, Gohan's alarm for the 10-minute round goes off. He then thanks Trunks for the spar and apologizes for deceiving him. This causes Trunks to want to tell him everything. The two have flown in the air for a while longer as Gohan is filled in. But then, interrupting Trunks' story, a small attacker barrels into Gohan's chest and unleashes a barrage of high-power punches accompanied by gleeful laughter. Gohan unprepared is winded and sent careening into the ground as he, Trunks, and Mr. Satan's eyes bulge out in surprise, seeing Pan's mighty aura flared as she cheers at emulating her father. Everyone is shocked, not having been aware just how powerful Pan is. After calming her down and saying their goodbyes, Trunks will return home to Capsule Corp, very happy to have taken the chance to meet Gohan's family and test his power against him. Part of him really wanted to ask him to tag along to the future tomorrow, but he truly did want to try for himself one last time and didn't want to pull Gohan into a dangerous situation, even though he has kept up his training. Vegeta would be the only one awake once Trunks returns home, and the two speak on the visit with Trunks mentioning Gohan's god form and even Pan's surprising power. Vegeta is interested in this and talks about Gohan's potential always being a mystery and even informing Trunks that Pan might be the first child to have inherited God Key. And he suggests that Trunks may have gotten in way more training than he thought he did and suggests that he go and get some sleep. The next morning, Castle Court would be a buzz with most of the Z Fighters initially present. But today, a new development takes place and Whis informs Goku and everyone that Grand Zeno was asking to see him. Remember, the term of the story still took place in this timeline even though only Gohan and Yamcha really fought and regardless, and as Zeno arrives at all and talks about a cross multiversal tournament, I don't see Goku not approaching him. Beerus stays at Capsule Corp and orders Goku and Whis to go and see what Zeno wants with the Supreme Kai's help. They can continue their investigation later. This now frees Krillin up and Vegeta asks what his plans are. He then suggests that the short Saiyan has nothing to do, he should come to Tien's with him and train with him, mentioning that the human had actually gotten much stronger and was wanting sparring partners to help teach his students. Today, Yamcha had brought his entire family along to see him off to the future and told them that he will return as soon as possible. Once again, Gohan's key is felt approaching the residence, but this time when he arrives, he is in a combat gi. He explains that he had been thinking it over last night and he really wants to be there to lend support to Trunks, to which Trunks happily accepts and Yamcha complains about Trunks not being this excited when he joined him. He laughs nervously and the three float up and squeeze into the cramped vehicle, now barely able to wave at everyone. The flight sequence starts and they venture back into Trunks' timeline. There, Yamcha finally lays his eyes upon the horror which caused him to make the wish to become a saint in the first place. He realized that this is the exact same city they just left, but in total ruin. Capsuling the time machine, Trunks would go on to check back in on the remaining survivors. We even see future Yajirobe, who was pretty shocked to hear what happened to Yamcha in the other timeline. And like in both canons as well, Mai would be revealed to be alive. And yes, the separation and the fear of almost never seeing each other again still push the two to openly display their feelings, as virtually nothing in the timeline should reliably change them. And as for how she escapes Black, I'll leave that vague like both canons do. After this, the trio of Saiyans will get a good distance away from the survivors and power up to attract Black, who wastes absolutely no time in flying to them and perching high above them on a destroyed building. He greets them smugly and seems especially happy to see Yamcha. I found you, faker! Hello, my contemptible duplicates! Black's gun returned as he instantly leapt out to attack Yamcha, but he was stopped short when he had to catch Trunks' thrown sword. Taking a page out of Gohan's book, just after his weapon is caught, he slams his fist into the flat of it and flew forward as fast as he could, pushing Black back even more and transforming straight to his master Super Saiyan 2 form to go all out from the start. 
As Black is driven back from the inertia, Trunks will regrip his weapon and execute his shining slash maneuver. While not able to cut Black, the high-speed attack overwhelmed him and gave Trunks some room to breathe before a slight move of his palm let him land a powerful point-blank key blast that sent Black flying into the ruins of a building. Trunks looks down in his body and feels more power inside him than before. Gohan notes that he noticed this when he and the others sparred against each other in their god forms the first time, and when they fought Beerus, and most recently with Tien. Battling opponents with god key was amazing training, and he honed his god form much farther than anyone else had so far. From the rubble, Black steps out and scowls while dusting himself off, only showing a small burn mark from where the blast had hit him. Vegeta had been much more powerful than I'd ever thought possible. The absolutely excruciating pain he put me through. The utter humiliation and divine rage I felt in that moment. This genius body and the Saiyan ability to power up from near fatal wounds. All this came together to show you Saiyans what true divine power is. Refusing to give in, Trunks rushes back towards his opponent and desperately unleashes every physical attack he could, but every slash, punch, and kick was dodged or parried without issue. Finally, Black would counter by dodging to the side and unleashing a powerful kick that snapped Trunks' head back before the imposter allowed his other foot to leave the ground and he spun to deliver a drop kick and floated before hitting the ground, just as Trunks is sent into the same building he was and the structure comes crashing down on him from the force, but he did not move afterwards. Gohan, concerned for his friend and knowing that he currently held the sensu beans they came equipped with, would rush over and begin to quickly dig through the rubble to find them. Black scoffs, unimpressed, and hones back in on Yamcha, who is now the only man to face him. The genuine article then declares that he'll be the one to truly punish Black. He then begins to power up, and blue light explodes outward, as Yamcha reveals the pinnacle of his power and confidently gives Black a thumbs down. He then taunts Black, but the imposter is not shaken. Malevolent pink and dark purple energy flood out of Black, and he reveals what he calls Super Saiyan Rosé. The power even caused Gohan to shudder as he finally lifted the largest chunk of rubble off of Trunks and rushed to give him one of the three sensu beans they had brought with them. Yamcha could also feel that Black's power had grown by a lot. Fear actually crept into his heart and his confidence waned for a split second. It wasn't allowed to go further than that because of Black's next words. He asked Yamcha why he mentioned avenging the people of this timeline, but never his own family. The frown Yamcha wore immediately hardened to a harsh glare and he asked Black what he just said, clarifying. Black informs that he killed the family of the Yamcha that he took this body from. The mere thought of failing to protect his family, which he held so dear, causes a deep-seated rage within Yamcha to erupt out and increase the intensity of his flowing blue key. The sound of his flaring sounded almost like the call of a wolf, as Yamcha's enraged Neo Wolf Fang Fist brought him clashing against the source of such anger, who responded by allowing his body to instinctively use the same technique, but with a twist from whoever was controlling the body, dense claws of hardened key formed around his hands and it made every blow by Black more devastating, and the sheer battle speed had already picked up by a lot. As they fought in near-perfect mirror of each other at high speed, they moved back and forth through whoever's momentum used them to wolf fang fist. Before long, the sky was filled with streaks of pink and blue, and with every collision, the Saiyans exchanged blows. But this was something Yamcha couldn't keep up forever. Feeling each exchange more and more, he would come to realize one crucial thing. Although Black's variant was stronger, it had been evident that Black was still new to the technique, leaving himself open right before they'd clash. With this knowledge, Yamcha would take charge, bursting forward one last time, bringing both hands together to form the wolf's bite finishing blow, but with a twist. As his hands make contact with Black and begin to blow him back from the force, he immediately charged up a god key fueled Kamehameha and fired it point blank through Black's stomach. Wounded, the fake had fallen back to the earth, sporting a giant hole, barely clinging on to life. Yamcha finally collapsed as well, with his arms covered in gashes and blood. He couldn't even maintain blue anymore, but he fatally injured Black. You're not even good enough to be my fake. Gohan! I'm done for today. Knock him out of the park so we can go home, would ya? Gohan would comply and order Trunks to get Yamcha one of the sensu beans. Then, making his way towards the shuddering and bleeding Black, Gohan prepares to save the future. He comments how fascinating this experience was and says that it's time to pay their debt. But strangely, Akai would teleport directly above Black and order the mortars to step back. As this was Akai, no one moved to interfere. Thinking he would finish him off, they are devastated when the deity who claimed himself as Masu went on to heal Black and further increase his power. And right about now, we'd have the full reveal of how Zamasu became Goku Black. Not much has really changed here. You still have a Zamasu who has sparred against Yamcha and probably seen him on God too, so he can still end up really respecting Saiyan power. Gohan then damns their situation, but tells Yamcha and Trunks they have to go in for one more round. 
Even though Yamcha is not a 100%, the two nod and power up, and Zamasu, who had just been revealed to be another Zamasu, sync up and launch forward. Obviously, Yamcha is their target, and he is forced to dive through them as Black and the Kai both make a horizontal slash at his chest and his waist. But the slick dodge is ruined, however, as Black's improved power allows him to react and catch Yamcha's ankle. He then slams him back and forces the Scarred Saiyan to shift his head just to barely dodge Zamasu's slash at his face. Then sinking their own attack, Gohan and Trunks attempt to overwhelm Black together, both powering to their strongest state, and the three clash in different colors. But Zamasu would intervene by attacking Trunks with his powerful telekinesis, stalling him long enough to allow Zamasu the time to attack and set up Gohan. Struggling against that unseen force, Trunks does his best to dodge as Zamasu slashes and slashes at the hybrid, and remember this was telekinesis powerful enough to stop Goku for a while. Meanwhile, Yamcha recovers, and though still extremely tired and surely not able to assume his blue form again, he squeezes out the last of his power and attempts to help Gohan as a mere Super Saiyan. Back in his skirmish, Trunks finally picks apart the pattern of attack and finally breaks Zamasu's telekinetic hold to execute the same flip that Gohan had and quickly runs through the hand movements for the burning attack technique. This one coming out much more powerful and kind of like his finished buster technique, being launched right at Zamasu as he charged at him and detonating the blazing hot technique right into his face on impact. Now down one opponent, the Hero of Time sinks a bit before attempting to launch out for the extra speed and allow the three heroes to gang up on Black and finally win this. But before he can, he feels a familiar sensation of telekinesis and soon a burning pain as the Keyblade shoots through his chest and just barely misses his lungs. His body have regenerated thanks to the second wish on the Super Dragon Balls, Zamasu would brag and Trunks looks on as Yamcha finally runs out of steam only to be slashed across the chest by Black and sent sprawling onto the ground breathing heavily as Gohan is forced onto the back foot by a Black Spirit Ball that finally lands and decimates the area around him, leaving it a burning hellscape and a Gohan who had just barely survived through flooding his defense with energy, but now he was running low on it. Greeting his teeth in pain, Trunks refuses to go down either and leans forward before ramming his skull as hard as he can into Zamasu's. This makes him lose his grip and slip back, and Trunks yells in pain as the Blade of Key leaves the wound. He stumbles, but rears a leg back and donkey kicks Zamasu before zooming over to his companions. With two sensus left, he reaches into his pocket and regrettably knows that he'll need a full sensu to deal with the wound he has now, while all three of them, especially Yamcha, are in desperate need of power. Chomping down on it and back to full, he rushes to Yamcha's aid to try and get him half of the sensu beam. However, he is nearly knocked out of the air by Black, if not for the interference of Gohan, attempting to block the blow for his friend. The two of them only make it easier for Black to send them both tumbling into a heap with Yamcha though, thanks to a powerful push kick that hits Gohan and takes out Trunks as well. Zamasu, also fully healed, returns to Black's side and snarls down at Trunks and the Saiyans. Still angry, he makes sure that the Saiyans know that they are below them. The two then agree that they have worn out their use and to share the deed they rise into the air to charge up their holy light grenade technique. Our heroes are forced to stare up at their doom. And that's when Trunks notices Mai and Yajirobe getting his attention by flashing light from a broken piece of glass. He understands that they're here to help and he uses the solar flare as quickly as possible. The area fills up with light and Black and Zamasu are caught off guard by it and it blinds them. When they regain their vision they are enraged to see their quarry gone and they unleash the blast they had charged to punch the earth. Not extremely far away, and with all their key dropped as far as possible, Trunks, in the best shape of all, splits the last sense between Gohan, who afterwards is in decent shape, and Yamcha, who afterwards is nowhere near. Always want to think things through, Gohan laments that this is going to work, and reluctantly says that they need help. Trunks agrees and decides that he can send both the other Saiyans back to the present, but Gohan is not having this. He is not leaving Trunks alone again. Taking the reins, he decides that Yamcha will go. He's sorry, but he's just no good in this situation. They need the cavalry, and they need a way to deal with that Zamasu guy. Barely able to talk still, Yamcha's saying pride erupts, but he can't put up any real showing of dismay right now. He really tries to argue with Gohan and tell him that he's the oldest. He should be responsible. He's not letting two men he's known since they were boys throw their lives away so he could be a coward again. And unfortunately for his ego, he was the only one to hear his complaints. Gohan and Trunks load the still injured Saiyan into the time machine and set it to depart. They order Yajirobe and Mai to get a head start on their getaway and accompany the time machine up into the air in case Black and Zamasu appear. With the sky clear of enemies, Yamcha is forced to tuck his tail between his legs and pray that his own failings don't get his friends killed while they're trapped in the future. Time and space are leapt through by Trunks' time machine as Yamcha like the hero from the future is unable to remain conscious for long due to his injuries. He's fading in and out over and over and replaying the fight against Black, specifically his screw up in it. He finally passes out fully and is only awoken by the rush of a sensu bean he'd been force fed before being pulled harshly out of a bed inside of Capsule Corp. 
The rude awakening came from Vegeta, who'd hoisted him up by his throat and pinned him to the wall. Almost everyone had squeezed their way into the small room by now. Goku and Krillin were attempted to hold back the prince, as he demanded answers as to why Yamcha was the only one to come back and in such a sorry state. Finally getting Vegeta off, Yamcha gathers his wits and breath and comes clean. He tells about Black Zenkai and the partnership with Zamasu, as well as how Black came to be. And he admits that he'd had Black right where he needed him to finish him off. If only he had a little more energy, but he had to depend on Gohan and Trunks just to make it back here. Having all theories now confirmed, Beerus and Whis decide to take the Supreme Kai, who'd recently returned from taking Goku and Whis to visit Grand Zeno. They would deal with President Zamasu, and this would of course work the same way the anime showed us just without Goku present. Yamcha after delivering his message feels very low, and he hangs his head in shame. He'd served as much of a purpose as he could it seemed, and inadvertently, the others began to strategize on what to do next without him. They were focusing on saving Trunks and Gohan right now, and not consoling their friend. Boma was of course the first to come up with the simplest yet strongest plan. Due to Krillin's intervention, they still had two time machines, one just in much worse shape than the other. They needed to get their heavy hitters back to the future ASAP, and a full tank would take 24 hours to synthesize. That 24 hours would pass here and in the future, something they really couldn't afford to do right now. Her reasoning is they can synthesize a one ways trip worth of fuel for the pure sands to get there, and then let Boma refuel and furbish the second time machine after they dealt with the threat. Even with the power boost that Yamcha had warned about, there was no way Black and Zamasu could contend with Goku, Vegeta, and Krillin at the same time. Plus, Gohan and Trunks were back up. This, however, would do nothing about Zamasu's immortality, but Tien and Piccolo, both present, instantly suggest the use of the Mafuba. In lieu of this, Krillin and Goku opt to go to Master Roshi's and study the technique until it was time to go. They had to really hurry for this one. It wasn't a terrible plan by any measure, and by this point, Vegeta, who had somehow become the de facto leader of the situation, was simply ready to do away with Black and Zamasu forever. Whether they had powered up or were still too weak to entertain him no longer affected his decision. He let Black slide instead of obliterating him in the first place, so all the blame couldn't be placed on a Yamcha. This is when he noticed the back of Set Man weaving out of the busy strategy meeting. A Set Three Eyes also took keen notice of this, and empathy caused Tien's face to grimace. Outside, Yamcha just wanted to escape to anywhere people didn't count on him. Of course, that was easier said than done now. His family had waited at Capus Court for his return, even more passionately after he'd been the only person to return, and injured at that. Kurizu and Puar were the first to make it to Yamcha, leaving her friend's side to hug him, as his wife Pizza, holding his son, also rushed to him, happy that he was alright. The first thought Yamcha had was that Gohan may not get to have a reunion like this because of him. Trunks may not ever, he couldn't hold them or face them at all. Yamcha could only apologize and run. He flies off. Kurizu dashes after him, but her uncle Tien placed a hand on her head and told her to stay with her mom and brother. He would go get her dad back. Placing a trust in him, Tien bolts off to track down his old rival. Vegeta watches the two fly away and he sighs. He'd been just about to ask Tien to accompany him to the room spirit in time for a last minute bit of training, but instead he decides to meditate close to Boma and the time machine. He was leaving as soon as he could, back up or not. And right now, they all need to focus on getting to the future. Who knew how much longer Trunks and Gohan could hold out? Trunks and Gohan, with the help of Future Mai and Yajirobe, successfully escaped Black and Zamasu after seeing Yamcha off. The hybrid Saiyans dropped their power and rode with them back to the other survivors, just before the two evil deities could catch up to them. The narrow escape and prior battles had left everyone drained, but Mai instantly leapt back into the role of commander, planning out possible escape routes from their current position. Yamcha Black is known to be a bit more proactive than the minutes we are used to in Goku Black. Trunks soon joins her, as did Gohan, and soon they had their own impromptu strategy meeting with the majority of Mai's men, Yajirobe and the Sands all present. Most of the civilian survivors slept through this though. Gohan as a student of Piccolo stated the hard truth instantly. He and Trunks alone would not be enough to hold off the enemy if they were caught while moving. Add on to that, there can only be so many places to move to. At some point, Black would do away with every structure they could use to hide in. Trunks grimaced at this. His fear was that his father and the others would come to a desolate future that he and Gohan had once again failed to defend. Or maybe, Black and Zamasu would move on to another timeline and another Earth. But then, Gohan spoke up and told everyone there was one thing they could try. Fusion. Everyone at first looks extremely confused as the scholar explains the concept, a technique Goku and Piccolo had studied in the other world. Gohan's father had thought it a fun way to bond with his son and friends, teaching a lot of them as a game mostly. But he assured there was incredible potential in this technique. From what he had studied of it, it wasn't simply the fusion of two warriors, but a magnification on top of that as well. He and Trunks could make one single fighter and take down the threat finally. Zamasu's healing wouldn't surprise them ever again, and Black could be destroyed if he's overpowered. From there, Zamasu would be simple to handle, even after the fusion. Hearing this, Trunks is instantly all in, especially since he gets to learn something from Gohan again. That sounds perfect, Gohan. Please teach me. As Gohan slowly went through the steps he'd seen Goten and the kids practice so many times, he also stressed all the alignment and synchronicity both parties must maintain, as well as the matching of power levels, which wouldn't be hard for them. 
Both are older and more experienced in key control than Kid Trunks and Goten were in canon, and through mastering the Super Saiyan 2 state, they've even demonstrated higher levels of key control than canon Goku had around that time. Hence the thinking of power being pretty simple. Like his father would be, Trunks is a bit embarrassed by the moves, but not unwilling to try them for the sake of everyone else. His only issue, he didn't think himself coordinated enough to do all that. Gohan does note that his friend could be quite stiff from time to time, and he did fluster pretty easily, but it gives him an idea. He knows how to help Trunks with not only his coordination for the fusion dance, but also his embarrassment about it. He demonstrates how to train Trunks by bringing the hand he wore his watch on and grinning as he transforms into the Great Saiyan Man, replacing his tattered and ruined gi before running through his poses and catchphrases. The room falls silent as the soldiers question if this is really what the fate of the world came down to. Hearing that and seeing Trunks grimace once again, Gohan spoke sternly. Trunks, I know it's all silly, but I think this is how we win. You and I both have to grow up and stop holding our hands out for our dads to pull us along. Sometimes, we'll just look lame and get it done ourselves. Contemplating his words for a moment, the hero from the future placed his faith in Gohan. Their plan was now set, and he and Gohan had to get to work on a lot of choreography. They only did so for so long into the night, just before getting ready to rest themselves, when urgently, a scout warned that Yamcha Black was sighted destroying buildings not far from them. They were on the move minutes afterwards. Nine hours left until the time machine is fueled. Back in the present, Yamcha sits alone in the desert, the act in and of itself conveying how he feels. Ken would have little trouble finding him, but would call to him from the sky. Why do you still sit on your behind? Are you that afraid? Shut up, Tien! Get out of here, would ya? I don't think I will. The former assassin lands and confronts his formerly human friend actually forcing his hand onto his head at one point, and like Goku had done to Krillin in the Namek Saga, getting the full scope of what his friend had seen and done in the future they'd originally been too weak to survive in. You and I have a long history, and we've shared a lot. We've even both seen each other at our worst. Remember the time I broke your leg? At Yamcha's sour reacting to Tien's pep talk so far, the three-eyed warrior elaborated on what he really meant to convey. He tells him there's nothing wrong with being afraid. Saiyans do feel fear. There was no way of becoming one would eliminate that. The only thing they can do is just face their fears and get stronger than those. Tien then focused Ki to his hand, reminding Yamcha that he was in fact also a genius of combat and key techniques. He replicated Yamcha Black's key claws near perfectly, before roaring out with determination. I was scared I couldn't get stronger unless I became a Saiyan, but that wasn't true. So I got stronger than the me that couldn't even have that fear. Even if we're scared, we fight and do our best, Yamcha. That's all you can do. Yamcha hadn't even realized he'd begun crying in front of his rival and quickly went about wiping his eyes to hide the emotions that Tien had already shared, processed, and accepted. Damn it all if that wasn't the exact kick in the ass he currently needed. He asked his friend if he would please show him how to do that key claw before the time was up, and Tien happily agreed to do so while reaching out to help Yamcha to his feet. They then rise into the air, and Tien warns his training would be much harder than what Roshi was probably putting Goku and Krillin through right now. Turtle wouldn't agree though. When Tien proposed training, Yamcha expected to use his dojo. He'd been surprised when he led him up to the lookout and into the room spirit in time, while leaving Dende with a specific time to allow to pass before they left. Even more surprising was that Vegeta hadn't claimed the room for himself, but in this timeline, Vegeta doesn't necessarily need to. Again, he and Goku in this timeline have already been incredibly further along than their canon counterparts were. Having more training partners around your level or on your heels would just do that to you. Tien then proceeded to pound the key clock technique into Yamcha, allowing him to spar with Tien whilst he mimicked Black. Initially, Yamcha had defaulted using his base form, but Tien showed him instantly that that was a mistake. Here, he virtually demonstrates the same lesson that we sadly had to teach the Saiyans in canon. Training in higher forms reduces the total possible progress one can make. Having been left with only his base form and all the power he gained from his days as a Saiyan, Tien has tried to train endlessly with full knowledge that he won't be able to transform anymore. Other than the Kyle Ken he learned in this timeline, what he has is what he has. Not to mention, the training partners he's had in this very room were also very impressive and have added a lot to his age and power level. By this point, it's arguable we'd see Tien look for and develop alternative ways of powering up away from the Kyle Ken. It did the job of a quick and dirty power up, but essentially it makes him a glass cannon, and he's fully aware of that. He needs something which won't be a drastic drain on his energy, and at first, I honestly believe he'd attempt to evolve the max power form slash the Super Saiyan Great 3 form of just bulking up for a boost, with the added reduction in speed. Not only that, I believe he'd really easily find a way to balance it, kinda how Great 2 did but doing so with only the key one has in base form, kinda like Cell showed us. And remember this, cause it will come up again, just a bit later. All I can say now is, even though Tien has a different perspective than his canon counterpart, no one has all the answers. That's why we have teachers. This is all just to say that Yamcha isn't just coming in here and molly whopping Tien cause he's still a Saiyan. But with this Saiyan blood heated up again, Yamcha gets really into sparring, 
and like Goten did against Trunks, he can help a burst into Super Saiyan. Tien's sharp eyes notice this instantly, and calling on not only his own experience with Yamcha, but also the habits and tells he noticed through reading his mind, he increases the difficulty of his Yamcha Black impersonation and surges his body with a bit of ki. This makes him gain a tiny bit of bulk and makes his ki claws flare up. He just barely dodges Yamcha's much faster jab towards his head, and the follow-up sky kick he tried to launch him into the air with, allowing Tien to easily shoulder check him with a burst of flight, knocking him off balance before he balled his fist up and the key around it before striking his guts. The increased power would likely protect him anyway. He then feels something wet on his cheek and notices a small cut, as Yamcha smirks and stands back up for more, a faint and weak version of the key claws now on his hands. Now they were both really excited. There are now six hours left before the time machines are refueled. After moving location successfully thanks to an early warning, Gohan and Trunks have decided to try the fusion dance for real for the first time. Though inevitably, for the sake of the gag, we have to see their failed fusion forms, eating up two more of their hours and causing the two of them to travel away from the survivors just in case. I think it'd be very easy for Trunks to get nostalgic by training on the edge of the city with Gohan, and maybe he could even tell Gohan about the last time we'd seen his future counterpart alive, or even just more stories of how he was in this timeline. Gohan, while touched by this, can see the failures and decrease in time limit begin to take a toll on Trunks. He's starting to rightfully get frustrated, but their training is interrupted as Mai arrives at two surviving children, explaining she'd come to get them before the survivors moved again, and that these two had literally begged her to tag along. The kids had obviously been big fans of Trunks, and she didn't have the heart to deny it for them. They'd actually been watching, and very much enjoyed copying and imitating the great Saiyan Man poses. And seeing this gets Trunks to actually smile and even laugh a little bit, and before long, Gohan and Trunks are riding alongside Mai and the children on a small capsule bike to keep their key hidden. Seeing the children and Trunks interact with them had made Gohan think for a while, until finally, he shared his thoughts with Trunks. You know, after Pan was born, I think I got a lot stronger. Not through training, just by meeting her. It's like, I never wanted anything bad to happen to her. And then I think of how Videl feels and how my mom used to worry for me. I don't want any parent to worry for their children. That's why I took a step forward. He then decides it'd be best to rest until they need to move again. If they overstressed, Trunks wouldn't be able to do the dance smoothly. Upon Trunks becoming worried about this, Gohan smiles and laughs like Goku, which strangely enough, and assures him that he's certain the next time they try it, Trunks will do the dance perfectly. There are now four hours left until the time machine is refueled. Goku and Krillin also continue to hammer away at learning the Mafuba, and Roshi at this point would like to reflect on the fact that all three of his students have become Saiyans. He then reminds his two students that while Yamcha has always been a bit slower on the uptake than the two of them, there was a reason the former greatest martial artist on Earth took the Desert Bandit on as a student. He bet them all the magazines in his trunk that Yamcha would meet them at the time machine and be ready to try again, and the two would never doubt their master or their friend. Yamcha and Tien had decided to spend a full 5 months and 29 days in the chamber, meaning inevitably Yamcha would quickly outclass his rival, even in base form, though Tien had actually surprised Yamcha by also displaying subtly some more of the concepts he'd been taught by Whis when training. Then again, the three-eyed man had trained so much with Vegeta, Krillin, and even Goku, it wasn't surprising that he'd been growing rapidly and picking things up by association. Meanwhile, he'd somewhat taken his attention off his friend as he'd returned to being human, even as Tien continued striving to push the boundaries of human power, and he was still doing it with the help of friends and teachers. The warrior had kept pushing, while he'd grown complacent. If Tien could still climb higher, even at a slow pace, why couldn't he? Finally, after Tien started to grow a beard, the two decided Yamcha's power and technique had been pushed far enough. Black wouldn't get lucky twice. There is now one hour remaining until the time machine is refueled. Back in the future, the survivors are all woken up by booms overhead. Zamasu and Black had launched an early morning attack as a duo, transporting into the area they planned on searching instead of Black flying there to switch up their strategy and catch the mortals off guard. Mai and her men leap into action and rush the survivors up and awake. They'd have to start moving quickly or they'd be on top of them. Gohan and Trunks decide they can lure the duo away and then attempt the fusion after a distraction. If they were successful and did it right off the bat, there's a chance the battle could get someone hurt with as much power as they could throw in a round. As the survivors clear the room, Gohan tells Trunks that this is it. No matter what happens, they make their stand here and now and stop this before their dads get here. They do this together. The brothers in arms nod, and in sync, power up to the Master Super Saiyan 2 state. With that done, Black and Zamasu would be on them like hounds and just a... The roof caved in as Black alone burst through it in his base form and attacked. Gohan realized the devil had guessed their plan in some form, and tells Trunks they have to catch up with everyone else before Zamasu gets there. But Black was on them tight, and it was tricky to just cover each other in fighting him. Outside, the fears of Gohan are confirmed, as Zamasu corners the survivors, 
hailing his own arrival since the filthy mortals can't think to do so themselves. He senses a key signature from a bit of rubble that's a pretty good sniping vantage point and prepares to fire a key blast in that direction. He's then surprised as two explosions rock him from below, he's taking his eyes off Ma and the civilians, one of which included Yajirobe, who could wield two rocket launchers easily. Zamasu is actually forced back and the survivors go fleeing as Mai and her men open fire and try and hold him off as best as possible, even Yajirobe doing what he can with those rocket launchers, but that wouldn't last very long. Thinking quickly, Gohan drew on attacks and techniques that he remembered never damaging him too badly, but always setting him up for Mr. Piccolo to hit him with something much more fierce. Trump's thought back to the overwhelming duo that was 17 and 18, synchronicity so deep no communication was ever needed, and the ability to cover and combo off any move the other made. He needed to emulate that right now. The Sons of Battle Geniuses display their own prowess as Gohan throws fainted jabs, easily intercepted by Black, who tries to break Gohan's hands, only for Gohan to manifest sharp eye beams that slam to the fake Yamcha's eyes, much quicker than he was prepared for, and once again forcing his eyes closed temporarily. Gohan then opened his mouth, firing off a mouth beam that forced Black's head to snap back, and sinking with Gohan as he never felt closer to him, Trunks quickly rushed under the other hybrid's guard and into Black's open chest with a shoulder tackle, followed by a flurry of blows until finally, I hope I do this right. Gallic gun! Inspired by Yamcha's earlier successful blow, the point blank beam of his father slammed home on Black, and hit with much more force than expected since he'd never seen it coming. It easily drives him through the walls of a few buildings as the two make their escape. They get outside just in time to simultaneously knock Zamasu away as he continued to catch machine gun fire, likely preparing to return the shooter's property once they ran out. They then ordered Mai and her men to leave as well as they attempted to go ahead and do the fusion dance, but a burst of energy singled Black's charge. Bursting into the rosé form, he was going to simply ram into Gohan and Trunks and split them in half, actually just as Gohan and Trunks had expected. In tandem, they went for a solar flare, only for Zamasu to appear in front of Black and hug his other self. Shielding both their eyes from the light, the two then spun and easily blasted the two Super Saiyans away. Remember, Black had only gotten stronger since Yamcha, Gohan, and Trunks pushed him to his limits again. Being in the Super Saiyan 2 state kept them from serious injury from the blast, but they were still knocked out of it. 30 minutes left until the time machine is refueled. Back in the present, the Z fighters were preparing to... No, Zamasu and Black were waiting no longer. It was time to complete their Zero Mortal plan and move on. Raising their hands once again to prepare the Holy Light Grenade, Gohan and Trunks are far too tired to get themselves out of this, but struggle against their exhausted bodies anyway. Suddenly, a rock conks against Black's scarred face. Looking to the culprit, it is one of the kids from earlier. The boy calls for Gohan and Trunks to not give up. They were the heroes they've been waiting for, and the heroes never lose. The soldiers attempt to wrangle the boy back, reprimanding him for putting everyone in danger. This wasn't some shonen manga, and Zamasu was about to burn that harsh reality into them by obliterating them all. But then the tired Gohan had forced himself to his feet and in front of the blast with only his arms to shield them. His helmet had long ago cracked and fallen off, and the green vest he wore over his suit had been torn to ribbons by now. <coughs> Trunks, remember! Inspired and possessed by the same insanity that drove Gohan forward, the swordsman without a weapon struggled back to his own feet. The two then posed and spoke boldly, confusing the executioners. They were unmitigated champions of justice, who tolerated no evil. The great Saiyan men were at that young man's service. Yes, they basically do a Super Sentai roll call. And again, Black and Zamasu are confused. Stopping for a moment, they notice the soldiers running away with the little boy cheering his head off. What are they doing, my dear counterpart? Hmm, I believe the hybrid Saiyans have evolved to express themselves through interpretive dance, as well as fighting. How interesting. Hearing this, Gohan gets an idea, but surely it can't be that simple. Then again, these guys were really full of himself. It's Trunks! They've learned our secret! Quick, we have to finish the final dance of sorrow before they strike again! Go on, mortal. We will allow you this final act. Call it mercy for showing yourself a bit more cultured than your father's. Trunks, though confused, caught on quickly to Gohan's terrible acting. The call of Fusion Ha accompanied the duo performing the dance perfectly for the first time. As it's pretty likely that they wouldn't immediately recognize the dance, Black and Zamasu realize something is wrong as an amazing power is born into the world. With Trunks and Gohan nowhere in sight, and someone brand new standing in front of them. Hmm, so, so this, this is our fusion. fusion. As for what, what to call us, let's just go with Gohan's to, to be quick. Zamasu and Black were completely flabbergasted, demanding to know how they fuse without Protari earrings. Well, Gohan simply lays a hand on his sword calmly. Almost like they were moving in slow motion, the fusion walked past them both and slashed only twice, splitting them both at the chest, but sadly not killing either. No, oh, that's right. You broke Trunks' sword, so I cut too shallow. Wait here. Zamasu held instantly and went about dealing with the damage on Black. When he looked back up, Gohan had already disappeared. Meanwhile, 
As Maya and the survivors continue to move further away, she recognizes Trunk's shattered sword lying in the street still, a grim reminder that her friend was currently fighting with everything he had left, meaning she had to do her part, so it was nothing they could worry about right. A man she'd never seen before, yet who carried a strong familiarity, appeared over the broken tool, making her and the others pause for a single moment. Blue Keek surrounded the sword and it levitates with all its shattered fragments before being perfectly welded back into place and dropping into the stranger's hands. He throws it up and smoothly catches it in the sheath on his back before smiling to Maya and the others and disappearing once again in a streak of light. Focusing back on their goal, Black and Zamasu are flying after the survivors, still very confused by Gohonks. The Black of this timeline, as inhibiting Yamcha's body, does share some mannerisms with the original Yamcha. When stressed, he gets a bit more antsy and cowardly than Goku Black would, and he details these fears to his other half, citing the fact that Zamasu was no match for this fusion, so they need to make sure that Batara is safe and that he isn't killed. Zamasu then noticed a glint and trusted his other half's words, tearing off his own left ear and shoving it into the gi of black before pushing him out of the way. A streak of white went past him, and behind him was a kneeling Gohonks sheathing his now reconstructed sword. The next thing Zamasu knew, he had been diced into cubes, and Gohonks' other hand was used to turn those into dust. Even his immortality couldn't stand up to total disintegration. Remember, by this point, he doesn't have the power the few Zamasu in the anime had. Needs to say, Black was angered that he had to be saved by his other half once again, though he's incredibly grateful that he heeded his warning, stowing away the earring and a piece of himself to regen from, but he now has to buy time for Zamasu to come back from that, enough to heal him and switch their earring to the other ear to fuse, all by himself. He could simultaneously feel fear and excitement and didn't know if it was his body or himself. Realizing he is plotting a scheme to stay alive against a mere mortal once again infuriated the false Yamcha even further. Not only that, but to be deceived by mortals they thought so low beneath themselves. He piled up to his max to unleash his fear onto the lying half sands. His confidence had cost him once, he would hold nothing back anymore. He was again thankful that he'd taken so much pain to grow stronger from. But when Gohonks felt even a slight bit of strain against his opponent, he instantly pauses and completely stands still, before erupting into the Super Saiyan God form and electing a flurry of slashes from Yamcha Black and is now massive and blazing key claws and throwing him back very far, channeling his power into his sword until it glowed brightly. Gohonks let loose a barrage of slashes that formed a literal volley of crescent-shaped keyblades in the air which went shooting towards Black, who went bolting up to avoid them to just buy a few more seconds, flying through and around destroyed abandoned buildings. Gohonks then noticed the direction Black had chosen was the same direction the survivors had ran away in, causing him to actually frown deeply. I won't, I won't allow you to harm, harm anyone else! As Black looked back at him, he noticed Gohonks gaining on him rapidly, and all of a sudden zigzagging closer to him, too fast to follow, until he appeared in front of him, allowing Black to notice a flicker of blue key mixed in with his red. The fusion struck out with a vicious roundhouse that nearly beheaded Black, but did completely scramble his brains. He then transitioned his momentum seamlessly into a dragon uppercut that hit nearly like his sword did, cutting him from chest to head once again. How could his power have increased so quickly from one attack to the next? Being more and more stressed in battle, Black's self-proclaimed genius body began to adapt as he struggled to live even an add a second longer against Gohonks. He'd actually adapted enough to notice the shifting Gohonks hair in full finally, from red and relaxed to blue and spiky in the instant of contact and back again. This fusion could somehow use Super Saiyan Blue, even though neither participant in it had shown that they could, but his growth, as impressive as it was, is all for naught. Black is killed by Gohonks in as efficient and quick a way as possible, only for enough of Zamasu to reform in the nick of time. He heals his body of the fatal damage instantly, and this means Gohonks' blast to finish him off is repelled by the Yamcha copy, as he is given another massive power boost, and now he can contend with the Fuse Warrior much better. But when getting back into the fight, he is somehow making less progress than before against the Stoic Fusion. The worst thing about this is the fact that Black senses no anger or malice from this being. With both Gohan and Trunks, their attacks were fueled by it, which made them predictable and stupid, but this man in front of them held no killing intent, and it made it extremely hard to react to him. In fact, he could feel more intent to protect his surroundings than anything else, as if he was so strong that truly going all out would just destroy everything. His mere existence was a danger to them, though he wasn't even hostile. It was simply a case of being strong enough to exist while Gohonks did. This fusion views Zamasu and Black as nothing more than a germ, basically. They just need to be wiped out. They aren't worth more thought and emotion than that. Because that's how this fusion would likely be. We've seen moments of ego from both Trunks and Gohan before, true, but they are pretty extremely rare. There is also a seriousness that both of them carry, so the confidence in themselves is expressed and not even viewing the villain as a threat. Finally, Gohan's and notice Zamasu still here, and tired of the games, the fusion begins to set up for a finishing blow by moving his arms at high speed to generate intense heat and finally pull back into his Super Burning! Kamehameha! Overwhelmed and humiliated once again, Yamcha Black finally thought of a dastardly way out of this and raised his hand to appropriate the solar flare just before Gohan's released his blast. The fusion smartly closed his eyes, yet still fired 
but Black had just barely dived out of the way, only losing a leg for his trouble and nearly striking out with a black spirit ball to the unsuspecting fusion. But all of a sudden, something broke through time and space. A time machine had appeared, and the glass cover on it shattered as Yamcha sprang from it like a carnivore possessed by famine, fully powered up to Super Saiyan Blue and with godly key claws flaring in power. Passing right by Goongs and bum-rushing Black, he skids to a halt on the other side of him, breaking the prepared key blast he'd made, and with Black's right arm in his grasp, and now in the body of his imposter, as Goongs recognized the new arrivals. The Zamasu in the stolen body seemed to finally know despair, as he fell forward, unable to stand. While ignored for a moment, as a weakling, Zamasu could do only one thing, he puts his earring on his right ear. Light erupted around the partners in genocide, as he and Black were magically pulled together. The voices of the Supreme Kais in Universe 7 and 10 screamed out in despair, and the two revealed that they'd moved all the survivors to the world of the Kais in this timeline. They tell Gohonks he can finally go all out, as Fuse and Masu makes his appearance, and Gohonk squares off with them one final time. Like Gohan has said, they weren't quitting just because their dads and the others had gotten there. And speaking of Goku and the others, they would be likely incredibly surprised to see and feel the power of Gohonks. Adult fusion seemed much more potent than that of when the kids tried it. But sadly, there were zero minutes left until the time machine is refueled, meaning Gohonks is split back into the heroes that made him up, both still fairly worn out. While Gohan and Trunks are having their planet work to buy time, they can't lie and say they weren't holding out hope to end this themselves. Gohan! Trunks! Good, Good job, job, son! I'm proud of you! Their fathers encouraged them as they walked past him with Krillin at their side. Seeing their backs this time didn't come with a sting of failure. It was hard to describe the joy one can feel when realizing the difference between depending on their parents and being supported and pushed forward by them. Now, of course, Zamasu starts monologuing. He'd recognize Yamcha's growth in a short time, but without fusion, they were hopeless, and they definitely weren't allowing them to get any Pitar of their own. In fact, a bolt of lightning tried to strike down the Kais, but Vegeta got them out of the way extremely quickly. He wouldn't fight Kakarot on who went first on this one, and as such, Goku is Zamasu's first opponent, and he would, even considering the circumstances, thank him for the first real challenge he's had in years. With so many Saiyans around, it's hard to keep the bad guys alive long enough for everyone to have a go. Let's give it our all! Goku from the jump went Super Saiyan Blue. And keep in mind, the person who would benefit the most from a timeline like this is unequivocally Goku. Stronger contemporaries means the level he's willing to sit at or be lazy at has to be risen. The changes of this timeline have continuously ramped up the power of both villains and heroes alike, and Goku has had more and stronger training partners and much more experience with the form of Super Saiyan Blue. So he engages Fuse Amasu and gives his rebuttal to Whis's question of the strongest amongst his students, not counting Beerus. It would be him if it was the last thing he did, and then he'd go on to rematch and defeat Lord Beerus as well. This timeline had made Goku hungrier. With a single blow, the Saiyan cells inside Zamasu are excited even further. Losing Gowonks as his target barely registered to the deity, as he had a much more entertaining mortal, one that didn't hide his emotions as well, and fired off at him with full power and Rex abandoned. And although Goku fought without a real plan of attack, other than attack, Krillin had ensured the Mafubo was ready when needed. He'd soften Zamasu up and help Krillin seal him off to finish this up cleanly. Vegeta and the others watched the fight closely. As soon as Goku showed an inch of give, they'd pounce and barge into his battle. They all wanted to end this here, and the normal rules of one-on-one -on -one weren't too appealing, even with Saiyan sensibilities in mind. The first to do so most likely would be Vegeta, who like Goku would have benefited a lot from the change in this timeline. What he showed off against Black in the present was nothing compared to his full power, so Zamasu's power is contended with fairly well, though the Saiyans would definitely tie before the Fuse Fighter will. There would also probably be some Sensu Beans in the mix here as well, in case of any serious injuries on the hero's side, and they'd probably get used up pretty quickly as Zamasu tests more and more of his overwhelming strength. This is likely the flow the fight would follow for a while until eventually we see our four pure Saiyans fighting together for the first time out of necessity, with Gohan and Trunks still very heavily drained and not able to fuse for the next 30 minutes. I also feel like in this situation they'd refuse any Sensu Beams, though it's definitely possible that Trunks discovers his Kai ability to heal and gets Gohan back in the fight when he can, but I don't think that's necessarily needed at the moment, or that they'd really have a chance to take their eyes off the fight to learn so. And as for the Sensu Beams, save them for the heavy hitters. Now granted, the Kais could very easily offer the two or any of the other Saiyans their Pratar for a pretty easy power up, but I think Zamasu would keep a keen watch on them to prevent this exact situation. Another facet of the fight keeping the Saiyans contending against their superior foe is that he has to be aware of the entire battle Field, and the Saiyans aren't giving him much time to just obliterate the Kais like he wants to. But finally, Zamasu's power outlasts our hero's maximum, and as time passes, the two Zamasus begin to fuse on a much deeper level than initially. This is when, like in the manga, upon fighting back Zamasu, Gohan and Trunks flying under the radar work together to land a devastating sneak attack. Trunks impales his sword into the evil deity from behind, while Gohan helps him split the villain in half with his bare hands in a burst of rage. 
but the two halves of Zamasu refuse to break in two completely, and they stagger as their fused body becomes incredibly unstable. Goku and Krillin seize their chance and pop open the gort they plan to trap Zamasu in using their master's technique. With Krillin along for the ride, there's no way Goku forgets the container or Master Roshi the seal. So aiding each other, the duo is able to pull the technique off near flawlessly, but for one single hitch. Zamasu again stubbornly clung to life. A peculiar transformation takes place, as the two halves of Zamasu are forever morphed and changed. Yu Zamasu is going nowhere. In fact, he's only increasing in numbers. Though the Batara would no longer provide a massive power boost, the damage was done, and a new and wholly more powerful and dangerous foe had risen from the ashes once again. Separated, one of the Zamasus is able to escape the ceiling whirlwind and regroup as the tired Saiyans attempt to do the same. They are now out of Sensu Beams, and it had become far too dangerous to bring the Kai's close for anything, and they'd soon find that any fatal attacks only led to more Zamasus being formed from the division. The one sealed originally had been easily freed at first chance, and things began to look even worse. The Mafuba could work, but that did not only catch all of them, but make sure they couldn't fight out of it. Krillin had attempted to do just that by switching roles with Goku to attempt a God Scatter Kamehameha, but again, a failure which led to even more Zamasu's being produced. So by this point, the huge lead and power the Saiyans had endured for so long in this timeline had been the only thing keeping them alive, and that gap had been all but closed. The issue is that Zamasu has also benefited from that strength they've gained, and in this state, he's only multiplying and getting stronger. Once again weighed down by fear, something clicks for Yamcha. He's making the stand this time. He asks the Kais to get Gohan and Trunks back to the present with them. The Saiyans are holding off Zamasu here. That's the best each of them can do. All they can do. Tell Beerus and Whis to close off this timeline and get rid of future Zamasu for us. It seems like he won't leave this job unfinished so long as we're alive. We can keep him here. Though shocked to receive orders from Yamcha of all people, obviously the Kais had little room to argue right now. They were both in grave danger and held responsibility for two lives each. Not to mention, as of right now, they are more of a burden than anything. So this was their real only option. But the two weren't leaving the heroes with nothing. They removed their own batar and throw them to the Saiyans, telling them to fight fire with fire finally. Only for the pack of Zamasus to smartly pounce on the jewelry and snipe them to pieces with the salvo attacks from the entire group causing everyone to flee as Yamcha complains and the Kais get away with Gohan and Trunks. I think that was our last hope. Quit your whining. You're the one asking for Beerus' help. Now, wait a minute, Vegeta. We still got to survive this. Let's see how many each of us can take down. Woohoo! <laughs> well, obviously, I'm in the lead. You Saiyans from Earth always surprise me with your stupidity. Obviously, I'll defeat the most. Alone and surrounded, the Saiyans lose a battle cry and engage the army of overwhelmingly powerful foes. I should mention, however, that Goku does have his Zeno button at this point. So based off of canon, the fight could really logically end here with a Zeno summon. But like Trunks not discovering his Kai ability, Goku is much too focused to go looking for a Sensu he knows isn't there. Different timelines, baby. They allow for escapes from literal Deus Ex Machina. But that doesn't mean this is going to be easy, though. In the present, the Kai's arrive with Gohan and Trunks still in very poor shape, but alive. Gawasu decides he's going to bring the survivors from the world of the Kai's and Trunks' timeline to Capsule Corp in the present timeline, and he could likely do so fairly simply. Mai is relieved to reunite with Trunks, but he and Gohan are nearly at the end of their rope now, and like Yamcha had told the Kai's to, they ask Beerus and Whis for their help. The God and Angel is surprised by the differences and similarities between fathers and sons. Before they can answer though, Tien declares that the mortals were not out of this yet. This causes Beerus to stare him down coldly, only for the three-eyed warrior to gaze back determined. Finally, Beerus scoffs and sits back down, ordering them to do as they like. Now taking the reins, Tien declares that Piccolo and he could still handle this, but they do need some help. Tien wanted everyone to share their energy with him. Everyone. So in an emergency, our heroes pull together to carry out the former assassin's strategy. Tien is even able to get energy from some of his more elite students. Even Gohan gets an idea and rushes home, returning holding much more energy than he'd left with. Trunks actually recognizes the power, and is surprised, but Gohan confirms that he was able to convince Pan to give him her energy. She was young, so it was very sloppy, and a lot had been lost in the transfer. But even so, the girl seemed to understand the words, help grandpa. All the available key the Z-Warriors and their friends and family can muster is pumped into Tien, who begins struggling to contain it all. With the energy bestowed, Gohan, Trunks, Tien, and Piccolo holding a rice cooker, use Shin and Gowasu's time rings with the Kais and disappear from the present. Currently in the future, Goku and the Saiyans are on their absolute last legs, reduced to their base forms and unable to move much more. Zamasu and his army of himself had taken the smallest bit of satisfaction savoring the last strokes of their victory, and were just preparing to snuff out their last bits of resistance as well, when the unaccountable happened in front of them. Tien and the others appeared, the former Saiyan blazing with power of those that had supported him thus far, whilst his eyes had blanked except for the third one, 
He had to focus his sight and quickly, Gohan and Trunks went even further, squeezing all the key they could into Tien, even fostering in and out of Super Saiyan for a bit, as they call for the four Saiyans to get down and move. A call of divine Neoki Koho came from Tien, as every member of Zamasu's army was hit with a powerful key blast, even though they aren't all grouped together. Tien's main beam had splintered to pierce and blow apart each Zamasu, causing them all to lose form for the briefest of moments, and returning to the gooey form right before multiplying. The last step though fell to Piccolo, due to Tien blowing all the power he was given in just one shot for their opening. Meki and Arm stretched out and pulled the Globus of Zamasu into a big mass that had struggled to choose a stable state. Piccolo then snapped his arms back and began the Mafubo on his single target. The green blob struggled and actually stabilized before returning to his fused Zamasu state, increasing his power a massive amount due to the tough battle and recombining. This allowed Zamasu to struggle against Piccolo as he got closer and closer to the rice cooker. But the force of Piccolo's Mafuba increased, as Krillin and Goku did what they could to magnify it, using the technique with him to keep Zamasu held down. He was dragged closer and closer by what felt like inches, and just a second longer and he'd outlast them. But that damn dog Yamcha and the former Prince of Sands refused to be spectators and jumped above them to deliver critical blows. Big Bang, attack! Super Spirit Ball! The attacks carried little force to actually do any real damage on Zamasu, but knocking his body close to the rice cooker was a different story. Overwhelmed by the cooperation of the mortals he looked down on for so long, Zamasu is finally sealed with the evil containment wave. Once and for all, a cheer of a well-earned victory erupts around the still desolate and lifeless cityscape. Trunks collapses to his knees, and he laughs while crying tears of joy, as everyone celebrates tiredly. There was hope again. But that plus Ultra Fam is where we'll be leaving the timeline off for right now. Nah, I'm actually lying. The Kai's are so shaken up and tired from all the suspense and the constant back and forth in the battle that they are unable to use the time rings to go back just yet. It would actually be the refueled time machine from Cell's timeline that brings half the warriors back as Shin and Gawasu escort the survivors back to their time. Later, Tien reveals the technique he'd use actually took a significant chunk of his lifespan away, maybe a good 11 or so years. Not very good considering all the time he put into the room spirit room time as of lately. As such, Launch, Buri, and Chiaotzu forbid him from using the technique ever again. Trunks decides he's going to go and find the new planet Namek in his timeline after borrowing the plans for the old Capsule Corps spaceship from his mom. He needs to keep getting stronger and he also needs allies. If Gohan and the others from the future time like a return from the other world after possibly training, it could do some real good. Plus, if they could revive the future Supreme Kai and Beerus, that'd be even better. It could take some time, it could even be dangerous. Shockingly, President Trunks asked a very strange question, could I come with you? It got the kids buzzing and a debate was started amongst the adults and their children. The idea of going into space and doing all the cool stuff nearly everyone else they'd grown up around had done, and alongside the cool older brother version of Trunks, it sounds like a pretty sweet deal to all of them. Gohan was also fairly intrigued, but once he heard how Chi Chi reacted to the idea, he kept that to himself. After a few days of rest, Supreme Kai accompanies Goku to Grand Zeno's palace again. There, Goku gives the rice cooker containing Zamasu to Zeno and the Grand Priest while explaining a bit of what happened, but what Zeno heard was, this guy got in Goku's way while he was looking for that fun person he mentioned. Goku apologized for disappointing him, but he thought of some way that might cheer the god up. Hey, do you remember that tournament we talked about? We resume on Beerus' planet as Supreme Kai and Goku return from their visit with Lord Zeno. Having expected them, Whis and Beerus are there to greet the duo, though when they lay eyes on the Kai and Saiyan, they are shocked to see the disparity in their expressions. While Goku's eyes are alight with excitement and a broad grin is plastered across his face, Shin looks like a man being led to the gallows, and as Whis tentatively asks what happened, the pair answer in unison, saying something great and terrible has happened respectively. Still in tandem, Goku and Shin then explain that the Omni King has greenlit Goku's idea for a multiversal tournament, though here, Shin continues alone, adding that unlike other tournaments, the price of defeat is universal or razor. Beerus and Whis are both flabbergasted by this news, though to their surprise, so is Goku, who gasped that he didn't hear that part of the deal, admitting that he kinda spaced out after Zeni said he could fight the strongest guys from other universes. At this, all eyes fall on the sand, with an apoplectic Beerus informing him that the only reason he is not being destroyed right now is because his strength will be needed in the tournament. While Shin hurries to catch Goku up on the rest of the rules, correctly surmising that he missed those too. When he is done, Beerus has thankfully had a bit of time to calm down, though he still gives Goku a piercing glare, as he informs the world that since he got them into this mess, it'll be up to him to recruit other fighters, with Goku gulping that he's on it, placing two fingers on his forehead and zipping back to Earth as fast as he can. Running through options in his head, Goku quickly determined that Vegeta, Krillin, Yamcha, and Gohan are four of the strongest defenders Earth has, making them essential candidates. As for the remaining five, that's where things get a little harder, but maybe his first four picks will have ideas of their own, so he can just ask them. 
A short while later, the five fighters stand assembled on the grounds of Capsule Corp, with Goku having filled them in on the situation. Naturally, no one is happy with this turn of events, though for the sake of the universe, everyone puts their focus into coming up with additional candidates so they can get to work on preparing for the tournament power. Speaking up first, Yamcha suggests Tien, reminding that the X Saiyan is still as strong as ever, with Vegeta backing up this guard man and agreeing that the Triclops should be among their number. Speaking of numbers, Krillin proposes that 17 and 18 also join them, reminding the other Saiyans of their power and unique abilities, something which may be vital with so many of their forces being Saiyans. While Gohan adds that for the final two slots, he believes Piccolo and Future Trunks would be the wisest candidates. Having no objections to any of these choices, the group then split up with Vegeta going to fetch Trunks, Krillin flying off in the direction of his home to invite his wife and brother-in-law, Yamcha heading for Tien's place, and Gohan departing to inform Piccolo. This leaves Goku without a job, and so he decides to head home as well, since it's about lunchtime and he's sure Chi-Chi's made something delicious. Fortunately, he is right, and as he digs into his mountain of food, Goku begins explaining to his wife the predicament they're in. Less fortunately, Chi-Chi is not the only one listening. As from his room, Goten hears his dad spilling the beans, and feeling this is something the others should know, he sends a quick summary in the Hybrid Kids group chat. Understandably, the threat of Universal Erasure comes as a shock to the half Saiyans, though being the savviest among them, Kurizu points out that this could be the opportunity they've been waiting for. From her experience, their dads will need sparring partners to prepare for such a big tourney, so if they play their cards right, they can make a deal to help them train in exchange for being allowed to go on the mission in Nam Future Trunks was talking about. Calling the ginger girl a genius, the hybrids then confront their respective fathers, accusing them of trying to hide the tournament from them, and using the leverage this creates to propose their desired bargains. To their surprise, the kids do not have to push hard for this, as the Saiyan and next Saiyan fathers all agree that having their hybrid progeny to train against would maximize their chances of growing strong enough to win the tournament, and so agree, provided they all survive, thus lighting an even hotter fire under the kids. As a result, the next few days are spent in grueling training with Buri and Kurizu doing tag team sparring against their dads, while Goten and Marin work alongside Goku, Gohan, Krillin, 17, 18, and Piccolo. Even Kid Trunks fervently gets in on the action, training with Vegeta and his future self who had fortuitously decided to stay in the present a little while longer with Mai, so that he could train with powerful partners now that his timeline was safe enough for such a risk. The night before they are set to depart, a small strategic gathering is held, much less festively than most gatherings in Kapsa Corp. And in this time, Master Roshi, after being consulted by his students, once again makes a decision, hereby passing over the title of Turtle Hermit to Krillin, and announcing his intentions to end his solitude and go adventuring once again. Having bestowed all he has to teach, and trusting that his students will carry on and evolve the turtle way even if his initial response to some of their shortcuts to power wasn't all too welcoming. He can now plainly say he's grateful they fought to make sure his retirement was peaceful. And so, he departs. And as he goes, just as he hoped, his Saiyan student's rivalry is relit for a moment. As the trio end up deciding to sneak off to make sure Krillin has earned the title. Thus, it is that Dende and Popo end up accommodating a last-minute hardcore training session in the time chamber, and subsequently end up repairing and replacing Gi's with new colors and symbols to reflect everyone's journeys. Eventually, however, the day of fate arrives, and so ten fighters of Universe 7 depart for the world of Void, as their loved ones wish them luck and pray for victory more than they have prayed for anything in their entire lives. Arriving at the arena, the Z fighters survey their rivals curiously, recognizing half of the Universe 6 team from the tournament with Champa, though they are not the only ones there as 80 fighters of all shapes and sizes now stand at attention, as the Grand Priest declares that now that they are all here, the Tournament of Power can officially begin. Due to there being no future Zeno, there is no need for an exhibition match, meaning the main event kicks off immediately, and in the most fitting manner, the first fight of the tournament is between Yamcha and the Kicking Fiend Basil, along with his brothers Bergamo and Lavender. Unluckily for the trio de Donjur, even together they are no match for the Scarred Saiyan, with him not even needing to use a godly form in order to dispatch the dogs, and yet doing so anyway, as his desire to set the tone the coolest way possible was still ingrained in him, no matter how much he matured as a man and a warrior. And so, even as Bergamo gigantifies and his brothers kick and sling poison at him, Yamcha sends them flying with a godly wolf fang fist. Meanwhile, the other Saiyans have also predictably haired off in search of their own fights, leaving Gohan, Trunks, Piccolo, Tien, and the Andros to stand their ground in the starting area. Normally, this would be alright, with strength and numbers working in their favor. Though thanks to word getting around that the 7th is to blame for the potential destruction of all their universes, the other teams have all seemingly decided to eliminate them first as punishment. Recognizing this, Gohan his team captain urges them all to scatter, with the rest of his teammates splitting up, though not before they all share a promise to back each other up if things get dicey. To this end, Gohan, Piccolo, and Trunks all head off in roughly the same direction, with it being fortunate that they do, as soon they find themselves ambushed by a pair of Universe 6 fighters who are not in the last tournament, Sao Nel and Polina, the Namekian warriors. Using their skillful teamwork, the two Super Namekians box Gohan and Piccolo in, though when Trunks attempts to save them, he is confronted by a duo of his own, Botomo riding atop Megeta. Knowing this latter pair, 
player's weakness. Gohan tells his fellow half Saiyan to insult the Metal Man, though when Trunks tries, he finds that Botamo has blocked Mageddon's ears, making him impervious to his fatal flaw, and allowing him to charge at full steam towards the purple haired man. Thankfully, being a quick witted young man, Trunks is able to come up with a backup, firing a Masenko at the ground right in front of Mageddon, which at his current speeds the Metal Man cannot dodge, resulting in him tripping on the newly created pothole and accidentally bucking his rider, sending him soaring over the edge and out of bounds. However, the gelatinous bear is not alone long. As channeling his father, Trunks mocks that Mageddon really is a screw up for eliminating his own teammate, and the Metal Man bursts into tears and runs off the edge as well, allowing Trunks to even the odds. Meanwhile, the newly mentored Master Krillin is making eliminations of his own left, right, and center, having been targeted by the Tricky Fighters Universe 4. Unfortunately for them, no one on Team Universe 7 is better equipped to handle them than the former sneaky charlotte of the Orem Temple, with him using all his wiles to wipe them out in the truest homage to the Turtle Hermit way he could imagine, resulting in them being the first universe eliminated completely from the tournament. However, this comes at a heavy cost to Krillin's stamina, with him soon finding himself rather drained. And though his Saiyan instincts urge him to press on and adapt, his human pragmatism wins out, with him retreating to join his allies, as he knows that all he'll accomplish by rushing in alone is to get himself eliminated. In contrast, Vegeta has very much dedicated himself to the pursuit of individual glory, having picked off all but one member of Team Universe 10, that being Obni. However, for reasons unknown, Vegeta cannot seem to land a single blow on the veiny green fighter, with all his attacks missing by wide margins, which allows Omni to in turn pummel him. Thankfully, help comes in the form of Tien, who recognizing his rival's plight tells him to stop aiming for the prismatic afterimages and focus on the main body. Testily, Vegeta asks what exactly the Triclops means, as he can't see any afterimages. Though oddly enough, it is Omni who answers, complimenting Tien's sight, as he's never met an opponent who can see his shades. He then respectfully confirms that the Earthling is correct, saying that his key control is so cute he can throw off the other fighter's perception of where he is. And seeing this for the danger it really is, Tien instructs Vegeta to let him handle this fight. Though it galls him, Vegeta respects Tien enough as a warrior and a rival to grant him this request, stepping back and allowing the human to take his place in front of Avni. The pair of martial artists then engage in a flurry of blows, and as they do and it's made clear that they are seemingly equals, something funny happens. Tien's sight becomes clearer and clearer, as now not only can he see Avni's shades, but he can distinctly see the other fighters around him as well with his field of vision growing until he can see the entire arena, as though his vision is no longer restricted to himself, but instead, like he's become the eye of a god, granting him total spatial awareness much deeper than any key sense could grant. As this happens, so does a physical change occur, with Vegeta and Avni both noticing that Tien's pupils have faded away, being replaced by a white light that shines from his third eye. In this new god's eye state, Tien is not only able to see everything around him, but also draw in the latent godly key that resides in it, growing stronger as he fights until eventually he is able to easily overpower Avni and knock him out of bounds by copying and perfecting his shade technique with a multi-form finishing off the 10th with a volleyball fist. A little shocked by an evolution this late in the game, Vegeta excitedly asks what this transformation is, with Tien a bit in awe himself, pondering if it could be true enlightenment born of his third eye, a power he once thought himself locked away from, but what else could it be as he can see and sense all now? He then turns to Vegeta, though at this point, the gesture is more symbolic than necessary, informing the Saiyan that he also sees something in him, the same destructive power as Lord Beerus and the other gods, and one other among their opponents. Though unfortunately, it is still too underdeveloped to be of any use in this tournament. Then, without another word, he departs, heading in the direction of his next challenge and eager to continue testing this strange power he's reclaimed. Back with Gohan, Trunks, and Piccolo, they have now all gone back to back fighting off Salnel and Palena, though now that the trio are together, they think they might just be able to turn the tide. Briefly confirmed, the three tactical warriors quickly come up with a strategy, then on Piccolo's command, begin their new combo move, which they dub the Lineage of the Demon School Rush, starting off the combo as Piccolo. As with a roar, he launches an explosive demon wave at the other two Namekians, stunning them and leaving the door open for Gohan to rush in and knock them both high into the air, where they are in perfect position for Trunks to finish them off with a burning attack, blasting them both out of the ring. Touching down, the trio then all congratulate each other on pulling off the move flawlessly, though now is hardly the time to rest on their laurels, as there are still many more threats yet to come. Never once to be outdone, the Turtle School trio of Goku, Yamcha, and Krillin are currently engaged in a team attack of their own against the monster Prom, hailing from Universe 2. Previously, Goku had been fighting him alone, but to his surprise, his ability to deflect Ki had proven quite a hurdle for the impatient Saiyan. Thankfully, when Yamcha and Krillin add their Kamehameha's to Goku, the resultant beam sends the brutish behemoth bursting backwards, his bulky body battering several other combatants off the edge with him. The force of this attack is even enough to draw the attention of the otherwise uncaring Jiren, with him rising from his meditation to see who unleashed such power. With a hint of cocky swagger, Yamcha steps out from the trio, laughing that it was all him naturally. Though missing the joke entirely, Jiren instead deems Yamcha the largest threat, and so fires a punch at the Scarface Saiyan, with the air pressure alone being enough to send the trio flying off in different directions. 
With the no flying rule in place, Yamcha lands hard, coming to a stop at the feet of Hit, who bluntly tells him that it looks like he's gotten himself into a real mess this time. Gulping with a vivid memory of this man's performance in the term of destroyers, he says that Hit wouldn't kick a man when he's down, would he? But with a dangerous smile, the assassin replies that on the contrary, the former Desert Bandit is about to be very useful to him, since while Jiren is focused on Yamcha, he's gonna take the gray out, and from there bound the term of destroyers, he knows how good the man should be at this task. A few moments later, the unlikely duo of Yamcha and Hit spring into action with Yamcha playing the fool as a means to draw Jiren's attention, while Hit begins time skipping his way around the ring, stealthily building up stored time as he sneaks up behind Jiren. Then, when he's in a position, he springs his trap, the time prison. Suddenly, Jiren finds himself caught in an orb of frozen time. As with a yell, Hit orders Yamcha to help him out. Deftly, the bandit leaps to his ally's side. Then as one, they begin pushing their quarry towards the edge of the ring. Naturally, Jiren fights back, and with his overwhelming power, Yamcha is quickly forced into his highest form, that being Super Saiyan Blue. However, even this isn't enough, with it looking like Jiren is going to break free and take them both out. Snarling like the wolf for whom he had named his signature attack, Yamcha marshals all his strength for one last godly wolf fang fist, and as he does, he feels a new wellspring of power burst within him. A moment of his own evolution, as he breaks his limits and taps into the power of that black saw in him that caused the falling Kai to steal his body. Literally, as unbeknownst to any of the Omni King's attendants, the rice cooker holding Zamasu rattles a bit, as some of his key escapes, being absorbed back into his originator. As a result, when Yamcha flares his ore, it is not the same aqua as his hair, but instead, the malefic purple of Super Saiyan Rose, so that when he forms the wolf's bite of the attack, it is with the power of a transformation Yamcha dubbed Super Saiyan Blase. From his prison, Jiren's eyes widen as he sees this, recognizing that while the Saiyan may not be able to kill him with that attack, he is obviously strong enough to knock him from the ring. Being unaccustomed to such vulnerability, Jiren examines his options, quickly finding there is only one which will allow him to survive the attack, and that is to take out Hit as the weaker fighter and free himself from this time prison before Yamcha's wolf fang fist hits. Springing into action, the gray fires off a blast, and as luck would have it, this manages to blow the purple alien out of bounds, allowing Jiren to nearly catch Yamcha's fist and save himself. Meanwhile, Yamcha is devastated, dropping to his knees and panting. He put everything into that hit, and it missed. Bending down, Jiren lays a hand on the Saiyan's shoulder, almost in a comforting manner. As in his rumbling baritone, he informs Yamcha that he has won his respect as a fighter, and so even when the seventh is gone, Yamcha shall live on his memories. He then gently shoves the scar-faced bandit forward, and as he tumbles into the void below the ring, he puts his faith in his friends to finish what he started. Speaking of eliminations, Piccolo has also just been knocked off the battlefield by a fused fighter made up of the last remnants of Team Universe 3, going by the name of Aniraza. Now, the amalgamated android's eyes are set squarely on Gohan and Trunks, though fortunately, they will not have to face this monster on their own, as with matching grins, androids 17 and 18 leap into view, asking if the boys will like a hand. For a very, very fleeting moment, Trunks' instincts scream at him to refuse, as the idea of himself and a version of Gohan fighting alongside their tormentors from his timeline is too surreal to accept. However, as he takes a breath, the lavender-haired hybrid reminds himself that these androids are not his androids any more than this Gohan is his Gohan. All three of those fighters are dead, he shall be too unless his team wins this tournament. Taking a fighting stance, Trunks prepares to rush in. Though laying a hand on his shoulder, Gohan asks Trunks if he wants to form Gohonks to combat this fellow Fuse fighter. But with a shake of his head, Trunks replies that he can't keep relying on Fusion like they did in the fight with Black, and the reason he stayed in the past was to get strong enough to protect his timeline on his own. So even if his friend doesn't understand, he needs to fight Aniraza as he is. On the contrary, Gohan replies that he completely understands, backing Trunks up and readying himself to fight as well. Together, the four Universe 7 fighters prove themselves a capable strike force, driving Aniraza into a defensive position thanks to the two hybrids entering the false Super Saiyan Blue state they attained as Gohonks. However, even with this boost, they are not able to eliminate the Amalgam, who ferociously manages to cling on no matter what they throw at him. Seeing that this is just the kind of dire situation he wanted to prepare himself for, Trunks tells his compatriots to fall back, as he knows what he has to do. And though the others are hesitant to leave him, the lavender-haired man flashes a confident smirk worthy of his father as he tells them to trust him. After all, taking out androids is his specialty. Then, when his allies are out of the way and Aniraza bears down on him, he launches a heat dome attack, finally attaining a true blue form as he pours everything he has into the attack. Against such might, Aniraza and subsequently Universe 3 are eliminated, though this comes at a cost, as the force of Trunks' attack also destroys the ring beneath the young man, sending him tumbling into the void right after his opponent. Meanwhile, in another part of the ring, another fusion is engaged in battle, that being Kefla. As after hearing about the so-called fake Saiyans from Vados, she is eager to try her hands at fighting one, cornering Tien as he seeks out his next opponent. The loudmouthed amalgam begins to taunt the man, jeering that of course she ran into him 
since not only is he a faker like his two friends, but he couldn't even stick with it, wimping out and going back to being a weak Earthling. However, before the Triclops can give any type of response, another voice speaks for him, that of Vegeta, as he delivers a painful looking dropkick to the back of Kefla's head, declaring that Ten Shinhan is just as much of a Saiyan as he is, and far more of one than her. He then tells his rival to keep going, declaring that this makes them even for Omni, and with a nod, Tien departs, leaving Vegeta and Kefla alone. Standing back up, Kefla watches in awe as the Universe 7 Saiyan transforms into a Super Saiyan Blue, gushing that he's got to teach her how to do that. Though with a scowl, Vegeta scornfully replies that she's not worthy of the form, unlike young Kappa. Scowling now too, Kefla asks why the hell not, to which the prince responds that she's brash, loud mouth, and such an arrogant fool that she thinks she can look down on others because of their species. In short, she's just like he used to be, and for that, she disgusts him. He then begins blatantly charging up a Super Galley gun, and though Kefla attempts to rebut this point and attack, it honestly means less than nothing to a Vegeta who's long since gotten over himself, and had also been pushing himself to not only be the strongest Saiyan, but best version of himself he could be. So as he blows her away, it eliminates Team Universe 6. By now, there are only two universes left, the 7th and the 11th. With the 7th having a clear advantage with 7 fighters to the 11th's 30. Unfortunately, as our heroes soon learn, things can quickly change as with his superhuman speed, Dispo is able to eliminate Android 18, while Topo's might prove superior to Gohan's as he goes down too. Thankfully, 17 is able to eliminate Dispo before he can do any further damage by trapping the rabbit in one of his barriers and using his speed against him as he repeatedly collides with the orbit's interior. Though even this comes at the cost of a double elimination, as 17 has to ride the barrier off the edge to ensure Dispo cannot escape, and so it is that when the end game begins, it is 4 against 2 for the fate of the reality. First up to fight for the 11th is Topo, and sensing this bulky alien's power, Goku requests the opportunity to take first crack, with his teammates accepting, knowing all too well the burning passion of a Saiyan warrior's pride. And Goku is easily able to back this up, forcing Topo into his candidate form very quickly, and thus drawing his own blue form out. But wanting to claim the ultimate victory, Goku decides to rely on his own finishing move, the Spirit Bomb, to take both Topo and Jiren out at once. However, as he would soon learn, destruction is not a force of evil, but rather of nature, making it neutral and entirely immune to the spirit bomb's effects. And to make matters worse, when the bomb fails to go off, Jiren begrudgingly helps Topo in catching Luo the key and hurling it right back at this originator with twice the speed. Crying out his best friend's name, Krillin rushes in without thinking to save him, though in his drained state, all he can do is shove him out of the way, taking the hidden Goku's place and vanishing, seemingly winding up dead. Up in the stands, the Omni King and Grand Priest debate whether they should count as the breach of the no-killing rule, and if so, whether it should be Topo or Goku is erased. As this callous debate is held, 18 has to be held back by Beerus from doing anything stupid. But before a verdict can be reached, a new power spikes in the center of the arena. Looking up, the onlookers witness as Krillin appears as if from a rift in space and time, his beard now carrying a silvery sheen, while his eyes are the color of liquid mercury. Relieved, Goku and Tien smile that they're glad their friend's okay, though in this moment, Krillin does not look at either of them. Instead, vanishing only to appear directly in front of Topo. Worried, the destroyer candidate brings up his arms to block, but Krillin is faster, his body moving before his mind can, and this is what allows him to intercept the maneuver, stopping it in his tracks with one arm, while with the other, he takes a hold of Topo's mustache and begins to swing him around in a dragon throw finally sending spiraling off the edge as he turns a sickly shade of green, while the other fighters are forced to grip into the battlefield to avoid being dragged into the hurricane that's created. Still completely silent, Krillin next turns those silver eyes on Jiren, though before he can make a move to confront the grave, his power at last gives out, and he drops back to his base form. However, even if Krillin is now unable to fight, Jiren has sensed what might very well be the threat he noticed earlier, and so does not hesitate to take it out while he's down. Knowing that the monk is likely their best shot at beating Jiren, Vegeta and Tien both lunge at the Pride Trooper. While staying back, Goku begins giving Krillin what's left of his energy. Confused, Krillin asks what's happening, though with a chuckle, the pure Saiyan answers that once again, he's proven himself to be the most reliable guy Goku knows, having surpassed him once again just when they needed it. Thus, this energy is insurance to make sure Goku gets the chance to get even stronger than Krillin is now. Then with no more energy left to give, Goku keels over, taking himself out of the fight for good this time. Refusing to let his best friend's gift be in vain, Krillin does not rush in, instead closing his eyes and clearing his mind. That form, whatever it was, must have been the thing that Whis was trying to teach them, so now all he's got to do is let go and allow his body to do his thing. Thanks to this humble mindset, it does not take Krillin long to re-enter and seemingly master Ultra Instinct, 
though as his body carries him once more into battle, he sees that Tien and Vegeta have already taken quite the beating buying him time. Appearing between them, Krillin begins to do battle with Jiren, meeting him as an equal and forcing him to use his full power just to stay in the fight. Seeing this, Vegeta and Tien fall back, with Tien's enlightenment allowing the pair to keep an eye on the fight as they confirm. Even with his new strength, Krillin does not seem able to beat Jiren, and with the inconsistency of that form, it is only a matter of time before he gives out again. To this end, the Prince and Twice Transformed Triclops make a plan, with them re-entering the fray just as Krillin is beginning to return to normal. Recognizing that they don't have a moment to spare, the two warriors yell at their friend to move, and with complete trust in them, Krillin uses his last action of Ultra Instinct to preemptively flop onto his back, so the duo passes harmlessly over him, allowing them to rush in and slam him to Jiren, where a final contest of strength begins. But before the Grey can try anything to get them off, he finds his limbs bound with dozens of ethereal hands growing from the shadows on Tien's body, a godly variant of the Four Witches technique being used to keep him bound, allowing he and Vegeta to sync up one more time and eliminate the 11th with a final combined push. And just like that, the tournament of power is over, with Universe 7 being declared the winners and Krillin being named the MVP. Floating down, the Grand Priest asks if the Saiyan has a wish in mind, telling him that he can have anything he desires. Though with a look of confidence that would make Goku blush, the bald man answers that all he wants is to see every destroyed universe be revived. Nodding, the Grand Priest summons Super Shinron and enacts the wish, with each of the erased contestants reappearing in the stands. While with matching smiles, their angels reveal that their universes have also been restored. With no further business here, the teams then all depart, with Team Universe 7 being transported back to Capsule Corp, where everyone is waiting eager to party like there's no tomorrow, now that they know there indeed will be one. As a result, the celebration is a lavish one, with Boma sparing no expense, though before it can wrap up, there is but one more matter that must be attended to. Approaching their fathers, the young hybrids with Kurizu at their head remind them of their promise, saying that since their universe was not erased, it's time they keep their end of the bargain. Suddenly, silence falls. Then in unison, Chi Chi, Boma, 18, Pizza, and Lunch all ask what their knuckle-headed husbands promise their kids. And as the warriors turn to face their wives, they feel far more fear than they ever did when facing down Jiren or anyone else today. But that, my friends, is where we'll be leaving this story off for right now. Also, special shout outs to our patrons and channel members, literally just anybody who supports the channel mainly through direct support. And remember, you can join these guys' ranks and gain early access to content and a lot of other cool perks. Dominique, Pizza15x, Aaron Winters, Normandy1998, Xiao Pai, Coder SV3, Ronan Charizard, Daniel Smith, Drax, Dylan Wolf Dog31, Infernate Beast326, Jay Ure, Johnny, Narku, Omar Cousin, Snow Slash Memes and More, Steven Norton, Taryn, The Shadows, Vegeta What Ifs, and Elemancer, B, Blood Down, Lyman Rogers, Omar Muhammad, Aiko, Tay, Inurbriated, John Sullivan, Trent Rouse, Dark Shadows, Pokemon Trainer Cam, River Joy, Elijah Edwards, Mr. Hamtastic, Jesus is King, Half an Onion, Angel Gonzalez, David Spaulding, Lil T910, Flyer B, Joseph Lau, Blaze9526, Trainer Rad164, Luca Reynolds, Baron Stormblade, Panda Walk 301, Ono, Chris Macarino, Lily, Simroth, Red Violet, DeAndre, Gerald Smith, Luxu, John Self, Jacob Whitaker, Massive Oak Wood Tree, Demon Set, True Trey, Dutch McGee 101, Bruce Boswick, Robert Ostergaard, and Uga Booga. Thank you guys as always for all the support. Let me know again what you guys thought of the story so far, and be sure to take care of yourselves and the world around you. And as always, go beyond plus ultra. I'll see you guys next time.